It's the Introvert Dating Success Podcast, the show for introverted men that's all about learning how to attract beautiful women and still get your precious alone done. And now, here's your host, dating coach and fellow introvert, Harry Wilmington. What up, guys? It's your boy, Harry Wilmington here. Welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm your host as always, Harry Wilmington. Happy New Year to everybody. This is my first live show of 2023. And also, it was my birthday yesterday. I am now 41. So this is my first uh, stream going into a new year and a new age. And I am excited to be here with you guys. And today's show, we got quite a few topics to discuss, including the question of could the reason that a woman is ghosting you or pulling away from you be because you're possibly bad in bed and aren't aware of it. We're going to get into that because I had somebody leave a comment where he's trying to figure out what's going on with this woman and why she's suddenly pulling away after they had a, a blissful night together. And it's something that we need to talk about. Real talk. Uh, so first off, just a few couple of notes. Uh, as you guys may know, I'm going to be releasing an album under the moniker of Non Juan, courtesy of Non Juan the Puppet. He's got an album coming out on February 10th called No Girls For You. It's a soundtrack to my ebook, and I think you guys are going to like it. It's a very, very funny album packed with comedic songs that are about the ups and downs of dating. So that's coming out on the February 10th. I have shot a few music videos for this venture, so you'll see a couple of music videos that are going to be coming out really soon as well. And uh, yeah, so we'll go ahead and get into the show. As always, this show is ultimately about you guys as well. So if you have any questions during the course of the show that you'd like me to answer, either about something going on in your dating life, or just about dating in general, you can definitely leave those in the chat, and I will get to them at some point in the show. So let's start off with, uh, here is a question that I got on one of my more recent, oh no, actually, let me backtrack. So this is a question that actually I got from somebody that has joined the Introvert Dating Success Membership Academy. He's been following uh, some of the lessons that I teach in that academy, which you can go to get now at introvertdatingsuccess.com. Just go there on the first page and join today. And so he's been following the, the academy stuff diligently, and he had a question, and he went, goes like this. He says, hey, coach, I've been following what you've taught in your course. I've been seeing this girl for three months. We've hooked up on every date when I ask her out, and she always says yes or says that she can see me next week and follows through and has initiated a date once. So that's good. Where you, by the time we get to the three-month mark, Ideally, you're seeing enough consistency in her to where she's building up a good uh, rapport with you. She's building up a good reputation. And you're able to start to see what her level of consistency is in terms of does she regularly show up for dates? Is she starting to ask me on dates? Is she, you know, being the kind of woman that I can see myself with? That's plenty of time. And by the three month mark, that's when it starts getting close to her asking, well, what are we? Are we going to be in a relationship, et cetera, et cetera. So, so far, she's been pretty consistent. And he says, the last time we were supposed to meet up, she called to confirm with me uh, that even though she was in L.A., she'll be back home to make the date on time. Two hours later, she sent a text saying she's sorry to cancel because she had a long day going to L.A. last minute. I said it's all good. Since then, I've just left it. She didn't suggest anything this time, so I haven't reached out and just did my own thing the week after should I continue to reach out to her or let her pursue me? And have I done everything correctly so far? Thank you. So for those of you that are not uh, familiar with my content, basically what I tell you guys is this, is that, you know, with those first few dates when you're asking her out, ideally she's either going to say yes or she'll say, I can't make that particular day and time, but what about this one instead? All right. And so for, for, ideally for the most part, what I basically say is that, when you're asking women out, if they really have a high interest in you and they can't make a date, they're going to put out their other counter offer. They're going to say, I can't make this, but what about this one? Or if they flick last minute, they'll say, sorry, I can't make it tonight, but let's do this other thing instead. So ideally, that's what's going to be happening. And what I tell you guys is that early on in the dating process, if that's not happening, it could indicate low interest because there has been enough time of you two going out together to really figure out if she really highly likes you or not, you know? And so that's one of the easy tells is that if there are women that highly like you are going to be doing everything they can to see to it that you know that they want to see you. And so if they can't make a date, they're just going to naturally be like, hey, I can't make this one, but what about this one, right? So this guy's problem is that 
He's three months in now, and he's gotten to a situation where the woman canceled the date two hours beforehand, which is great. You want to at least she give you a buffer zone, but she canceled two hours beforehand and then said, Oh, you know, I can't make it. It's been a long day in LA, but she didn't counter offer. What do you do? And this is where it gets important into recognizing uh, the importance of as there's more time invested, you can start to really look at the consistency of previous behavior and see if this is like a one-time thing or not. So this is the first time that she's ever said to this guy, hey, I can't make this date, but didn't send a counter offer. If this had happened after date one or two, I'd be saying that could indicate that she's not interested or she could just not be aware of the whole, you know, counter offering situation, right? This with this girl, he's three months in. So now what that means is that she's been consistent enough to where this could very easily be a fluke. This could just be a one-time instance where she was really tired all day when she talked to him and said, hey, I really want to make the date, but I'm just, I'm just too tired. I got back to LA and I thought I'd have time, but just I'm really exhausted, so I just can't do it. And then she could have just hung up in and gone straight to bed for all we know, you know? And in the process of that, she could have forgotten to like, oh, but I can see you some other time. And so this is where, again, because they've gone up for three months, the history is there enough to where we can say this could just be a one-time fluke because we want to see if this starts to be a more of a consistent behavior. So for example, she forgets the counter offer this time, whatever. He reaches out again, asks her on another date. She says, yes, they go out, have a good time. Or she says that time, hey, I can't make this particular time, but let's do this thing this other time instead. In either case, she's either said yes or she's done the counter offer thing, in which case this now becomes an isolated incident, all right? And right now, we have more examples of her showing up on time and not flaking or giving a counter offer than we do her not giving a counter offer. So this is a this is an example of where this is a little bit more advanced stuff, but you're looking for consistency, but also you got to look at the history of what she's done and then say, okay, based on the history, this is a one-time thing. I'm going to go ahead and let it go, but also be on the lookout to see if it happens again, because we want to see if she starts doing this more and more where she's either saying no to more dates or she's being inconsistent in a lot and giving back counter offers to where we can say, okay, now it's become a, a bit of a problem. And now we got to see what's really going on. All right. So for now, I want to tell this guy, I said, basically, you know, she's been consistent. So benefit of the doubt, ask her out again and see if she says yes to her, see what the response is and then go from there. Ideally, if three months in, she, you're getting close to where she should be saying, what are we, are you in a relationship, yada, yada, yada. So the high interest is most, more likely there. This could just be a one-time thing, but make a note of it and then look at the behavior going forward and see what she does, all right? So that's just a little bit of advanced stuff for you guys today. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got a comment here that says, good vibes. Thank you. Appreciate it. Glad you're liking the show, okay? So with that said, we'll get on to our next question. So this next uh, question comes from a guy named, oh, Non Juan. Hey, Harry, how are you? Oh, I love your show, by the way. Uh, I'm great, but uh, how did you break into this live stream? Hey, are we going to talk about who hacked who, or can we just get to my question? Sure. What's the question? Well, I've been talking to this girl for a couple of months now. Everything was going great at first, but now I'm starting to think that maybe, just maybe, she's losing interest. Well, you know my mantra, when women like you, they help you by making it as easy as possible to see them. And when they don't like you, they do everything they can to make it hard. Do you think she's been making it harder or easier for you to be around? Hmm, I can't really tell. Okay, well, can you give me an idea of what's making you start to have doubts? Well, she flaked on a date I had set up last week to the History Museum of Cats. Then I tried texting her last week and she took four days to respond. Mm-hmm. Then... I asked her on another date, and she said she'd be too busy with work to go out. What does she do for work? Drug dealer. What? Oh, oh no, 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 no. Not like that. Oh, oh, thank goodness. Yeah, just legal drugs like weed and mushrooms. What? Yeah, we live in Seattle. Oh, dear God. Then, when I tried to reach out to her, I got a message that said I was blocked. I figured it must have been an accident, so I tried to message her on her social media apps, and I was blocked on those, too. Must have been some kind of social media outage. That's when I decided to drive by her house, but it had a for sale sign on it. And when I looked in her window, all her stuff was gone. So with all of that, how are you still wondering if this chick likes you? Because when we first started dating, she said, quote, if I ever stop liking you, I'll just tell you to your face. 
she still hasn't told me directly that she doesn't like me, so it must mean that she still has feelings for me, right? Well, let me ask you this. If she's blocked you on all the apps and blocked you on text and won't say yes to a date and has now moved away without telling you, what are the chances that she's still trying to date you? Uh... I don't understand the question. Zero, non one. She's not making it easy to even contact her, which means she's no longer interested. Look, most women aren't going to actually tell you verbally that they're not interested anymore. Okay, they do the whole slow ghosting thing. It, it's not fun to experience, but you need to accept that's what most women are going to do when they don't want to date you. You understand? Yeah, I guess so. Good. Any more questions? Yeah, so... If I left a tracking device on her car and can find out where she's located, does that mean I still have a shot at talking to her again in person? Yeah, this call is over. I heard you say yeah. Well, that call certainly sucked. But you know what won't suck? Non Juan's new album, the No Girls For You soundtrack, featuring hilarious tunes about the ups and downs of dating from the world's most unlucky and loved puppet, Non Juan. Hey. It'll make you laugh so hard, you may never need a girlfriend ever again. And it'll be available at the website and on streaming services on Friday, February 10th, 2023. And hey, if you go at, get at the website, then you'll also get a free digital copy of the No Girls For You ebook. And you'll also get some extra songs that aren't on the streaming version. So make sure to get your copy at introvertdatingsuccess.com on February 10th. All right, so... Let's get on to our next question. And this is a comment that somebody left under one of my videos. It just He's just detailing a situation he's going through. And this is where we're going to be talking about uh, reasons why a woman could be ghosting you. Could it possibly be because the experience she had with you in the bedroom wasn't the best? Now, we're going to read through this. There could be a plethora of other things that, that went on, but we're also going to talk about that. All right. So this guy says he, he wrote it in two parts because he wrote a, a shorter question and then I asked for more details, and then he provided more details. So he says, I've known a girl for three months now, and we've been constantly talking to each other, meeting up, texting, etc. And we seem to have really good chemistry. In parentheses, he says, she even pointed it out a couple of times. I started escalating the situation very slowly to make sure I don't seem like a playboy. I want to pause here for a minute, because I've, I've heard guys doing this. Uh, where you're thinking that if you move at a certain pace for with a woman, like whether it's too fast or whatever, that she's going to think that you're, the reason you're doing it is because you don't want her to think that you're a playboy. And, and most guys see playboys as those guys that are always going after various women and always have different women on their arm and aren't faithful and yada, yada, yada. And so, because he has this thought in his head of the playboy being a bad version of a guy that women aren't going to like, he's trying not to be that. Guys, I keep trying to stress to you, women like men that know what they're doing with women. You know the reason why playboys have a reputation? It's not because these playboys are tricking these women into sleeping with them. Playboys have the reputation because they know how to make women feel certain things. They know how to vibe with them. They know how to, you know, talk to them in a certain way. They know how to make them feel good and make them laugh. They know how to be suave and flirty. They know how to be, you know, sexual at the right times. And surprise, guys, women are also horny and love this stuff. So it's not that it's I, I admire this guy for not trying to be the user version of a playboy. But I think that in the process of doing that, a lot of guys end up cutting themselves short because they take away any kind of behavior that could push anything towards a sexual agenda, whether it is being flirty or being, you know, more playful than normal. And so you guys need to understand that it's perfectly fine for you to know what to do with women and how to attract them because they're going to look for that. And women can kind of sense out guys that either know what they're doing or don't know what they're doing. So if you're a guy that doesn't know what he's doing, then women are going to sense that and not want to date you, okay? Again, doesn't mean you got to have the negative playboy reputation, but you being a guy that knows what to do with women and women knowing that is not a bad thing. In fact, most women will look at a guy and be like, oh, he has game. And oh, he has no game. And guess which one more women are going to choose? The one that has game. I, there was a story a few years ago. I, I told a story before. My friend, I had a friend named Tamika, and 
she told us the story about how she was at this bar one night and this guy like went and got her a drink. And so of course she was sipping on it and drinking it and just, you know, talking to him or whatever. And then she was like, yeah. And then he went and got me a second drink. And I was like, oh, he knows what he's doing. And that's the guy she went home with that night. And she knew what his game was. She knew he was buying her drinks specifically to try to, you know, get into her good grace and hook up with her. And it still happened. Why? Because women like guys that know what they're doing. It makes them feel safe and secure. Because if you're a guy that doesn't know what he's doing with women, then inevitably you're going to do something that can possibly bring her in harm's way. And it's not going to be a good time for her. All right. But anyway, continuing on to this guy, he says, anyway, about a week ago, I invited her to a party where we got much closer, uh, if you know what I mean. And she seemed to have a really good time. Since then, she hasn't really tried talking to me and I feel like she started to pull away. Now, I wish I found out about all these videos, my videos, uh, a bit earlier because I may have already made a mistake. So I didn't understand why she acted this way. So I asked about it, mistake, but I asked about it and she said she had to study a lot and she never really wanted to hit me up this week. Wow, she was bold with it. She was blatantly saying she didn't want to be around this guy. Uh, she, he says, I told her that I would like her to sometimes just send a sign that she is still alive, but she never did. I hit her up every two to three days this last week to see what's up. Do you think this is too much and have I already messed up? So at this point, I said, provide some detail. I asked a couple of questions. So this is the full detail of this guy's story. So he says, it all started when I invited her to a college prom and it went really well, but that was the first time we really met, so nothing really happened there. Then we started meeting each other every day and he says we studied at the same college and we were also texting a lot, which usually was like, I initiated the texting one day and she did it the next day. So I wanna stop here and point out what he just said, right? Cause this, is, this, this could be one of the reasons that she's starting to pull away, all right? Um, he says that after that dance, we started meeting each other every, oh, every other day. So he's seeing her now three to four times out the week. And they're also texting a lot. So when they're not in each other's faces, they're texting each other. This is an example of way too much communication with the woman early on in the dating process. It is very important for you guys to recognize and understand that women's Feelings for you oftentimes grow a lot faster in your absence. So on the days that, let's say, hypothetically, they have the same class every other day or whatever, so they had to see each other every other day, right? That still doesn't excuse the texting. Because what this guy probably was doing is he's seeing her, going home, texting. Doesn't see her the next day, but he's still texting her. Then he sees her the day after that, and then when they're not seeing each other, texting. So this is a consistent amount of communication that's constantly happening where she doesn't get a break from this guy. Women's desire and attraction for you is going to grow during the times when there is a break. If you do not allow for a break, she doesn't have time to sit with herself. She doesn't have time to go to her girlfriends and talk about you. She doesn't have time to think about all the wonderful things she was feeling when she was near you and how she wishes she could get that feeling again because you're constantly filling up all that time she would be doing that with communication. And this can be the first way that women start to lose interest, which is why I tell you guys it's best to try to limit communication for when you're going on dates and you're not trying to do these in-between text, uh, text uh, dating texts. Now, obviously on a college campus, there's a chance that you could run into her or see her, but that sort of, again, does not excuse the texting. But you're, even within, your goal should be to not try to see her as much. Is it the worst thing in the world that he's seeing this woman every other day to study with her? It's a short amount of time, so I'd say technically not really, but that's also then taking away time from him being able to ask her on dates because they're seeing each other nonstop. So it's just a very convoluted situation. I would have erred on the side of, at the point that you knew that you were interested in her, I would have tried to lessen it back to maybe two times a week when you saw her and not texting her at all, except to ask her for a specific date to take her out. Continuing, he says, texting also never really felt one-sided and neither did our little meetings. We also went on a couple of dates. Good. Uh, he says, by slowly escalating, I meant that I wasn't uh, trying very hard. I gave her time and we only kissed first after about a month. Uh, it was my decision and I felt like the relationship was progressing on my terms. I never told her about my feelings as I know from experience that it's not what they want to hear, but she did hint at starting 
uh, I guess having feeling uh, multiple times. So she, but she mentioned it a few times. He says, I'm a man of action. So I figured that my action speaks to themselves. So the positives here, he did do the part right about uh, progressing it on his terms. That said, I think he was a little slow to act. Like if he's seeing her every other day and texting her all the time, it ain't going to take long for her to want to kiss this guy. Like real talk, they went to a freaking college prom together and then saw each other after that. So at that point, if he'd have kissed her by like the second or third date, it would have been totally fine. I think the reason he waited to, to, to kiss her was because of the whole, I don't want her to see me as a playboy thing. And God, it's perfectly fine to kiss a woman on that first date, second date, third date, and she's not gonna necessarily view you as a playboy in, in the negative sense for doing that. Like again, as I said before, women are also horny. And most women, if they're going out with you, they've already thought in their mind, if I go out with this guy regularly, at some point, he's going to want to kiss me. If she accepts more than one date with you, she's probably going to be fine kissing you. And so there are some guys that take too long to pull that trigger. And that can also make women start to think like, well, why is he waiting so long to kiss me? Could he possibly be gay? Is he not interested in me, et cetera, et cetera. And this isn't, this isn't even to say that he's necessarily wrong for waiting a month to kiss her. I'm just giving you the, the understanding of where women are coming from about like, if you're waiting because you're thinking she's going to see you in a negative light, that's not going to happen. Like if she's accepting more than one date from you, she knows a kiss is coming. She's waiting for it. She's anticipating it. You ain't got to wait an extra month. And if you kiss her on that first or second date, she's not going to view you any less than for doing that or put you in the a light of somebody who's just into this thing for sex and blah, 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 blah. Like that's not going to happen. Anyway, continuing, he says, so yeah, it was all moving very well until just this last week. We went to a New Year's Eve party at my friend's house. Pause. Now they're in school, so I don't know if they have the same friends or not. He's saying they went to a party at his friend's house. And I've stressed on this show before. If you are not in an actual relationship with the person, if there are no titles there yet, then you taking her around your friends is not the best idea. It indicates to a woman a level of seriousness about a situation that if she's not there yet is going to be too heavy because you taking her in front of your friends. Now she has to put on a show and she's not even sure if she's completely ready to be in a relationship with you yet, let alone trying to start some kind of arbitrary relationship with your friends as well. So this is why you want to wait until you guys have titles and you date it for at least three months before you start bringing around friends and family and stuff like that. Because it can, again, it indicates that you're trying to take this thing to a higher level. And if she has not matched that energy yet, then all you're going to do is a disservice. It's going to make it to her feel like it's being a forced situation and she might be out or start to lose interest or pull away. Okay. So that's another reason why this could be happening, but let's continue on. Right. So he says, we didn't really drink much at the party, just a bit of champagne to celebrate the new year. I was really intimate with her the whole night, touching and kissing and all that stuff. And by the way, he's doing all this kissing and kissing and touching in front of his friends that could also be a little weary thing. So you got to be mindful, guys, like this PDA thing. Not everybody's cool with doing that. And women, oftentimes, if you're trying to do it to them in front of your friends, now she's got these levels of thinking of like, well, I'm not quite ready for the PDA thing, but it's his friends. I don't want to embarrass him, but I'm also uncomfortable. This is happening. So you got to keep this in mind and like have those conversations later on. Like, hey, like, how do you feel about, you know, PDA or kissing in public? This is that. You can find out from those conversations if she's cool with it, if she's more of a private person, but you just spring it on her at this party, also no bueno. But anyway, he says, uh, touching and kissing and all that stuff. He says, and then we slept together after the party ended. Bra, bro. After we left each other, she sent me a video of her petting a dog that I thought was very intimidating when I first saw that dog. And then he says, that was the last time she hit me up. Uh-oh. Here we go. Then she disappeared for about two days, didn't open our text conversation for about a day. And when she did, she didn't respond. The next day, I hit her up again with a really funny line that I always do and she always liked. We got into talking and I told her that I didn't understand why she disappeared. And she said, it was an internet connection issue. I would like to say that that is probably BS because like my phone doesn't have to be connected to my internet to work. Most of the time wireless around here will work. And I'm, I'm in the same city as he is. I'm in LA. So like, uh, I think he's in LA. I don't know. It might've been another person. But the point is that, you know, you turn on your phone. If you have a good phone program, it's, it's going to be on. But let's say, let's say for argument's sake, that happened, right? 
there are so many other ways to connect with the person. It's a phone call. It's going online and saying, and sending an email. Like the reality is she could have gotten in contact with him if she wanted to. So this is a bogus, this is an example of a bogus excuse that women will give to guys because they know that we just want to believe them. We want to think that they still like us. And so whatever excuse they give us, our egos are going to be like, of course, that's why they didn't contact me. They wouldn't just not contact me because I'm such a great guy. But think about it. They've been see going together or talking to each other for three months now. And up to this point, internet every day has been totally fine. And now the day they, after they slept with each other, it just suddenly happens to go out. It's very suspect behavior. So then she says, um, hit her up, blah, 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 blah. She said that she needs to study a lot. So she doesn't really have time. Interesting. So again, you gotta, when women start telling you stuff, guys, you got to be a detective. So let's, let's, let's look at the logic of this, right? It's two days after the new year. She's saying she has to study. I've been in college. College finals happen in December. When you go back to school in January, all you're getting is a syllabus. You don't have anything at the moment to study. Most of the time, assignments haven't been handed out yet. It's literally a couple of days after January 1st. So at best, they've only had one day of class. So how is it that she suddenly just has all this studying to do? And keep in mind, they were studying together the semester before. So this to me isn't adding up, right? So he says, um, I told her that all I really want is just one quick text a day to acknowledge my existence. But I didn't force it onto her. I said it in a calm manner. But dude, okay, you might have verbalized it or texted to her in a way that's very calm and just, hey, I just want you to text me like at least once a day. But what have you actually done? You've now said to her, hey, I'm forcing you. I'm not forcing you, but I'm forcing you to have communication with me every day or I'm going to feel some kind of way about it. I'm going to be hurt. And that, my friend, comes off as needy behavior regardless of how you present it to her or not, okay? And again, I want to stress to you, women that have a high interest in you don't need to be told to text you because women that like you a lot are going to want to make sure that you know that they like you by hitting you up regularly. Hey, just want to check on you. How you doing? What they're not going to do is go more than two days without talking to you or texting you or calling you, especially at the three-month mark, all right? So, all this is indicating to me is that her interest has significantly lowered since the day you guys hooked up. Let's continue. Uh, she agreed to text me every day, every other day or day, uh, but then didn't do it. Then after about another two days, I tried to contact her again, but she didn't really open the conversation again. She only responded when I said, this is my last attempt. Again, these are not things you need to send to women. Women that like you help you, women that don't won't. So if she wanted to contact you, she would. But also, what are you doing now? You've been texting her consistently, nonstop, trying to get her to talk to you for a couple of days now. And every time you reach out to her, it's, hey, you need to contact me more. Hey, you should text me once a day. Hey, this is my last attempt. You have gone from the fun, jovial, well-to-do guy that she was talking to the semester before to now this hard ass that's like, I'm getting upset that you're not texting me. And let's say... She's in the wrong, right? You guys had a good rapport texting and all of a sudden she stopped. This is an example subconsciously of a pull away test that she's doing and you're failing because now you're, you're showing her that without her, your world is just going to crumble. But that is too much pressure to put onto a woman regardless of how long you've known her. So does it suck that she's not texting you all the time? Yes. When that happens, what you should you be doing? You should be letting it go and looking towards other women until she contacts you again. You can just say, oh, hey, I know you were busy. What's up? What's going on? What's up? Because you're not in a relationship with her, so you don't owe her any loyalty. But more importantly, you're too stuck on the fact that she's suddenly not contacting you and texting you. And I don't agree with her behavior, but you trying to beg her to contact you is also not going to get you the results that you want. Continuing, he says, uh, so after he said, the, this is my last attempt, he says, then I said again that I find it weird that she didn't want to text me for five days straight. To that, she apologized and said it was going to change. It didn't. Um, 
yeah, guy, once again, you can't force a woman to text you. And it's not that she didn't even text you for five days straight. It's that you were consistently badgering her for five days to try to text you. If you didn't look, if you guys had hooked up and you went home and then you tried texting her and she didn't text back and you left it alone, you would have been able to see after four or five days if she was just really tripping, if it really was her internet, or she just lost interest. But you didn't give yourself that time because your ego is trying to save this. Your ego is like, but she likes me. I'm a likable guy. I got to keep. And dude, again, you cannot force a woman to contact you. So when this stuff starts to happen, you can, this is what I tell guys, like you reach out because first of all, you shouldn't be texting women every day anyway. You should only be texting to ask for dates. If you just kept it at texting to ask for dates, then it'll be very easy to be able to tell if a woman didn't like you because you'd hit her up and say, hey, let's go on another date. She'd ignore you. You'd wait a week. You'd ask her out one more time. She'd either ignore you or accept the date, and then you'd know where you stand. But you constantly texting every day to do just frivolous texting. It doesn't allow you to get a good read on where her interest actually is versus if you just left it to only texting when you're trying to get a date, then you'd know, oh, she accepted the date. She must still like me. She showed up for the date. She must still like me. Oh, she didn't accept the date. Well, she may be losing interest. I'll give it a week and ask her again. Oh, ask her out again. She didn't say she wanted to go. She's lost interest. And you can bypass all these misreads you get when you're trying to text her all the time and trying to get her to text you all the time and wondering why she's not texting. I don't even like texting. Like, I don't like texting. The women that I date, I have found I get a better shot at raising their interest and keeping it when I'm not Mr. Texty Text all the time. And you ruin that by texting her nonstop. So anyway, he says, then two days after we did talk a bit, and although I was the one initiating conversation, because again, he couldn't wait for her, so he has to initiate it himself, uh, she talked pretty much how she usually did before this incident. Then I started ignoring her because I thought she was going to text me if she feels like it, but she didn't say a thing even still. Oh, good Lord. All right, tomorrow... We're going to meet again, and I would like some advice on what I should do or say. Should I just move on and ghost her? If you're meeting up with her, here's what you should do. If you're asking me my honest opinion of this, okay? My honest opinion is this, is that you're too stuck on trying to use texting as a read for her level of like for you. And dude, I have interviewed, surveyed, talked to, and dated enough women and had these conversations to know Women do not like having frivolous texting conversations. And to be honest, this is where a lot of guys messed up, right? Is because in the beginning, there might be a lot of texting because you guys are getting to know each other and you're trying to establish a bond. And I don't even think you need to do that. Like, I don't think you should be trying to use texting as a way to bond with women early on in the dating process. But the point is that at some point, as that's being more and more established and you guys are actually seeing each other in person more, talking more, doing physical things more, then she might start to lay off on the texting because she's like, I'm going to see him eventually. I don't want to run out of stuff to say to this guy when I see him in person. So I'm going to lay off on the texting a bit and just, you know, save up all my conversation for when I see him. And what guys do that is, is like, oh my God, she's no longer texting me. Ignoring the fact that they're probably still accepting dates. They're probably still trying to meet up with you in person. No, no, no. But she's not texting me enough. And I got to, because I'm, I don't feel secure in this thing unless I'm getting a text every day. So in answer to your question, I wouldn't bring it up. Like if you're seeing her in person, She's probably tired of the, the conversations you've had now badgering her nonstop about texting. Like you need to go back to the guy that isn't bothered or ruffled when he's not getting a text from a woman. You need to go there and just have a regular ass conversation, show her a regular ass good time, not bring up this whole thing about, I need you to text me at least once a day. And I said, this is our third conversation. I'm starting to feel some kind of way. Like all that is, it makes you look needy. It makes you look feminine. It makes you look desperate. And it is not attractive to women. So stop doing it, all right? And then you go see her tomorrow. You have a good time. Maybe you get a hookup. Maybe you don't, but you get to see her. And then you go home and try not texting her. Like go home and try not texting her for like, a minimum of three or four days until you text her again, asking her for a date. Just, just try the only texting when you're asking for a date program. You know what you'll probably start to notice if she still has high interest in you? Well, if she doesn't, she, she may start to build up interest again to where she's reaching out to you more. And then lo and behold, you may find that she actually realizes, oh my God, like he's not texting me a lot. The only way I get to hear from him is if I text him, let me reach out, all right? All that said though, the other thing that could be going on here that I mentioned in the title of this thing is that there's a, there's a, there's a chance and the possibility that maybe you weren't the best in bed. Like maybe, maybe 
you guys had that New Year's Eve, New Year's Day hookup. You rambled around the sack a little bit. And then she just realized it wasn't the best. Like, it was just not a great experience. And here's the thing. Most women with that first experience won't tell you that. They won't bring it up, but they'll start acting kind of funny. They'll start suddenly being too busy. They'll start suddenly saying, oh, my God, I did my zine. Blah, blah. Like, because here's the thing. They don't want to have the conversation about you were possibly whack in bed. And it's a hard conversation to have, honestly, early on because, uh, you know, if she's getting the fact that she's meeting up with you again, what most women will do is this. They'll Because I've talked to women friends, right? Well, they'll come back and say, oh, I, I met this guy. We hooked up. And it was like, it wasn't that great. It was awful. And then they'll kind of stay away for a few days. Then they start getting horny again. And they're like, well, maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought. Like, or if it was as bad as they thought, like, well, maybe, maybe he's teachable. Maybe he's learnable. I'll give him another shot because I don't have any other prospects right now. And we've got, it's been three months. We've gotten along. Okay. So what the heck? Why not? Let's give it another shot. Now, again, I don't know based on his message if this is their first time hooking up. So if it's not, then ignore everything I'm saying. But if it was the first time you guys hooked up, and then she kind of went ghost. It could be because she's she didn't want to have the conversation of how do I tell this guy that I, I'm enjoying his company, but the bedroom stuff was just was straight up trash. And because most women won't have that conversation. And as a guy, I don't think you should necessarily bring it up either. But that could be what's going on. This is a chance where if you guys meet up again and it leads to bedroom stuff, you can just kind of say, hey, so like, what things do you like? What are you into? What are your likes or dislikes? Hey, you know, we hooked up that first time and I thought it was pretty good, but like, I want to bring more excitement to the bedroom for you. Like, what things do you really like? What things could I, you know, what things did you like? What things could I introduce? What things could I do better? You know, and they, if that conversation, if that, if that, if it leads to that kind of thing, that's a conversation where she can say, oh, okay, this guy's actually open to learn. He doesn't have an ego about if I didn't like some things and I can actually tell him what my likes really, really are. And then from there, you can go on and like give her the hookup that she's wanting. But that could be a reason because it just seems weird that you have a hookup and all of a sudden nothing. The other thing is this. Sometimes I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this guy's, if this is this guy's situation. So I'm just spitballing here. Right. A lot of times. Men are very good at being able to, you know, do the, the dating stuff they need to do to build attraction and be a strong masculine guy. And then they have that first hookup and all of a sudden they're in bed cuddling with a woman. And now the floodgates are open. They want to tell her all her fears and, you know, desires and the emotions that they're feeling. And having those kind of post-coital conversations with a woman where all of a sudden you feel OK to verbalize all these emotions and feelings could also be a thing that makes her think, Oh my God, I, I thought he was a bit more masculine than this, but now he's trying to like tell me all his thoughts and feelings and desires and dreams. And it's like, we're not even boyfriend or girlfriend yet. What the freak's going on? This is freaking me out. So again, I don't know if this is this guy's situation, but if that did happen, that's something to look at that just because you hook up with the woman doesn't mean you now start having relationship conversations, feeling conversations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So be mindful of that. And if that's something that you did, just know to also stop doing that in the bedroom. Like again, women are going to get away better with verbalizing feelings and stuff like that. You're better at action. So if you show her a good time in the bedroom and then she's like, oh, this is so great, blah, blah, blah. And she starts getting emotional and starts blah, blah, blah feelings. Fantastic. Great. Don't do the same. All right. So hopefully this helps you out. Again, if there's parts of this that I'm missing, feel free to comment underneath to let me know if there's anything about this situation that you've already detailed that I may have missed out on. But hopefully this advice will help this guy out. All right. All right. So I want to get on to another little interesting conversation here. So I did a video recently called why women will choose the no value guys versus the thoughtful guy. And the short end of that video, uh, I said that the, uh, the, the, the real question is what do women value and are the thoughtful guys giving women what they would value and not what the guy themselves would value. Because I think both sexes do that where they think, oh, well, this other sex should like this thing and should want this thing. And then the other sex is like, I don't want that. That's not a thing that I want. Or you're not really emphasizing the thing that I actually want. And so I'm not going to go with this program. And so I mentioned, you know, if you have a jerk guy versus a thoughtful guy, but the jerk guy is showing various masculine qualities that women for the long span of their life are going to actually value, then that thoughtful guy could be thoughtful all day. But if he's not giving her what she wants, in terms of what she actually values, then he's not going to get the results that he wants. And I had a few comments that were going back and forth in the, in the chat with that. So uh, one guy said, thoughtful sounds so corny. Guys who describe themselves like that are probably annoying to be around. And that's why girls don't like them. Nobody likes someone who puts out this nice guy persona because they are probably compensating or wearing a mask. Nice guys are usually the first to snap. 
And we've seen so many examples of that in society where it's like that guy, oh, Jim Bob, he was just such a peaceful guy. And he was just, he wouldn't hurt a fly with anybody. But then he went to this post office and just like totally like shot the place up. And now people are, are unalived. And it's very sad. We didn't know because he was such a thoughtful guy. And so, and then women in their own dating lives have the experience of dating these thoughtful guys that come to find out later on weren't as thoughtful as they were previously showing themselves to be, right? So this guy makes a good point. So then another guy said, so being thoughtful is no longer okay either. Got it. You sound triggered to that other guy. And so I left the comment that basically said this. I said, I would argue that there are plenty of thoughtful men who are also, somebody, some of the comments saying that, you know, oh, you know, if they're hot, they can be jerks and yada, yada, yada. And so I said, I would argue that there are plenty of thoughtful men who are also traditionally hot in the looks department that still can't get or keep women. And if you notice in the title of that video, I put no value and thoughtful in quotes. And I did that because there are hot, thoughtful men who think that they are thoughtful. But if they're only doing things that they think a woman will want or need versus what she actually wants or needs, then he's being thoughtful in a very selfish way. Because you got to look at the fact that men and women are going to need different things. So that'll be like a woman saying, well, I'm a nice woman because I make a lot of money at my job and I have my own place. And every guy's going to look at her like, but I don't value that. Like in a relationship, I'm going to spend my money. We're going to probably move into my place. So none of those things matter. What else you got? So imagine that woman saying, oh, well, that's my value. And you just don't understand. And you're just blah, blah, like we wouldn't care. So you could be like, oh, but I want to be a, a thoughtful guy who's going to open doors for women. I'm going to like, you know, shower flowers. And, and that's why I did a whole book called No Girls For You, The Ultimate Guide to Losing the Girl of Your Dreams, because I was that guy that was doing all these things that I thought women should like and should want and should need. And I was shooting myself to death and not getting the results that I wanted because those weren't things women value. They valued a guy that was confident, that, you know, had goals and dreams that he was going towards about getting money, about being able to support himself so he could hopefully support her and some kids someday. And so you could be thoughtful, but if you're not thoughtful in the ways that she needs, then you're actually doing her disservice and not being thoughtful to what she actually needs. So then I said, um, mean, I said, yeah, meanwhile, there are uh, average looking men who are aware of what turns women on and know how to connect with a bevy of women, including the hot ones. And it goes back to what I said in the video. The majority of women are looking for someone to protect, provide, and be masculine. And many hot guys, they can get a first pass with a woman based on their looks, but oftentimes can't keep her long term because they're actually very beta and they don't know how to give women the core needs that they crave. So if you're an average man, but you can learn how to do the things that women are needing to and that they value to be able to want to be with you and to be attracted to you and to feel safe and trusted around you, then you'll be surprised at how many hot women will be attracted to you. And I say this because so many guys think, well, I got to be a hot guy, blah, blah, blah. And look, I think I'm okay. I think I was blessed with decent enough genes, but like the difference between me being able to get women now versus in my 20s when I was getting next to no women, confidence and having some goals. Like real talk, like I became more confident in myself as I was getting more of my goals accomplished, I became more confident in myself and women can read that. And it's so it's it's subtle stuff. Like the way you carry yourself when you're not confident versus when you're confident. Confident dudes sit like this and have like walk sturdy and not confident dudes do like this. Well, if a woman's looking at again, I, I think in that video I said that like if you have twin guys, right? Twin twin dudes, one's walking like this and has his head held high. One's walking around like this, whatever. Sorry, dude like this, looks confident, going to get more, more uh, women. And so you don't have to be the, the 10 out of 10 guy in order to display other characteristics that women are going to find attractive about you. But this goes back to, do you know what women are actually valuing in terms of the things that they need to not only be attracted to you, but to feel safe, secure, to feel like you're a masculine guy that's going to protect her at some point. And those are things that you can learn. I have a whole academy called the Introvert Dating Success Membership Academy, where I go over things just like this, where I talk about how to be more confident, how to be less anxious, how to keep your eye on the prize and focus on your goals so she can focus on you, focusing on your goals and be attracted to you. All right. So these are things that are 
very learnable if you just take the time to learn the lessons that you need. I have people in my academy right now that are having better dating lives simply because I have programs in there that teach you the ins and outs of how to date, how to be more confident, how to be bold, how to have conversations, how to be able to stand up for yourself when she tests you and all the other stuff. But if you don't have those, those things in your arsenal, then when certain situations arise, you're not going to be confident. She's going to think that she was lied to because she thought you were confident and she's going to leave. And I don't want her to leave you. I want you, I want her to be able to see you and say, regardless of what's going on, this is the guy that gets it. He knows how to handle me. He's confident. He's bold. He know he has a plan for me and us in our lives. And those are women that, and, and those are the kind of guys that women are going to want. All right. So it comes back to if you know what women truly value. And the other thing, when you learn that, you're being a thoughtful guy. When you learn what women truly want and then know how to give it to them in an authentic way, that's really being thoughtful. It's not all this complimenting them all the time, calling them, texting them all the time, telling them they're beautiful, giving them flowers. It really is, are you providing the safety, security, and protection that she's going to need? Are you providing a lifestyle for her? When she looks at you, can she see a future with you? Are you into things that she's going to be drawn to want to do? And that's really being thoughtful to her, all right? So hopefully, guys, this helps you out. And then lastly, I want to go into, this is the last part of the show here, all right? Um, it's the end of the holidays and I've touched on a few guys in this, in this show today, whereby, you know, their women are coming either back into town or, you know, it's post new years. And so there might've been some of you out there who were dating in early December and then the holidays came and you're like, you know, I did a whole video about how to text and talk to women during the holidays when they're probably out of town doing stuff or whatever, but now women are getting back into town and there are a lot of guys that get into the situation, right? Where let's say you were texting a woman before the holidays and now the holidays are over and you're sitting there like, okay, great. I know she's getting back in town. And she said, when she gets back in town, she'll text me. And you're sitting there and it is now January 8th and she has not texted you. She's not called you. And you're wondering what's going on. Why isn't she texting me? She said she would text me. Why is not she doing that? All right. And here's another reality that you as a man have to understand is that, regardless of what a woman says about hitting you up to try to reconnect, to go on a date, the majority of women are still going to expect you to reach out to them, to ask them out. It's just, it's the feminine nature to expect the man to do the masculine thing of talking to her and asking her out and her to sit there and wait for that to be incoming. All right. So you might have very well-meaning women that when they went out of town said, Hey, I'll hit you up when I'm back in town. And to be fair, the ones that actually hit you up, those are the ones that have a high interest. Pursue those, all right? But there's a, a, a good portion of women that could have like 70 to 80% of interest in you that really do want to go out with you again, but just their programming is such that they're going to wait for the guy to hit them up. And so this is where I get into the thing of it's ultimately going to be your job to reach out. If you think that she's lost interest, if you think she's been back for a week and she hasn't let me know, blah, 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 blah. I always tell you guys, you give a woman two times to reject you before you just blow her off completely altogether, right? So let's say before the holiday, she said, hey, when I get back in town, I'm going to hit you up, right? You know she's back in town. It's day eight. She hasn't hit you up. Let it slide. Don't harass her. Hey, I thought you said when you got back in town, you were going to hit me up and blah, 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 blah. Don't do that. You don't need to do that. No, no, no. Just simply hit her up. Hey, um, happy new year. I uh, wanted to see if you were in town for, for a meetup this week. I'm free Tuesday or Thursday. Let me know which day works for you. Boom. You just go right back into asking her out and seeing what she says. Now, woman that has high interest, going to hit you up. Hey, happy new year. Sorry, I forgot to hit you back up. Yes, I'd love to meet up. I'm cool on this day. Woman that's a little less interested now after the holidays. Oh, hey, my holiday was great. You know, um, I can't meet you up on this day, but maybe this other day. Woman that's got very low interest or no interest at this point. Oh, happy holidays. Glad to hear from you. Hope all is well. Won't even mention that you mentioned the date. At that point, you know, oh, crap. I'm probably in, in deep crap or whatever. Even then, wait a week. Ask her one more time. Because here's this. We want you to be so assured that she either does or doesn't want to go out that it's undeniable. And so, but I don't, but I also don't want you endlessly trying to ask women out like, hey, can we go out? Oh, I can't make it. Hey, can we go out? Oh, I'm busy. Hey, can we go out? No, twice. Two times is more than enough to let you know where she stands with you. So you ask her out, she doesn't respond, or she says, hey, this would whatever, fine. Ask her out one more time after that. If she doesn't respond or she says, oh yeah, I'm still busy, blah, 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 get rid of her number, 
or well, don't, don't do that. Just, just, just know that it is what it is and start moving on to other people, but don't try to hit up. Well, I know you, you didn't hit me up after this and you said no to my date. So this means blah, 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 blah. No, just, just let it go. It is what it is. If she happens to hit you up in the future, fantastic, but don't bank on her now being the end all be all for your relationship journey. Move on to somebody else. And this goes back to my whole thing of like being uh, not so attached to outcomes. After the holiday, it can be very hard to start up uh, a relationship that was in theory building up before the holidays happened. All right. And so just that's just a reality of dating post holidays. And so as you become as you honestly, as you start to have more options, as you start to like exercise more of those options, maybe you're on dating apps, maybe you're meeting people in person. But as you have more options, you'll find that if a woman doesn't get back to you right away, it's fine. You got other ones to talk to. But I want you to get so strong and secure in yourself that even if you don't have a bunch of other options, your thoughts always, well, at the end of the day, she's going to choose who she wants to choose, just like I'm going to choose who I want to choose. If she doesn't choose me, fine. There's others out there. And as long as you're able to build up to that feeling tone, then you won't ever be so worried about this one girl that you're dating suddenly going flaky on you because you're like, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And I teach a lot about that also in the Introvert Dating Success Membership Academy about being able to just let go, to be able to recognize that you as you are right now is probably good enough for somebody else out there. But that said, you could always be working and improving. And when you have downtime, Read up, study up on how to have better conversations, read up on, really go back and like, maybe the things you could have done a little bit better throughout your conversation, whether it's less texting or having better dates or having better rapport, whatever, you know? But at the end of the day, you're good enough for somebody right now. And if this person decided that you're not their person, there are 4 billion other women on this planet. You can find another woman. It is possible. But ideally, when you do find them, you have the skill set to be able to keep them and you have built up enough confidence in yourself to know that you are good enough for the situation. If you don't feel that now, I was like that once. That's why I created a whole membership academy because I want you guys to be uh, more confident now than I was back then when I first started dating, all right? So hopefully, guys, this helps you all out. Happy New Year to all you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this broadcast. As always, we will have more of these and I'm going to be dividing these up into little clips and stuff like that. As always, guys, if you guys have any questions you want answered on one of these shows, you can leave a comment down below. You can write to me at harrywilmington at gmail.com. You can also go to the website to sign up for one-on-one -on -one phone consultation. I had a lot of those over the holidays, people uh, wanting to do uh, phone consultations about situations they're going through. I'm very good at analyzing whatever your situation is and being able to kind of tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, what next steps you should take to you know, go forth in your situation. Uh, so yeah, that's all at the website. Check that out on the, the coaching tab. And uh, yeah, if you got any value out of this, out of this live or out of this video in general, you can always leave me a cash app at Harry Wilmington as well. Thank you guys for watching. I'm Harry Wilmington and I'll catch you guys on the next broadcast. I'm out. Hey. Hey guys, welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm your host, Harry Wilmington. This is the show where you learn how to date as your introverted self while still getting your precious alone time. And on today's show, I've got another great interview with a dating expert. His name is Jeffrey Satiawan, and he is a guy that also helps out other men who have had fractured relationships, and he helps them figure out how to better communicate with the women in their lives and how to build emotional safety. And so actually today's show, we're gonna be talking all about how it is that emotional safety breaks down in a relationship and how you can better build it up. It's a fascinating interview. We've got a lot of great insights that you're gonna to hear today, including this one little game that he ends up playing with me, uh, virtually obviously, that actually not will, will open your eyes, because it definitely opened mine to even the, the biases that we have in our heads that we may not even be aware of that ends up hurting us when we're trying to reconnect with our partners. So we got a lot of fascinating stuff in the show you're about to hear. Be sure to take a listen to it and be sure to check out Jeffrey's website as well as his YouTube page, all the info which you'll hear inside this show. So let's go ahead and take a listen. All right, guys, welcome back to the Introvert Dating Success Show. I'm your host as always, Harry Wilmington. And today I am interviewing Jeffrey, he is a relationship coach who helps empower men to rebuild their relationships and marriages from the ground up. Uh, between his YouTube channel and his website, relationshipsmaster.com, Jeffrey coaches men who are struggling in their relationships and helps them find permanent and life-changing results. I've seen quite a few of his videos on YouTube and in other places, and this man definitely knows what he's talking about, and I'm happy to have him on the show. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks, Harry. Good to be here as well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, appreciate it. I, like I said, I'm glad I was able to reach out to you. I like talking to fellow uh, relationship coaches about 
about all aspects of relationships and getting into them and then trying to make them uh, be sustainable and last. Uh, but I always start out with every, the, with all my guests with the question of uh, what was your dating life like growing up? What was your what was your dating slash relationship journey leading up to where you're at now? Yeah. So I would say before I was uh, 19, it was non-existent dating life because, uh, you know, I grew up in a very traditional home. So my parents like never slept in the same bedroom. Uh, we never had dinners as kids, you know, uh, as a family. And they were always fighting all the time. So this interpersonal skills was non-existent when I was growing up. And I've always struggled with social anxiety, with making connections with people for the better part of the first 20 years of my life, I would say. Uh, then 19 was when I met my first, um, I guess, girlfriend at that time. And I came to it in a very selfish place, uh, just like how my parents were kind of approaching it as well. Uh, very internally needy, uh, not very emotionally centered. Like I, at first I was too feminine and too beta in a way. And then then I got then I learned all these like macho techniques and became a bit too macho. So one extreme to the other. Yeah, I just wreaked so much havoc. And and I believe in this like fate or character model that I call. So I really believe like people are either meant to be or not meant to be. And that got me to see the world in a very messed up way and the relationship in a very messed up way. And I think I drove everyone I was with a bit crazy there. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it was bad to begin with. So uh, just going back a bit. So when you say you were uh, acting more feminine, what, what do you mean by that? Like what things were you doing or saying? Well, I, it's hard to, I think it's a general vibe that I was giving because I was struggling with relationships for so long that when I actually had the relationship that I wanted, I held so much importance to it. I put everyone on a pedestal, right? And the neediness sometimes comes on in a form of, in a very strong form of anger, of uh you know, talking back, trying to control someone. But of course, it's bred out of that insecurity inside. Uh, and it's just manifests itself in so many different ways. I mean, I can I can go the whole day just describing all the things that I did, but I'm sure many of your listeners will know, you know? Oh, yeah. No, I, my, my dad died when I was nine. So I grew up mostly around like my mom, my aunts, my grandma. My, so I very much had that same thing in terms of some of my mannerisms. Kind of the way that I talked at times was definitely not it was definitely not ex uh, exuding any masculinity towards women. So that's why I was like, I can relate yeah. to that on a level because I, I know some of those <laughs> yeah. things would have possibly been. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Then they went to the other side where you just acted like you didn't give a shit in a way. Like you don't care about anything. Like I'm too good for you. And of course, that's bred out of that pseudo self-esteem as well, where you're just telling yourself you're awesome. You're a high value man, but you don't really know what it means, what it looks like really. Yeah. So it's just toxic both sides. Were you getting like uh, intel or information about how to be a man from uh, I would say not so positive places or like how did you come up? How are you initially trying to figure out, okay, what does a man do? And then what did you find when you were doing those things that you liked or didn't like? Yeah. I went to the normal streams like, you know, coach Corey Wayne, subtle arts are not giving an F, right? It's like all those things basically tell you like a man can walk away and mean it and doesn't need anyone uh, sources his strengths from within, which is great, but I think that can get you to the other extreme where you seem a bit too aloof on the passive side of things. And also on the active side of things, when you don't get actually, when, when you playing aloof doesn't get you what you want. And because you're creating, you're operating from this insecurity still. You go to the other direction where now you get insecure and controlling again. Yeah, that can be a lot. So then at what point did you start to feel more confident about women and have the kind of success that you wanted to have? Um, I would say I've always had, so since that first relationship and since that um, learning about like dating techniques and so on, I was pretty, I had no problems finding people to date, but getting people to have actually have a long-term relationship with me and have that be happy. That's, that was a struggle for a long time. And I think, uh, it wasn't until about s now seven years ago when I met, uh, my existing partner right now, and we've been together for seven years that I finally admitted to myself of my role or like my hundred percent contribution in the 50%. I guess. And I started to look at, um, books, 
went to therapy quite a lot. I went to um, coaching programs, and I bought a. I spent a lot of money on on those things. I, I probably spent close to twenty five grand all total on all those things, but nothing was really giving me the success that we wanted. And so what we found was that, and we can get d- deeper into this, was yeah. you know people either are focused on the tactics, the short term tactics that makes you appear something, but you don't become that. Um, and so whenever you appear like that you know, your partner can smell that from a mile away. And so I was saying the right things, I was doing the right things, but I don't think my partner really felt any of the things I was saying or doing. And I would always go back on my word because I didn't really mean what I said. I just said it because I knew I had to say it. I was supposed to say it. Um, And the other thing too, was that a lot of people were teaching principles that were kind of on the extremes of everything. So for example, you we talk about being more alpha, Right. Well, being alpha and being this macho figure and strong figure, strong masculine figure is great, but it can get you to one extreme. And what we found was that the answers never really lie in the extremes. And so that was when we took all these principles that we learned from other programs, uh, other therapists, et cetera. And we really boil it down to, okay, what are the first principles behind everything here together as a couple? And that's when we really start to understand the middle ground, the gray area of everything, finding the balance in everything. And finding principles and philosophies that actually is the root core of what was actually happening rather than fixing all this symptomatic um, hundreds of things that people talk about in relationships. Right. It's kind of like all those things are basically scripts that are putting a bandaid on the problem, but it's not actually healing the wound. You said it much better. Yeah. Like, that's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. Cause I'm like, I was, I'm trying, I was trying to think like, so you, you paid all this money and went through all this stuff and learned all these things. So at that point, do you didn't have to like, you you have to go back through and say, okay, of these things that I've learned, what's like the bottom, the, the, the mainline principles, each of these are, are really trying to put out there. And then how can we then make that work best for us? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so you've been with your partner for seven years now. Uh, what was, well, obviously if you've gone through all this stuff, what, what were, what were some of the issues you guys were running into that weren't allowing you to really connect the way you wanted to, or where, if it was like close to not working out? The one thing we had was, um, the initial spark, we had that, right. And the second thing we had was at some point after a year in, we had the history, we had that, the history together that made it difficult for us to let go of each other. Right. That was the only thing we had. But in terms of eventually communication broke down, um, respect, a- admiration broke down. Uh, we started to kind of grow apart eventually where we weren't really aligned on a lot of different parts of life. Sure, the small things here and there of what to eat and so on, we, want, we were aligned. But on the bigger things in life that actually mattered, we had struggle aligning. And when we had struggle aligning that, that caused even more conflicts. Then on top of this conflicts, then eventually the the passion, the attraction, the spark kind of goes away as well because it got drowned in so many problems. Yeah, so we really didn't have much. And at some point, the only thing we had was just, we had history and let's try to figure this out because we have a lot to lose now. Okay. Now, when that kind of thing happens, obviously when it, when other men get into a situation with the, with the person they're trying to date long-term, they're mm. trying to diagnose it and figure out what is the thing that's happening. So what are some of the things that guys will look at and say like, oh, these are the problems, but it's like, it's it's not really the issue, but it's things that they're looking at think could be the issue. The couple of things that people would always talk about are one is the masculine feminine polarity, right? When it comes to attraction, people talk so about that a lot. lot. Yeah. People talk about uh, communication a lot, uh, communication being an issue. But the way they approach this is that, you just need to communicate as if communication is a choice that you do. Um, people talk about setting boundaries uh, so that setting some ground rules so that we clear up the expectations from the both of you. And I mean, if you look at the the main causes of breakups and the demise of the relationship is always communication issues. You have some big issues like money that you can't uh, uh, talk about. You have goal alignment issues. You have attraction issues. Those are the main main reasons that people usually talk about, right? Yes. Um, can you think of anything else besides the ones I mentioned? Uh, see, so losing attraction, uh, possibly not having the same uh, sexual energy in terms of how often somebody wants to do it versus somebody else. Right, or right. Practices that. Uh, family sometimes, if they've really got to know family, it's like, oh, your mom doesn't like me or whatever. Like, very yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we had a lot of those problems as well. But what we realized was that, and 
and I think when you watch my videos, you will see this quite quickly, is that the root core behind everything here is really that lack of emotional safety. And just to give you a few examples of what I mean here. So let's say communication issues. You're having some communication issues. And if you go to a lot of therapists, you go to a lot of professionals, they'll just tell you, hey, you guys just got to communicate better. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you want to put it into a journal and then to give the journal to someone else. You want to force communication through therapy, force the communication to happen. But the problem with communication is not that we don't want to communicate, is that we often can't, right? So I'm sure in, so, so people look at stonewalling, for example. Stonewalling is a big, big no-no in relationships. Yes. And people always think about that as, oh, this is a narcissistic problem. This is a character problem. If you are in a relationship with a stonewaller, then you should get out because that's oh. a relationship that's doomed to fail forever. Just, right? just for our audience at home, w- w- uh, yeah. what is your definition of stonewalling? Stonewalling is uh, basically when, so let's say when you have a problem, a conversation that needs to happen in a relationship, but you choose to not have it. So when your partner gives you the silent treatment, the cold shoulder saying to you, I don't want to talk about it. When you know the problem needs to be talked about, a topic needs to be talked about. And so this is basically them walking away from the conversation or stonewalling, which is her putting up a wall between you Mm. and her, right? Okay. Um, Yeah. So people would think of this as a toxic thing to do, but- what a lot of people don't realize too is that me, you, and I'm sure everyone watching this, we have stonewalled many times in our life before, right? Mm-hmm. Um, something bad happens. So, someone asks us, hey, what's wrong? And we say, I don't want to talk about it. Whatever you want to call it, that's, that is stonewalling. And it's not because we are jerks. There's something wrong with us. It's usually because maybe one reason is the person you're talking to, you know, will not understand what you're trying to say. Maybe you know they can't relate. Maybe you know they'll twist it into something bad. Maybe you know they'll panic and take it badly. So you just say, I don't want to get into that. Let me just keep it to myself. Right. Or maybe it's a, yeah. A lot of it actually is like, it's not that you're trying to be narcissistic. It's like you're the opposite. It's like, you don't want to know what the other person's reaction is going to be, but whatever it's going to be, you don't want to experience that. And you don't want them to experience that. So it's like, I keep it to myself. I ain't got to worry about what they're going to do. Yeah. So AKA here, I'm refusing to communicate and communication breaks down because I fundamentally do not feel safe expressing what I want to express. So if, so if you look at even communication issues here, there is something deeper underlying communication, uh, communication issues, which is the lack of safety, the lack of trust. Um, you look at money issues or you look at your, the issue that you mentioned of um, people having different, different sexual energies and so on. Right. All those stuff are just differences in relationships. And, you know, when two people come together, there's going to be differences. Now, the differences only become threats when there is no safety, when there is no basically the pipe that allows you to communicate your difference and understand each other's differences and actually embrace the differences and understand the differences and actually accept the differences, find a win win, et cetera. Um, that's when it becomes threats. But for us, for example, you know, my partner and I could be could not be more different. I'm very introverted. She's very extroverted. She likes to, the, the, the hobby she has, the things she's interested in is very different from me. Right? But the, the key difference is that we have the safety to where we can communicate about the differences. And instead of the difference being a threat or conflicts being a threat, it now becomes massive opportunities. It's almost like, you know, if you look at a symphony, a symphony has a violinist, maybe has a cellist. If the violinist and the cellist understands how to embrace the differences and play together, it can create a better symphony. But if the violinist is always looking at the cellist and going, oh, you're different, I don't like that, the violin is more awesome, that's a big problem, right? But then again, that connection that allows the communication to happen is that safety again. And the last example here is, you know, you talk about um, people having, going through difficult moments. Uh, people having like midlife crisis, and then they say, I want some space. The real thing that is happening is that not that they want space. It's that they don't have enough safety and trust to go through that midlife crisis. Maybe they're going through some depression, some tough moments with you. So again, everything boils on the safety. If you fix the safety portion, you fix a lot of things in relationships. What are things that men do unintentionally that can cause the breakdown for a woman of emotion, having emotional safety for the guy that she's dating? Here's the thing about this. Safety is destroyed in a very subconscious way, right? So to understand this, let's look at how safety is generated uh, for a lot of our clients, for example. 
So let's say you're having a uh, you're seeing a couple here that, that doesn't really have safety. So the communication breaks down. They're stonewalling each other. Whenever someone talks, they're getting really defensive really fast. And I want you to put yourself in this position where you are dealing with a with yourself who doesn't have safety. Your partner now is saying all the correct things. The obvious things they're doing is sounds right. It sounds proper. But you can see while they're doing and saying the right things, you can tell inside the subtle micro expressions, the micro tones they have, something is off, right? What you're gonna pay attention to is not the obvious things they do, but the subtle things. And another example of this is, um, you know, people can go to YouTube video and learn how to say the right things, do the right things pretty quickly. And so they try the script and they can do correct things sometimes pretty easily, but to, for you to do the right things all the time, that's really, really hard. So. You know, safety is created or destroyed in ways where it's really hard to fake. Right? You can't fake this internal state that allows you to create safety. And so with a lot of people, I think when they find themselves in a position where they have very little safety in a relationship and their communication is breaking down, they try to focus on the very obvious, the very tangible things like understanding what to do, what to say. They focus on the what a lot. While the more important thing is actually the things within the identity shifting, the m mindset shifts, the paradigm shifts, et cetera, that allows you to say those things and say those things with the genuineness to the point where it affects your tone, your micro expressions, your micro uh, tones, et cetera, as well. And that's, I think, the part that people miss. People treat this like it's a painkiller, right? And not a lifestyle. It needs to be a lifestyle. It's very true because especially since I know women are very intuitive and so as you're saying and doing certain things, if your body isn't matching it, your facial isn't right, your tone's not matching it, they can read that and it actually makes them even more paranoid about what's he really thinking, what's going on, and then they don't feel that safety that they once, they once had. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, and so by extension there, a lot of the ways that people destroy safety is a very in a very subconscious way often. So for example, like a simple example of this is... You are in bed together. Your partner is feeling hot. So, so she says to you, hey, uh, can we turn on the AC? And maybe you, you from your very subconscious way of how you've been trained to respond, et cetera, and you go like, oh, it's fine. Just, just leave, leave it alone. Now, this action can seem very innocent to you, but that's an, a great example of how she just expressed herself and you punish that, right? And now the problem doesn't be, just become the temperature problem. But now it becomes, I can't even talk about it. So now that's another layer of problems. And the guy doesn't even understand that he's destroying safety. And the worst part about the destruction of safety is that because you destroyed safety, your partner will never tell you that she's feeling the lack of safety because she can't even feel safe telling you that. Mm. So a lot of men and a lot of my clients, they, they're in this position where they're destroying safety, but they have no idea they are right. until... They eventually uh, have their partner say, I want a divorce. But at that point, if they watch a lot of other videos, they will say, oh, the problem is with her because they don't see their own problem. So it's a very compounding effect that never really ends. Yep. And I think the communication styles being different too is kind of a thing because I noticed that, you know, women communicative wise tend to do more talking to communicate and guys tend to be more action oriented. So I think at the point where we start trying to do actions and they're like, but, but but the problem is that you're ignoring my words. I'm I'm saying stuff to you, and you're not allowing <laughs> that to be heard. That makes them. That, that's the real communication issue is that they don't understand. We don't understand why it is we're doing all these things, but we're when they say, "Hey, honey, I have this X, Y, and Z idea." Oh, I, that's crazy. I got something else. It's like she doesn't feel heard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go so, ahead. so how does how does the emotion how does the breakdown of emotional safety then affect other aspects of the relationship. Cause we just think, okay, if I can just build up emotional safety again, or I can do this thing and she's going to trust me that we can go back to doing the way things were. But how does that also affect other various areas of your relationship? I mean, it's because emotional safety is really the basis for even attraction, right? Um, like it, it literally destroys every single thing in the relationship. If you don't have that safety, for example, um, in the current relationship world, they always talk about how there needs to be that masculine feminine polarity. That's the secret behind attraction. If you want to keep the attraction alive, that you, you need to animate that masculine side of things. Um, to us, that's not actually the real reason of how attraction forms. The real reason is that 
the masculine figure or the masculine archetype is supposed to create or generate safety for the feminine presence. So again, it goes back down to safety, right? Um, and if you don't have that safety, it doesn't matter how you, masculine you think you are. If you don't create that safety, you are in essence not giving the feminine what it needs, which is that safety again. Um, again, it destroys the communication again. Um, and without that communication, you cannot resolve issues. You cannot resolve differences, which if we know anything about entropy is that problems do come up. People do change. People shift their, their philosophy. People shift their desires, et cetera. And if you can't talk about those shifts, if you can't talk about the, the conflicts as you go through life, that puts you in a very hopeless state in the relationship to where, okay, we have problems which make us hopeless, but we can't even talk about the problems which make us even more hopeless. And that's the moment, I think, that couples usually break apart. Couples don't break apart because of the problems. Couples break apart because they have problems and they can't even talk about it. This episode is being brought to you by the Introvert Dating Success Academy. Look, if you're an introverted guy that was like me, where you had a hard time connecting with women, you couldn't figure out how to be on a date, how to be with women, and you were feeling anxious at times and not really being sure what to say to women or getting all jumbled up whenever you came around them, well, I don't want you to have to go through that. And so because of this, I've created the Introvert Dating Success Academy. It is a 12-week program that is a one-on-one coaching program and video coaching program. It walks you A through Z on how to go to meet, greet, attract, date, and land the woman of your dreams. It also teaches you how to be a more effective communicator. You'll learn how to be less anxious and more confident about yourself when you go on these dates and so much more. For 12 weeks, you'll get a phone call once a week. We'll go over anything you want to talk about as it pertains to dating and figure out a pathway for your life so that way you can best show up in your dating relationships effectively enough to be able to eventually get the girl of your dreams. If that is something that's appealing to you, then check out the program at introvertdatingsuccess.com. If you read over it and it sounds like something you'd be interested in, then you can definitely fill out the form to apply for the program and get started on the right track towards building the dating life that you rightfully deserve. That's introvertdatingsuccess.com what are the mistakes that men make when trying to reconnect? Like we talked about, you know, trying to do action things and stuff like that. But like, let's say for example, like, you know, his, for example, a guy wants his wife to be more affectionate. She feels like there's been trust violated. So as he's trying to get closer to her, she's not really being as affectionate, being as touchy, et cetera, et cetera. What are, what are the mistakes that men are doing in terms of trying to build that stuff back that they're not recognizing? The first thing is, um, so we talked about basically focusing on um, the surface level things, but if we try to go deeper and get more nuanced into this topic, the the first thing is um, a lot of people, uh, they're what I call quite tethered, right? And here's what I mean. Uh, your partner comes home from work, whatever it is, and she comes home in a pissy mood. When she's pissy, you get pissy. Then you get pissy, then she gets pissy back. So there's almost like this rope for a lot of for a lot of couples that holds them together. If one goes down, the other goes down. Uh, and this is what we call in our program and our with our clients is this tethering. Um, your state of mind, your state of emotions, often depends on what is happening with external things, including what your partner is doing, what the world is happening, and so on. It's not sourced internally. And if you are in this tethered state. You can never be the person who can create safety because you're always going to be kind of thrown and pulled in many different directions that life pulls you in. The crux of creating safety is that, you know, so let's say your partner is expressing something difficult, a tough truth. Maybe she's having a bad day at work. Maybe she's telling you something that you did in the past that she was not very happy with. If you're tethered, you will respond badly to that. And when you respond badly to that, your partner will basically think, hey, whenever I express myself to this guy, whenever I express myself about my weakness, about my difficulties, about my my unhappiness, he gets weak. He gets unhappy. And if you were if you were working in a company with someone like that, a leader who just gets thrown off whatever the employees feel, mm -hmm. you can never feel safe. Right? You can you don't want to tell this boss whatever it is you're thinking, what is whatever is happening, because you don't think this guy can take it. So as long as you're tethered, it's going to be very hard for you to create safety.
I can see how like women would be, start to feel like it's more like a like more like the guy's a dictator in terms of like if if you tell them anything bad, it's like off of their head. Like no, no. So it's like we're in the process of that. You then lose somebody that wants to communicate with you because you, they're not thinking they can do that. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just keep it to myself rather than tell you and create some drama that you can't even deal with because you're so tethered to to something. The other part is a very subconscious part that I haven't really talked about in any of my YouTube videos either because it's so nuanced. Um, but this is basically the, the subconscious biases that we have about the way we see our life, the way we see relationships that really wreak havoc on the way we interpret something, the way we make decisions on something too. And the easiest way I can illustrate this, um, is through like a simple mathematical game that I do with a lot of my clients as well. Uh, do you mind if we kind of play it for like five minutes? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm on. Yeah. Down. Okay. Okay. So the ma- the game is simple in this game. I'm going to start by giving you three numbers. Okay. All right. So the numbers are two, four, and eight. I'm thinking of a rule, like a mathematical rule that governs the three numbers I just gave you. So like a potential rule could be even numbers, or it could be multiply by two. Those are two possible for two, four, and eight. Okay. Now your job in this game is to guess the rule that I have in mind. But the way you do it is almost like a 20 question style where you can propose a new set of three numbers that you think fits the rule. So if you think the rule is even numbers, you could say to me, Jeff, what about 10, 12, 14? Okay. And I'll tell you whether the three numbers you gave fits my rule or not. We'll do this like three times okay. to see if you can get closer to the rule I'm thinking about, right? And um, I'm going to write down the rule somewhere okay, so that we know we're not just making it up at the end. All right. So give me a set of three numbers that you think fits the rule. Okay. So the numbers two, four, and eight. Let's see. Okay. Um Different numbers. Sure. I mean, the goal, again, is to for you to get closer. Like, if you play 20 questions, you're not going to ask the same questions, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll say 16, 8, and 2. 16, 8, and 2. That doesn't fit my rule. Okay. Uh, let's see. Whew. I'm getting back to the heck of this. Okay. Um, I mean, that was what we do, like, okay. So, first, first, what do you think my rule is? I'm trying to think of a bunch of them. I'm thinking of like, is it is it either addition or is it multiplying or like you have two times four equals eight. So then with the next number possibly be 32, <laughs> that's four times eight equals 32. And then eight times 32 is whatever that would be like. I'm if that's possible, I'm thinking, okay, it could just be maybe I'm making it too hard on myself. It's just like, okay, two times four is eight. And then well, two times four is eight. And then... Or maybe it's double like two times time, uh, two times two is four, and then four times two is eight, and then eight times two is sixteen, and then six times two is thirty-two. No, that's not my rule. Okay. Okay, give me one more set of three numbers. Okay. Uh, let's see. We'll go. You know what? I'll just try this out. Uh, let's see. Three, six, twelve. Three, six, twelve. That fits my rule. What do you think it is? Yes. Okay. Um, I think it's. Two times four is eight. And then, so I just said, okay, three times, wait, so I, I, did, I did addition. I think I did addition. Three, <laughs> what is that? Three, six, 12. So three plus three is six, and then six plus six is 12. So I, I added the number. So two plus two is four, four plus four is eight. Not my rule. Okay. Uh, one more okay. try. One more try. I don't know. I thought I had it on that one, man. No, I thought I really had it on the, the, what okay. I the odd numbers. So let me just tell you what it is. Okay. Uh, number the rule was simply numbers in increasing order. That was it. And and here's why I play. And here's why I play that game with you. Okay. Okay. And this is a this is a very accurate representation of how a lot of our brains think and how we approach communication and relationships in general. Mm-hmm. Um, when I gave you that challenge, the first thing you did was you formed this me- metaphorical box in your head, and the box you play is basically okay. I think the answers could be this, 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 this list of ten things. And when you asked your questions, you were trying to see which of the answers that I put in my box was correct. Yes. Right? You're trying to basically do a process of elimination there. The problem, though, is that what if the answer wasn't never in your box? Wow. Then you could be asking questions all day long and thinking that you know, but you're nowhere closer to the truth. And this is often how we approach relationships we ask questions, which gives us the illusion that we are researching. Mm -hmm. We are knowing. 
we are curious, but we are curious in a very uncurious way. We're actually nowhere closer to truth. So if you hear a lot of your partners saying, for example, never mind, you don't get it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Usually it's because she thinks this guy's not getting it. <laughs> this guy's not getting it and is nowhere close to getting it. Mm -hmm. So just to uh, give you a quick idea, the only way you could have found the answer was if you tried to go antithetic on me. Uh, so for example, if you tried to disprove the rule. So if, okay. you know, in the first one, you gave the three numbers and I said, no, it doesn't fit my rule. That was actually you getting closer to the rule. Because if you kept going and you said, what about 10, 9, 8? What about 10, 7, 4? Because I said you backwards. Start to, yeah, so you start to understand like, okay, oh. anytime I say a negative number or going downwards, it's, it, it, it's wrong. So maybe it's increasing numbers. But we noticed that, what I noticed that, that was interesting was that when I said to you, that fits my rule, you went, yeah. <laughs> but that actually doesn't help you get to the rule. Right. And so this is kind of the way our subconscious biases, the way we've been trained to think uh, in our human brain works, kind of wreaks havoc in a lot of parts of our relationship. It's why we can't really understand our partner bit really deeply, why we can't often understand ourselves. And this is the part that a big part of the program that we try to tap into is understanding the mechanics of these subconscious biases mm. and understanding how they wreak havoc on our relationships and really reversing that to try to think better, to try to look at the world in a very different way as well. And the reason why often I think a lot of people cannot create safety is because they cannot fix these subconscious biases because it's subconscious. They never realize they are doing these things until someone points it out to them. You know? Yeah. To think about how many men think to themselves, well, I'm doing all the right stuff. And well, she's saying that this is the problem. So I, I can do X, Y, and Z to fix it. Not even thinking that like the solution they're coming up with is actually outside of the box and is not anywhere near what's in her box for what she thinks would actually fix the solution in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, precisely. So I appreciate you being patient with me because it's so hard to tell people what they don't know. And I think that game was like the best way to just figure out <laughs> to people like what they don't know. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, I've never heard that game before, but that is definitely like something to add to the repertoire because that would definitely open up a lot of minds. <laughs> like, because I think I always tell when I, when I when I'm coaching men, I always tell them that the, the the main problem we have is like we are all the heroes in our own story, meaning whatever we do is the right thing. So if our woman's coming to us with a problem, well, I know how to fix it. They're crazy. If they don't like the solution, it's because they don't want to work with me. I have all the, and it's like you never think about like, could I be possibly biased based on my own thoughts and how I feel about myself? Like. I don't have all the answers. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the beautiful thing. Like if you look at top leaders, even in business, they don't know all the answers and they are very quick to admit they don't know, they don't know all the answers. So if you look at top leaders, they spend most of the meeting. If it's like an hour meeting, they spend probably like 45 minutes asking really good antithetical questions, really good thought provoking questions. Then at the last part, do they go, oh, here's a solution. But I think a lot of men skip the 45 minutes of asking and discovering because they think they need to know all the answers. Actually, good leaders don't. They don't do that. Very true. Also, honestly, I think too, again, since women typically best communicate through talking, I think a lot of times for men, like I know me, I'm an introvert also. I know after a while, I'm kind of like, we're on the same subject or she's, they've been talking for X amount of time. Can we just get to the point? But it's like it, in doing that, though, you don't allow them to really express and really get out every detail that you would actually need because we just we we're very quick to jump on. You've said like five words. I already know what, what, how to handle this. And it's like, no, no, no. There are other <laughs> stuff to, to, she needs to say before you really get the full solution of what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah. We do that a lot. Um, this is what, what we call like getting lost in the trees and not seeing the forest in a way. We get stuck to like what they're saying. So, for example, they bring up something from that happened five years ago. And the first thing you think about is like, I thought we resolved that. It's like, wait, wait, wait. She's not bringing that up because she wants to bring up like an old hatchet. She's trying to tell you she's trying to show you something she's trying to communicate to you something but you're not seeing it a lot of men don't get that too and it's it's a fascinating thing once men understand just how easy it is for you to understand where your partner's coming from and all you have to do is listen in a proper way it's so simple right it, it, it cuts out all this like politics out of it and all this complexity out of it is beautiful. Now, what can men do at the point where they're feeling like the relationship is hopeless and there's like there's no hope at all like how can a guy realistically start to really see what's really going on and start to turn that kind of stuff around? Um, I think the first thing you need to do is stop playing the victim a bit. Um, you know, 
our human minds, they really fall into, and they're very susceptible to what we call the fundamental attribution error. This is when, uh, whenever we see conflicts happening, whenever we see issues happening to other people, by other people, we tend to blame their character very fast. But if we do the same things, we tend to blame circumstances, environments really fast. Um, a great example of this is like stonewalling again, right? If other people are stonewalling us, we're very quick to say, you're a bad communicator. You suck, right? This can't work out if you're like this. You got to stop doing that. We need to communicate. I mean, we instantly say, this is a character problem with you. But when, when I pinpoint to you all the times that you have stonewalled, we say, oh, it's because this partner is not really good to talk to. Or, or it's because the problem is too complex and I don't really know how to express it. It's because I'm tired, right? So if someone else is doing something bad, we instantly say it's a character problem. But when we are doing the same things, we say, it's not my fault. It's something else's. That happens everywhere. Like even when you're driving, um, someone cuts you off <laughs> and you say, what, an, what a dick. But then if you are driving like that, it's because, oh, it's some circumstance. I have a good reason behind it. As long as you have that kind of thinking, that kind of bias, the fundamental attribution error bias, it's really hard for you to even recognize your role in anything, in anything in relationships. You're always going to be blaming it to something else, some other person. It's always their, their fault. And if you play victim like that, it's really hard for you to ever, you know, if you don't even recognize you have a problem, you can't fix it. I've heard so many men say, you know, well, you know, all women are crazy, yada, 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 but they've been through like nine relationships and all nine of those broke up where the woman left. And I was wondering like, at what point do you realize maybe I'm like, I know it, like 25, 26, I'm like, I'm, I actually have girls that like me now, but then they keep going away. Maybe I'm part of the problem. And a lot of guys don't even like think that's a, a thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a big issue. And I think um, I'm blessed to have like, all, all my clients. So basically before they can even apply for the program <laughs> and enroll as a client from my, from, from mine, I think most of the men, if not all realize that already. Um, so I get to be shielded from those very self-righteous men, but <laughs> yeah, it's a big problem for sure. Cause I get it in a lot of my YouTube comments and so on who haven't taken my program, you know? And speaking of that, cause I've been to your channel and I noticed aside from, by the way, Jeffrey has a lot of great videos giving advice uh, j just the free advice. I mean, the, the stuff at the website is off, but the, the, the stuff on the YouTube channel is fantastic. But he also has a lot of testimonials from guys that have gone through his program and had really, really good results. What would you say? Because obviously you teach a lot of this in your program, but like, what's like, like one thing that you teach these guys in the program that you've realized, oh, this is really an eye opener for guys that they, that is able to actually like allow them to go back to their significant other or struggling relationship and then turn it around. The biggest part for us uh, is, is to, well, it's, it's really hard to boil it down to a few. Let me try to my best here. It's really four different layers, I think. And sorry, sorry to make overcomplicate this, but you know, it's not just uh, surface level stuff that really matters, right? It's like you got to have this deep internal change, and to create that deep internal change, you got to embrace complexity a bit. Um, the first layer that we have is what we call in our program the bulletproof mindset, and this is really a different way of managing your emotions, looking at the world, to allow you to do and say the right things and say the right things and do the right things all the time, effortlessly and out of a more genuine place. And so the crux of this is if, let's say you look at the approach of most people into how they manage emotions. You know, if you look at the principles of emotions is that an event happens first, the event subconsciously passes through your paradigms, um, the way you've been trained to believe the world in a certain way, the way, the lens you see the world, basically. This can be uh, done through how you grew up, um, the, your experiences, but we subconsciously have all these beliefs in our mind. So the event passes through the lens of our beliefs and we make an interpretation out of it, either good or bad. And the interpretation is what causes the emotion, right? And we know this principle is true because if you put a hundred people in the same room, looking at the same thing, experiencing the same thing, those hundred people are going to have drastically different emotions about that same event. It's because the event itself doesn't create the emotions, it's the way we interpret it. Mm. So if we understand that principle, that interpretations cause the emotions, we start to see how a lot of uh, approaches to emotions management start to break down. So people talk about, for example, journaling. People talk about meditation. People talk about um, breathing and creating some space between you and the problem, et cetera, the, the good little stuff. 
Yeah. The problem with this is that you're trying to change their emotions after the emotions has formed, which is difficult because this is like trying to tell a depressed person to try to like save themselves. You're already in a negative emotional state, which colors the way you interpret your world. And now you're supposed to like save yourself. It's too late. So a lot of men find themselves in a position where they say something wrong. They say something they regret. Then they tell, them, tell themselves, next time I'll do better. <laughs> but then the next time something bad happens again and they do the same thing. And they live in this constant cycle of regrets because the techniques and the approaches they're trying does not get to the core, which is, are you changing the way you see your world? Are you changing the way you interpret the event, the way you interpret the world? And so what we do here in the program is we try to teach people, hey, here's how you see the world differently. Get rid of your subconscious biases, right? Mm. Um, see relationships from a different paradigm. Understand what it means to actually be masculine and so on. Then we also teach people how to program these paradigms in a very effective way so that this becomes the natural way that you think. And so now, for example, right, if my clients, you know, if so my clients all come to me when they have destroyed safety big time. And when you destroy safety big time, you get a lot of resistance in a form of stonewalling, for example. Now, when you get stonewalled, a lot of men would go, oh, I, I, I get upset. But the way we've been trained to respond is, hey, if your partner stonewalls you, that is a very genuine and very good expression in itself. And one thing you can just respond to, for example, is, hey, uh, I noticed that you're shutting down. Um, I want you to know that it's okay. You know, my old self was someone who, whenever you shut down, I would get all hissy and pissy to you. And I think that actually made you shut down even more. Now I'm realizing that when you shut down, it's usually because you don't feel good talking to me. So I actually appreciate you shutting down. Now imagine if you said that to your partner, right? That is literally- 180, yeah. Well, complete 180. But it would not come naturally to you if you haven't made that internal shift. You wouldn't even think about saying that if you haven't made the internal shift and saw the world in a different way. And if you're not poised enough to say that. So that's kind of how the, the, the bulletproof mindset that we call it kind of works together with your understanding the mm -hmm. frameworks to allow you to play the frameworks a lot better as well. And yeah. we can go deeper into um, this, the third layer, which is what we call identity shifting. And this is a crucial part because the best way to, to explain this is when you were starting this podcast, all right, and, and your business, and when you announced to people that you were doing this and you quit your job before, what did people say to you? Well, you know, it's funny. I started yeah. my journey doing this uh, back in 2004 when I, I completely failed in a relationship again. <laughs> and yeah. I, I decided, you know what? I need to write a book. I, I, I decided to write a book on how not to date. Because I was like, I can't really write a book on how to date, but I can write one how not to date. And I remember <laughs> I was typing up the book I was, at my, I was at mom's house at the time. My brother comes in and is like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm writing a book on dating. And he's like, you? Like, yeah, I'm writing exactly. a book on like, I'm not to date. And it's like, well, but you're horrible at dating. Like, how, who's going to believe, who's going to listen to you? I'm like, so that's then. Fast forward to like now, where now my brother will come to me and say, hey, I'm having an issue with my relationship. Can you help me out? It's like, oh, this is a complete difference from when I started out. Like, Exactly, exactly. And that's uh, the experience for a lot of my clients as well, is that, you know, in anything in life, right? You, you ask anyone in life. They want a different life. They want a different future. They want a life where they have better relationships, better sex, happier, richer, whatever it is. They want a different life. But what a lot of people don't realize is that to get the different life, you have to become someone different. You have to talk differently. You have to think different. You have to believe in different things. You have to maybe dress different. I don't know. You have to become a different person inside and out. But the problem is that when you try to become someone different, right? When I was starting my business, for example, I, I was a data scientist before. And I was trying to be a, a relationship coach. Everyone was like, that's not you, mm -hmm. right? So as soon as you try to become someone different like that, to get to your next level, you get resistance externally. People question you, people doubt you mm. in the context of relationships, right? This is when you find me, for example, and you start to change the way you talk. Your partner will say, why do you sound like that? Why are you talking like that? You just, why do you sound like a therapist? So instantly you get external doubt. If we haven't shifted our identity, the way we define ourselves, that external doubt quickly becomes internal doubt. And it can be very subconscious to where we start to question ourselves, we start to have a lot of doubt, we start to get depressed, we start to get demotivated, and we kind of slow down. And I'm sure when you were trying to start your business, you wanted to slow down quite a lot. Is this me? Should I, mm. should I be doing this? Right? You had a lot of doubt. Yep. Um, and when a lot of partners, right, 
when this doubt becomes so strong, they start to either give up or slow down the changes. And when you slow down the changes, so imagine this, you've been promising to your partner for three months, I'm going to change. These changes are real. And your partner has been resisting that the whole time, suspicious of that the whole time. And eventually, three months later, you, you just give up. It's like, well, I knew it. <laughs> it's not real. The changes aren't real. Right? So the other part to this is you have to learn how to shift your identity because the way we've been questioning the world as humans, I think, is we tend to ask the question, who am I? Right? We like to define ourselves. So we go to a clothing store and we say, that's not me. That's me. We go look at some friends and we say, that's me. That's not me. So we always try to define who we are. But the problem is that when we define who we are, we're locked into who we are and we cannot become anymore. So when we try to become, this identity to who we are kind of holds us back. It always pulls us back. And it comes in the form of doubts. It comes in the form of questioning yourself. It comes in the form of people feeling unnatural, doing different things. And when you do that, that's a big problem. You can't really change because that's like this chain holding you down in a way. And so the other thing that we help people too is to cut the chains from the old self, learn what it means to become like more like water, who can really evolve to whoever you want to be to accomplish what you want. You know, that's a massive part as well. And the last part, of course, is building self-esteem as well. It's, um, you know, a lot of toxic behaviors, insecurities, is really due to the lack of self-esteem. And we work really deep with people to understanding what self-esteem is and how to build that in a very predictable way as well. Nice. I also find too, like, I think... I know, especially with a lot of the the toxic sides of of dating advice out there, that there can be a fear of if I open up, if I allow my partner to really get to know me, if I if I if I let my guard down and let my emotional safety down to let this person in, that could be seen as less than masculine, and she could want to leave me because I'm not being stoic or I'm not doing whatever, and that only creates less trust, also. Yeah, and I think the the misnomer that a lot of people have to, and again, this is when we got to the conversation of. The answers are never in the extremes. It's always in the middle ground. So we can talk about emotions on this one, for example. So most people, they see emotions that are, as in two poles. One is you are totally lost in your emotions. You're vulnerable, all these things. The other side is you're totally stoic. Other side is actually not too good, right? So of course, when you're totally carried away by emotions, it's, that's not very attractive. And it's, yeah. you can't function in life like that. But being stoic is also very unattractive, right? Imagine... Your partner comes home to you crying about something and you are just completely stoic. It's like, it's, it's not a very fun conversation to be in. Um, the, the thing we preach is like something in the middle of this is what we call controlled compassion. It's when you're in control of your emotions enough because you understand how to interpret the world, but you are still compassionate in a sense that you are able to show the appropriate emotion for that particular time. All right, so if a, your girlfriend comes home crying to you. You're not completely stoic, but you're getting down to her level in a way to really make her feel deeply understood, to really make her feel deeply heard with the right tone, with the right emotions, with the right vibe and aura for that particular conversation. And that's the middle ground that a lot of people, I think, have a hard time embracing, um, especially with now a lot of people talking about be more masculine, be more masculine, be more masculine, be more stoic, be more stoic. And stoicism is such a big topic right now. And I don't really agree fully with either extremes. I think anything in life, you got to embrace the middle. Yeah. And I think some of that too, like, I think some of those things are examples of things where we'll say leaning towards an extreme can work necessarily per se in the attraction phase of like, you know, like a woman doesn't want to meet you on the first date and you're crying your eyes out or whatever, but like in a relationship, that's bound to happen. People are going to, you know, pass away. Hard things are going to happen. And for you to still be in that same frame of mind, like that doesn't always work when you're doing something long-term because they want to know that you feel stuff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The last question I have is for, so there are going to be men listening to this that let's say they're not in relationships yet. And, but they're, they're wanting to get towards one. They know at some point if they date somebody that it gets to a relationship and it's going to be coming. How can they in advance of those kind of things. How can they know, how can they create an environment of emotional safety for any upcoming relationship that they have? Again, it's not like a one answer kind of deal. It's a, it's a full package, but I think the best um, example that I can give is understanding the principle behind persuasion. Um, so here, when you're in a relationship, whether you're in a marriage or you're starting to date someone, Right. The number one thing I think you need to do is to persuade that person to feel safe with you. And 
I know a lot of people here probably, you know, in the dating stages are probably saying like, well, why is safety the number one thing? Again, safety is what it is why the masculine figure is so important. The masculine figure is there to create that safety. If you can create that emotional safety, that's how you build a connection. That's how you make someone, a woman feel comfortable around you, right? Uh, it, it doesn't ruin intrigue or anything like that. This is just human connection in general. And if we want to persuade safety and trust, we have to understand that the essence of persuasion is not about what you say. So a lot of people, when they're dating, when they're in the relationships, they tend to focus too much on being interesting. And like they are like this awesome macho winner figure. <laughs> but persuasion doesn't happen when you say something, right? Persuasion happens when you, f- you feel understood by the person that's persuading you. So for example, if you go to a mechanic and something's wrong with your car and you go to two mechanics, one mechanic was able to describe to you exactly what's going on with your car. He tells you, I've driven your car before. He even points out problems with your car that you can't even, you you didn't even realize. But you know, like once he mentions it, you're like, yeah, you're right. That is a problem. Instantly, without him telling you what he's going to do to fix it. Without him telling you about his awards, about how big his business is, whatever it is, instantly you trust that guy. Because it's not about what you say, it's about how you make the other person feel understood. And so when it comes to dating or relationships, don't be interesting. Don't try so hard to be interesting, saying the perfect things. Learn how to become interested and learn how to understand someone on a very deep level to where you can either describe their sensations, their feelings deeper than they can themselves. If you can do that, any date you go to, you're going to be such a great date. Any relationship you go to, you're going to be such a great partner to be around if you can develop that skill. That's so true. And it's interesting. I have a friend of ours, a female friend from way back in the day, they used to tell us that she actually appreciated like, it's kind of like she knew how the dance of dating and relationships worked. And she was actually happy to know, like she could tell when a guy knew what he was doing, like, oh, he knew how to, you know, talk to me and how to get this drink, this and that. And at the time I was like, but isn't that game playing? Like, you he, you know, he's running game on you. But it was like, no, I know how, that he knows how to treat me in the way I want to be treated. So that makes me feel more, a better connection. It's like, oh, well, I got money and oh, I know how to do this and I'm going to treat you right, babe. I swear. It's like <laughs> just doing the actions of that and letting her feel that it's, it's persuading her without even having to say it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Please let people know where they can find your, your more of your stuff, your channels, your websites, all that good stuff. You can find me on YouTube, of course. Uh, my name is a bit complicated. It's Jeffrey Satiawan. <laughs> but I'm sure you will have my name, my full name somewhere in the, on the page. So you can find me there. Um, just Google my name, uh, you search it on YouTube, and you can find my channel. Um, I also have a masterclass. So if you check out um, any of my videos, and you check out the description or even in the end um, screen of my videos, you can see a link to the masterclass. And in this masterclass, basically, we go really deep into telling you about the different factors and the different uh, parts of the system of what you need to understand, what you need to master, so that you can create this very complete and holistic and thriving relationship, both not only uh, in the external side and the relationship itself, but also where you can feel at home where your partner can feel at home and feel like you are thriving together in the relationship as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, guys. I hope you learned a lot. So definitely check out his webpage, check out his YouTube channel. Like I said, he's got a lot of great videos there, a lot of great links that you can learn all about the ins and outs of uh, being in a relationship and learning the ins and outs of how to heal your relationships, how to better connect with your partner, all this stuff you can find at his website. You can also go to my website, introvertdatingsuccess.com for eBooks, audiobooks, programs, and my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Harry Wilmington. If you found the info in this episode to be helpful, please show your support by clicking on the tip jar tab, the link of which can be found at the website and in the description below. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment on this episode and catch new episodes right here on YouTube or wherever podcasts can be found. In the meantime, be sure to check out these other episodes so you too can learn to date as your introverted self while still getting your precious alone time. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. What up, guys? It's your boy, Harry Wilmington here. Welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show, the live edition. I decided to go live tonight because I'm going to be honest. I was on vacation for like two weeks. I got a lot of questions in, and I do a video a day, but I figured, you know what? I want to get to all the questions that were asked while I was on vacation, have them in one full video, and then I can chop them up 
and put them into individual videos for people to watch during the week. So for all you guys who've been writing me, hopefully you'll get to see this and get your question answered. I will leave the chapters for the various questions that I'm answering so it's easier for you guys to find the question that you may have asked me, all right? So we got a lot of questions on the docket tonight. We got a lot of questions that I got asked during vacation. And so uh, if you look at the thumbnail, you can see that one of the main questions we're going to answer is the question somebody asked me about single moms. And so I'm going to answer that question first, and then I'm going to go through these other various questions. This is a live that is about you guys. So if you happen to have a question for me during this live, you can leave it in the chat, and I will do my best to get to it as I'm going through these other questions as well. All right. So this guy writes me a question about dating a single mom and the potential dynamics that could happen if they were to have kids together. So his question goes, hi, Harry, I watched the video on dating single moms. And I did a video where I talk about the 10 reasons to consider not dating single moms. All right. He says, I understand you're a busy man, but I just wanted to ask you a quick question on something because I respect your opinion. To make a long story short, what would you think of a man dating a young 20s single mom with one child who was willing to have two kids with the new man? Do you think this would change the dynamic in a beneficial way? One child with previous mom and two with new partner. Okay, so if you saw my reasons not to date single moms video, I, I mentioned in that video how the her having a previous kid means that when you come into the picture, she's going to already probably have a set way of doing things. And more often than not, the way that she's disciplining her kid is going to be different from how you would do it. Now, because that's a kid that she had with somebody else, then it is technically in her right and whoever the father's is right to decide how to discipline that child, right? Here's where the problem arises. You come into the picture, you decide to date her, she could be a very reasonable person and you guys get along well and you guys get married and you guys decide to have two kids, right? Here's the problem that can arise. And there's a few. For one is that the first kid that she had is still being disciplined based on the rules that she set and potentially the father of that kid sets. You having kids with her means now you're going to set rules for both those kids for, for those kids based on her, what she wants and what you want. But there can be a, a off balance there because kid A is being disciplined under a different set of rules than the two kids that you have together. So what can possibly happen is resentment builds when, let's say, for example, uh, the kid that she had with the other guy, right? Let's say he gets good grades in schools and uh, the father, is the, the, that kid is like, well, I want to be able to give him money anytime he gets like straight A's, right? But let's say you feel some kind of way about that. You figure getting grades should just be its own reward and not getting money for it. So you're saying with your kids, you don't want to give them money just because they got straight A's in school. This is going to create a power dynamic and a problem because these kids that you had with this woman are going to be seeing um, how this one kid's being treated that she had with this other guy, and they're going to see it as unfair. And you might try to fight for that. You might try to say, hey, you know what? Well, you know, since this kid is technically living in our house now uh, with our, our two other kids, that he should also not get paid money for straight A's. But the outside father has a say in that. And that can cause conflict amongst the kids, as well as amongst you, the mom, and this other father's potential dynamic, all right? Now, here's another thing. I actually know a woman right now that had four kids by four individual guys, and she stayed with the fourth guy, right? So the fourth guy now wants to move out of state for his job. There are th four kids there, only one of which he is responsible for technically, even though they all now live under his house and they, uh, they live together. But the point is that, so he's moving out of state, but there are three other men in that conversation that get to have a say in whether or not this man gets to take all these kids away from the state that they all grew up in to move someplace else. And true to form, some of those kids have had fathers that said, no, you're not going to move my kid. So he's going to stay here. And some have said, well, he's going to move in. The kid's going to move in with me because I don't want to not see my kid. And you know what? Those fathers are in that right. So 
all that said, there, if you saw that video, you know there are a ton of things, other things that come up. But this dynamic of you trying to have kids with this woman, yes, you're going to be able to discipline your kids the way you want to. And ideally, ideally you find a woman that is going to be okay with you also laying down the law on her kids. But what I'm saying is there's always a, a very good chance that that is not the case, or there's a chance that you and the other potential fathers that are in the in the circle uh, don't agree on certain things or don't get along. And that's going to cause a lot of tension. All right. So these are things that all I'm saying was to say, this does not mean that it's not an option you could take. But what I'm saying is there are a lot more things like that, that are very, very serious to consider when it's, the, it'd be different. If it was just you and the woman and she was single, but when there's kids in play, that poses a different dynamic that I honestly feel you don't need to deal with. Like you're talking about, dating a young 20 single mom there are so many other women that are young and in their 20s that you could date that have great attitudes and have a good head on their shoulders and don't have kids like there's plenty of them out there and so i would typically err on the side to say no i wouldn't date i'd say you need to go after somebody that is in their young 20s they should not be they should not have kids already let alone have kids and not be married and be a single mom and you can find that out there so you have to ask yourself, why is it that you're looking in the first place to like purposely go after a single mom? Like it'd be different if like you guys hooked up and then she became a mom because you got her pregnant, but that didn't happen. And because there's such a, a bevy of options out there of women that are single and don't have kids, you have to ask yourself why you're going after an option that in the long run is going to cause either more problems or it's going to have more dynamics to it that you have to figure out like a puzzle piece when you don't really have to do that. So hopefully this answers your question that you uh, graciously wrote me on, in a comment section, okay? So um, there, we're, so now we're going to another question. By the way, like I said, guys, this live is all about you. So if you guys have any comments or questions that you'd like to be answered, just leave them in the chat. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and put in the chat, uh, got a question, write your question here and have it answered on the show live. All right, so... We'll get on to this next question. So uh, this question comes from a guy who met a woman at a wedding and he's also wheelchair bound. So there's some issues that have come up as it pertains to him trying to connect with this woman and talking to her other relatives that is now causing some turmoil. So his question goes like this. He says, hi coach, in June of 2022, I met a girl at a friend's wedding. We talked off and on and at the end, she asked me, for my social media, so we exchanged Instagram. Well, I'm glad that you were able to connect. I typically err on the side of phone numbers, but the fact that you got some way to connect with her is a bold step, because a lot of guys wouldn't even try to uh, see, go to a woman and actually ask for the information, because they'd be all shy and nervous about it. He says, a few days later, I asked her out, and she said, yes. Me being an overthinker and also wheelchair bound said, there is no way this girl said yes without hardly knowing me. Oh boy, here we go. So we're now running into the uh, limited mindset and projection. So to stress, if you're a guy that hasn't had a lot of women that have said yes to him dating, or in this case, this guy's in a wheelchair, so you've had obstacles in your way that you feel have potentially blocked you from dating women, what can often happen is when you first start getting yeses, you would think when you first start getting yeses, you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so great, a woman saying yes to me. But here's what happens. This is how our mind tricks us, guys. Okay, check this out. If you've been hearing no, 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 nonstop from women, and then a woman comes along and says yes, you're now in the habit and pattern of hearing no. Your reality is that women are going to say no to you because why wouldn't that be your reality? Other women have said no. So when a woman comes along and says yes, your brain's going to be on autopilot and think, wait, did I hear her say yes? That can't be true. That's not a thing. Like consciously you won't think that, but subconsciously your brain is used to hearing no and getting rejection. So this is something that you guys got to look out for because let's say you watch a lot of my videos, you get my content and you start reading up on how to attract women. You're going to go out there, do some of these things. You're going to attract a woman that says yes to you. And you're going to think it's a fluke. That didn't happen. You're going to project and think she didn't really mean what she actually said. Like she was saying yes to me, but 
That couldn't have possibly been what she meant. She must have actually meant to say no, and she's doing this to appease me. Or she said yes in the moment, but she's going to reject me because all you've heard up to this point is rejection, okay? So recognize, most women, are, are when they say a thing to you like, yes, I'll go on a date with you, let, let a flake happen before you start thinking, she must be, she, this isn't what she actually meant, okay? Have enough faith in yourself to believe that when you're asking a woman out and you've had some rapport with her and she's given you the information to contact her, that she legitimately enjoyed the rapport, that she legitimately wants you to contact her, and that when she says yes for a date, she legitimately means yes to the date, all right? Anyway, continuing on, he says, uh, so he he said, there's no way that she said yes to the hardly knowing, which is, which is a falsitude because it's actually easier to get a yes uh, answer for a date from a woman that hardly knows you versus one that has known you for quite some time. Because at that point, she's put you into the, the uh, friendship category and now you're out. So when you start in the beginning asking women out, what's going to happen is she hasn't put you in a category yet. So if you say, let's go on a date, she's thinking in the moment, okay, I don't know if this is going towards friendship or relationship. He's asking for a date. So he wants it to lead towards a relationship, possibly. Let's check out that avenue first, all right? But when you do the he's doing where it's like, well, I don't know if, he, if, if she meant it or whatever, then what happens is it starts gearing more towards friendship and then you lose out, all right? So again, this is why you got to assume when she says yes to a date that she's, she, that's an inquiry that's her saying, I am willing to invest to see where this could potentially be. Now, this guy says, uh, he... Uh, she said, there's no way this girl said yes without hardly knowing me. Uh, so I asked her sister who went to the wedding too. I said, your sister wouldn't be the kind to say yes just to be nice, would she? She said, no. This is where the problems begin. You do not want to be bringing in family members or other people that could potentially ruin this thing because what do you think possibly happened? Here's what my scenario, right? He goes to the sister and says, hey, so I'm curious. I asked your sister out on a date, but she said yes, but would she actually mean that? Yada, yada, yada. So she's going to talk to you about it. You're going to think, okay, good, what a relief. She's then going to go to her sister that you tried to ask out and say, hey, did, did so-and-so ask you out on a date? That's so funny because he just asked me if when he's asked you out, if you actually meant the thing, and blah, 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 blah. And now she's going to be able to read that you don't actually think you are worthy of getting her to say yes to a date, which is gonna make her think, but why does he not think I'm worthy? Like, does this mean he's been rejected by girls in the past? Does he not know how to handle women? Should I have said yes to this date? Should I be having buyer's remorse now? And that's all because you got somebody else involved and the person that you got involved, you show doubt to about this being a thing, which then she then transferred over to the person you asked out. So this is why when you ask women out, guys, I understand. I know the fear of like, you ask her out and you're thinking, what if she flakes? What if she rejects me? You need to go through the entire process of you ask her out and then you leave her the heck alone until you show up for the date to pick her up or until you show up for the date where you guys agreed to meet. You need to go through the practice of that because you need to build up the habit and become comfortable with the idea that when you ask women out, they legit will actually show up and that they legit want to see you. If you don't allow yourself to practice this, there's always going to be this doubt. You're going to always try to ask five or six other people, what does so-and-so really think of me? Or is she really excited for this date or not? And all that does when it gets back to her is make her doubt that she should have gone out with you. All right? Continuing on. So then he says, so she said, the, the sister said, no, she wouldn't say it, just be nice. The next day I talked to her sister and that's when she threw the whole I'm too busy for a relationship, so as long as it's just friends, I'll go out. Now, why did she do that? The reason that she did that is because, again, the sister went back to her and told her what you told her, which is like, oh, would she be the kind of just flake Mrs. Nat, which made this the sister now realize that he must be putting a lot of importance on this date, and it must be because he has a high interest and he really, really likes me, and he's already nervous about trying to get with me, and... That's not what women want to feel when they get asked up by a guy. They want to be asked up by guys that are confident, that know that they deserve the date and that he has worth. When you ask things like this or when you start showing self-doubt, it puts her on the pedestal. Women don't want to be on the pedestal because they don't like being the leaders in the relationship. So thus, because the way he was acting put so much for focus and force onto this date being an end-all be-all of a relationship, 
when it's really just an inquiry. Guys, a date is just an inquiry into a person. It is not anything solidifying any kind of relationship. But when you act this nervous and start asking these kind of questions, then it makes the woman feel like you're already in relationship mode on what should just be a simple date. Thus, her saying, well, we can go out, but as long as we're just friends, because she's feeling, though, as though you're going to make this date as if you're already boyfriend and girlfriend, all right? So again, when you ask women on dates, just ask for the freaking date, and that's it. Don't try to ask extra questions. Does this mean that, would you would you say yes and really mean no, blah, 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 because that shows self-doubt. It shows that you have a, a lack of abundance mindset, and it's going to ultimately make her feel like you're not the fun, jovial, confident guy that she met at the wedding. Anyway, he says, uh, we've hung out three times in the last eight months. That is, that's not good. That's only three times in eight months. Like, even if you guys are just friends, you should be seeing her more than three times. Anyway, he says, she seems to be getting more comfortable, but unfortunately, between hangouts, dates, or whatever, there is hardly any communication. She has recently started reacting to my stories on Instagram, but that's just social media. Uh, uh, any thanks for your advice in advance? He worded that weird. But anyway, so look, guy, realistically, you've known this woman for eight months now. You're effectively in the friend zone. If you don't want to be in the friend zone, then you need to stop hanging out with her so much. Or you could do the tried and true tested method of lessening the time that you're spending with her. And when she asks you to hang out, just say, hey, you know what? I'm actually busy. Or, hey, you know what? I got a date scheduled, but let's hang out another time. If you do that a couple of times where she really wants to hang out with you and you just say, uh, I got other plans, uh, this girl wants to take me out, then what will start to happen to her is she'll start to recognize, ideally, that she's not getting as much of your attention as she once did, and it may frustrate her. And you actually want her to be frustrated. You want her to be frustrated enough to where she starts questioning, why is it that every time you reject her for a hangout, she gets frustrated? And if she's able to feel that enough time, she might start to recognize maybe the reason I feel frustrated is because I actually enjoy his company and I'm actually starting to like him in a capacity that's more than a friendship. And he's been telling me that he's been going on these dates. So does that, if he actually makes one of these dates work out, could I potentially lose him and not get as much time with him anymore? And so that could make her start to question where she wants to be with you or not in a relationship capacity, at which point she can come to you and say, hey, so I've been thinking about it. I would, I want to go on a date too, or hey, I think we should really talk about what we're actually going to be or whatever, okay? But that said, it can be really, really hard to get out of the friendship zone, and most guys aren't willing to do the Hail Mary of just lessening their time with her. So I'm going to say this, effectively. If you want to have a shot at potentially dating this woman, you got to lessen your time with her. Like, if you're hanging out with her, for example, three times a week, lessen it down to like one time every two weeks, all right? Really push to her that if you're not going to date, that's cool, but you have other things going on. And you don't have to say that directly to her. Like you don't have to go to her and say, hey, so because we're not dating, I'm going to spend less time with you. Just start doing it. Just start, she'll hit you up. Hey, I want to go see this movie with you. Are you available? And you can say, oh, you know what? I can't make it. I actually, uh, this girl wanted to take me out somewhere, so I can't make it. But hey, let's hang out in like next week. Again, do that just a couple of times and then start to see if she turns. Now, she might just think, well, if you guys are just friends, she's actually happy for you dating other people, in which point then you got to, I still say, be talking to other women because realistically, if you're in the friend zone, like I said, it's hard to get out. So don't rely on this particular person to be the one that's going to want to date you. But with that said, if you do that enough times, ideally it could work out. But lastly, I'll say this too, is that you may have a lack of abundance mindset because you're in a wheelchair and you may feel as though that is no pun intended, handicapping you from the kind of dating that you want to do, okay? But understand this, you have a physical handicap. Plenty of guys out there have other handicaps, whether it's, you know, their mindset or they're autistic or they just have other things going on that are causing them to not be as, as potentially not be as great with women and yet they're still great with women. Like there are plenty of guys out there that don't have money and are broke and you would think that's a handicap for a guy, but I, I have dated as a broke guy. I've dated some hot women when I was a broke guy, all right? So it really goes back to your mindset. If you are not looking at who you are as a guy that other women are going to want, then no girl's going to believe it either, all right? It starts with changing what's up here and believing that you, regardless of your situation, will have women out there that are attracted. This woman at the wedding, it should be proof that women will find you attractive. It's your own self-doubt that costs her 
to then have self-doubt. So you don't want to project onto a woman things that you don't want her to feel about you. Now, if you need help with that, you can go to introvertdatingsuccess.com. You can sign up for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And you can also go there to sign up for the Introvert Dating Success Academy, where we well, we will help you learn these kind of things, get your mindset situated, and then learn the ins and outs of how to date authentically while still getting your alone time if you're an introvert, all right? So hopefully, Guy, this helps you out. All right, before we move on, we have a question in the chat. And the question says, is there any truth to the 20% of guys get 80% of all women? So I look, if I'm going to be honest with you, I think that there is somewhat of truth to that, but I think ultimately it's a marketing ploy. Like I think that just businesses in general do a good job of marketing the whole numbers thing. And like, like I, I watched Corey, uh, Corey Wayne stuff and he talks about, you know, the 3% man, only 3% of men get like most of the women or know what to do with women. That I actually believe could be true. I think that most men ultimately really don't know how women communicate and how they best are attracted. But that said, I find that ultimately in terms of 20% of the guys getting 80% of the women, what I, what I think is this, I think that, um, there's not that if we're going if we're going in terms of like the high value men that women are typically looking after i don't think that there are enough high value men out there like i think there's like realistically maybe 10 percent of men that are would be considered high value in terms of like from a money or status point like you know like a high-end job and stuff like that i think there are plenty of average to great guys out there that honestly do pretty good i think that most average to slightly above average men end up with average to slightly above average women. I think there are more average people overall than like extremely hot or extremely muscular or extremely uh, financially, you know, in the millions and billions of dollars out there. I think that for purposes of what I do, that in this dating space, the, the media and the, the marketing behind it is a great job of saying, you gotta become that 20% or that 3% guy to get a woman. And I don't think that's true. But I think that what happens is that I think women in particular, uh, oftentimes overlook the average guys for a good portion of their life. And then at the point where, you know, their fertility starting to dry up or at the point where they get into their thirties and like, they're not the hot cute thing anymore. Then they decide to open up and expand what they're looking at. Uh, whereas those older guys, honestly, most guys are like, we might have a certain type, like, Oh, I like light skin or dark skin, or I like a woman with, with T and a, but I think that even if we have a certain likes, we're more often willing to settle for something else because our, our overall drive is to be able to procreate and to care and protect women. And sometimes we might want to go after that 10 model, but there's a six over here that is friendly to us and is willing to actually let us be the man that we want to be in terms of our actions. And we'll be fine with that. Uh, I think in terms of women, I think some of them learn that lesson a little bit too late. And honestly, I think to this, I think that Women that grow up in two-parent households have a more realistic view of the kind of men that they should actually go for versus women that grow up in single-parent homes, whether it's a, they're with a single mom or a single dad, because there's trauma there. there. There's been a divorce. There's been a break in the family. And I think that those kind of women, as a result of that, are typically looking at the top 20% of guys because situationally, they don't want to be stuck the same way that they were stuck as kids. Because a lot of women that come from single mom homes, for example, their moms didn't make a lot of money. They were always struggling. And so by default of that situation, yeah, they're going to look for a guy that makes six figures or is in the top 20% because as long as he has money, she's not going to go for broke. She's not going to worry about where her next meal is coming from or where uh, she's going to be living. Okay. Now, women get into those situations with those 10 or 20% of guys, and then they realize in those situations, they didn't consider that those guys are run up by all women. And so those men typically tend to cheat a lot more than maybe the average guy would because he has the money to do that and he has the resources to be able to take care of a bevy of women if he so chooses. Not all women want that, but there are plenty of women that are willing to be part of that. Like I look at uh, like, you know, P Diddy, Puff Daddy, Sean Combs, whatever. He had young Miami follow him around while he had a baby with another woman. And she was just like, well, when we're together, we just do our thing because she's a person that's after the money. So I think there are women out there like that, but I think that the, you know, the dating sphere in general does a really bad job of saying women only want those guys. Because again, I consider myself an average to maybe slightly above average guy and I do pretty well. So hopefully that answers that question. So let's get on to some of these other questions here. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, I'll answer this one. He said, so this guy's uh, question is about, um, he asked to go out on Valentine's Day 
And then basically she canceled the date, but there's more to it than that. So short question. He says, sad Valentine's day for me. The girl says she realized she doesn't want to be dating right now. Canceled the day say, date saying she's been in so many relationships and needs to take a break from dating to work on mental health. Is that a real excuse uh, or just does she lose interest? I guess I don't want to accept that she lost interest. Thank you so much. Well, you know, it's one of those things where it's like half and half. So I think that there's the half where she says that she's been in so many relationships and needs to take a break. I think that realistically, if you were the guy that she ultimately found that was her end all be all, checked all the stuff off the boxes on her list and stuff like that, that she'd have no problem dating you regardless of if she had mental health stuff going on. Because realistically, life is going to always throw stuff at us. So even if we're like mentally sound, there's going to be stuff that comes up that's going to challenge us mentally and causes us to like have to think a little bit harder. And that that's just real life stuff, okay? Now, that said, the other half is that if a woman gets to a point where she realizes, hey, you know what? I'm, you know, the common denominator in all my relationships and I'm constantly running into problems. These problems might be me. Like, it's not always just the guy. After like four or five relationships back to back and they keep going haywire, there's something that I'm doing wrong. Maybe there's some stuff in my childhood that I didn't fully like deal with that I need to deal with. Then that kind of woman may be enlightened enough to realize, hey, even if I want to date this guy, I'm in no position right now to date this guy because I don't want to risk bringing uh, him into chaos that I'm still going through. I got some work to do. And in that case, that could be a thing. But even with that, a woman that ultimately really wanted to date you would say, hey, I'm going through some stuff right now. So for now, can we just like, I, I, I enjoy your company, but I don't want to do anything super serious like dating or being in a relationship while I'm trying to figure my stuff out. So give me some time. You know, once I figure that stuff out, if, if, I feel like as though I'm ready to date, then I'd love to hit you up and we can go do something, okay? That's a woman that's saying, I recognize I have some issues, but I'm still interested in you. Now, last thing too is, I'm guessing since he asked her out on Valentine's Day, based on her response, that this was probably gonna be like their first, maybe second date, all right? And this is why I stress to you guys, when you first start dating a woman, holidays and birthdays should not be days that you meet up with her because those are days that are reserved for when you're in a couple. So when you as the guy go to her after the first date and say, hey, for our second date, let's go out on Valentine's Day or let's go out on a birthday. That is going to uh, give the impression to a woman that you're already farther along in your interest in her than she is at that time. Women need two to three months to solidify their feelings for you. That gives them time to vet you, to see consistency from you, and to feel if they actually want to be with you in a long-term relationship. When you present holidays and birthdays as date days, that's saying to her, I already feel as though we're in a relationship, and that's going to more often than not chase them away. So steer clear of birthdays and holidays until you actually get into the relationship, and then you can start doing that stuff. Now, here's the other thing too. You, with that, if you follow that rule, what you'll find is you're going to inevitably date a woman where her birthday comes up or a holiday comes up. Let's say you decide to follow what I just say and you skip it. You don't see her on her birthday. You don't see her on a holiday. She may get mad at you. You actually want that to happen because what that's going to do is spark a conversation about where she is in her journey. So let's paint the scenario, right? Her birthday came and went. You might've sent like a happy birthday, but you didn't celebrate with her. You didn't take her out, didn't get her a gift and she's mad. Hit you up the next day. Hey, so-and-so. So I just want you to know that I felt really kind of some kind of way that you didn't like get me anything for my birthday or get a gift of this, this, and that. You respond back. That's interesting. Well, let's talk about that. Like, why are you upset? She'll be like, well, because I thought, you know, we were, we've been dating for a while now. And I just thought that, you know, we were closer and this, this, and that. And then you would respond back with, well, you know, I typically think that, you know, birthdays and holidays are reserved for relationships. And I just didn't think we were there in that step of their dating process because you haven't expressed that you wanted to be in a relationship. Are you saying that you want to have that discussion? So what you're doing here is you're now putting it on her to have the discussion about being in a relationship. At this point, it'll go one or two ways. Either she'll say, oh, well, you know, I guess you're right. We're not in a relationship yet, so my bad, I'm tripping. Or she'll say, well, you know, I'm just, I really care about you. And I just, I, I think that we've been going out and I'm not seeing anybody else. Are you seeing anybody else? And that'll lead to, you being able to get into a relationship. So by not taking out on holidays and birthdays, you could actually get what you ultimately want, which is getting into a relationship because you're having a conversation about something that pissed her off because you're not in a relationship. So that's how you can play that card, all right? All right, 
Uh, real quick, guys. I, I, let me see if I got this on here. Uh, like I said, this this show is all about you guys. So if you have any questions you want me to answer, you can write them in the chat. Um, let's see if I got something here. I don't have it now. But also, note uh, for those of you guys that follow my regular stuff, I do have, have an album out now, courtesy of my puppet character Namwan. It's called "No Girls for You: The Ultimate Guide to Losing the Girl of Your Dreams," and that album is actually available for streaming. You can go to uh, Apple, Spotify, Google Play, and stream it. You can also get the album at the website, introvertdatingsuccess.com. If you get it at the website, not only do you get the ebook that goes with that, but you also get two additional songs that I couldn't put on streaming because they are parody songs. But yeah, check that out at the website. You can check out the first music video uh, for Tongue Tied at uh, my YouTube page. Just go to my Harry Wilmington page and type in Tongue Tied uh, non wan It'll pop right up. All right. So... Let's see. On to another question. This guy says uh, he asked a question about uh, basically if you're feeling something in your gut about a woman, should you follow that feeling? So he says, hey, Harry, what do you think about gut feelings you get while hanging out with a woman? Can you do a video on that and any experiences that you've had? And so I asked him, I asked him to clarify. I said, what do you mean by like gut feeling? And he said, uh, as in something feels off, not getting the full story. Do you believe there's truth when you have that quick thought that runs through your head while out with someone and should you listen to it? So I have a couple of uh, feelings about this one, right? So here's the first feeling, right? Is that I do believe genuinely that if you are an observant guy and if you're not just, if you're not just blinded by her physicality and trying to hook up with her, then you'll be able to realistically observe her throughout the course of the first few dates and see, you know, how she's talking about her family, about her past experiences dating, uh, how she's talking about men in general, how she's treating other people. Like you can get a good read off that stuff. And then based on that, you can say, you know what, I'm seeing something here that doesn't quite click with me, whether it's certain subjects we talk about, maybe we're not the same politically, religiously, or maybe I didn't like the way she talked about some of her exes, or I should talk about men. And so I'm getting the feeling that this person might be this certain way. I don't want to deal with that. So I'm out. So I think you can actually have really good instincts about the kind of woman that you're currently dating and whether or not that's going to work long term. That said, there's the other side that I believe, which is that I think as men, when we're first starting out dating, we experience our own share of incidents that leave a bad taste in our mouth, whether it's a girl that cheats on us, a girl that lies to us. Uh, we asked the woman out that we really thought we had a shot with, and then she just straight up ghosted us or women that gaslit us or whatever. And so if you've had a lot of bad experiences in the beginning, or if you've got a lot of rejections in the beginning, then what you can find is that when you go into dating situations, your lens of the world is rejection, your lens of the world is this is too good to be true. Your lens of the world is there must be something else going on because this person is too good to be true. And you have to be mindful that if that's going on, then you could be, quote unquote, feeling things in your gut that are really just your brain trying to protect you from future rejections. All right. And so this is why it's good if you start, if, like I said, with the, with the guy earlier where he was, you know, the guy in the wheelchair, he asked the woman out and she said yes. And he was like, wait a minute, would she be the kind to say yes, but actually not want to do it? That comes from having previous bad experiences where women rejected him and he got constant no's. So now he's in a situation where his gut is telling him that her yes to the date can't actually mean yes and that she can't actually really like him, all right? And so you gotta recognize that too, that if you have previous incidents, incidents that weren't to your liking or that didn't really you know, help you in your development of dating in a positive way, that those negative experiences could be affecting what your gut feeling is when you're going out, all right? So that's why it's always good to be analyzing yourself, to doing the work, to be asking friends of yours, hey, am I tripping about this situation or that situation? And really work on getting a good head on your shoulders and getting a positive mindset about yourself to where you'll recognize that you're a great catch and that more often than not, when you're going out there with these women, that they probably don't mean you any harm and that your gut feeling is going to be more on the side of this is meant to be a positive experience and you'll be able to really tell the difference between the negative girls out there and the ones that are positive. If you need help with that, again, I offer one-on-one -on -one phone consultating. I'm also going to be uh, setting up where you guys can like uh, 
sign up for like email coaching as well. Cause I get a lot of, I got a lot of emails as of late of guys that want to be coached, but then I do a video and I put it out and they're like, Hey, thanks for the video, but I don't want that to be public. So I'm going to set it up where you guys can actually like order email coaching from me where I can make a, a detailed response to your specific uh, situation and or a video response. Uh, if that's something that you want as well. Okay. But yeah, so check that out at the website. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another question here. So I'll, I'll say that one for late, for a longer show. Okay. So this guy says he is against dating apps. Okay. So this guy commented, he says, I love your content, but I'm highly against dating apps. It just feels like you have to sell and brag about yourself, which is not something you should ever have to do in real life. Well, the reality is we sell and promote ourselves in real life all the time, especially in today's age with social media. But even beyond that, if you're going to a family member and you want to ask for a favor, what are you doing? You're trying to sell yourself in a way that gets them to do the thing you want them to do. If you're going after a job, you put together what? A resume. I'm here in Hollywood where I do video stuff. If I want to uh, get video work from other people, I got to do what? put it together, something that's flashy and shows that I can do this work so that way they want to buy into what I'm trying to sell them. So whether you're doing dating apps or just walking up to women in public, you're going to have to sell yourself. If you walk into, if you're like, I don't want to do dating apps. I want to just meet people in person. Well, fine. What are you going to do in person? You have to dress a certain way. You have to smell a certain way. You have to talk to them a certain way. You have to know how the, the, uh, the, transitional operation goes to be able to go from just walking up to her to asking for the number to then getting the date. All this is, is selling yourself. So you ain't got to be on a dating app to sell yourself. You're going to have to sell yourself in order to get women because they need to buy into feeling trusted, uh, trustworthy around you and being able to buy into like your lifestyle and buy into the kind of guy you're presenting yourself to be. And you're going to present yourself to these women, whether you're doing it on a dating app or in person. But anyway, continuing on, he says, uh, Things he doesn't like about the dating apps, uh, take a perfect photo here. Be some amazing person that travels the world and has a million hobbies. No, it's a lot of pressure of this false idea of trying to brag yourself up against all these other men on dating apps. And again, I stress, if you're not going against men on dating apps, you're going up against men in the real world. One way or another, you're going to be competing for this woman with other men. There are ways, however, that you can make yourself stand out in a way that's going to be authentic to women, whether it's in per person or whether it's on these dating apps. But the point is, you're getting rid of an avenue of meeting women that is actually plentiful. I, I've done plenty of online dating over the years and have been, been in several relationships with women from dating apps. So there are perfectly good women that you can find on dating apps, just like there are jerk women you can find on dating apps as well as in the real world, all right? But you can't say, well, it's dating apps, it's just it's a sham, blah, 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 because I, I just recently talk, talked about a friend of mine that I convinced to get on dating apps, and now they're married to a person they met on the dating app, all right? So that can be an avenue, but it is boiled down to it. dating, dating apps are ultimately a skill set, all right? And I think sometimes guys get bothered because they don't understand the skill that goes into dating apps. And the great thing is it doesn't take a whole lot of skill. It takes knowing how to take a good picture. What kind of clothes to wear in these pictures? What kind of things to talk about in your bio? Because so many guys will say like, I hate dating because I can't, I hate dating apps because the dating apps, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, let me look at your bio. And it's stuff like, hey, I'm looking for a girl that won't cheat on me. I'm a really good guy. I swear you're saying nothing in your dating profile that's going to turn women on or make them want to converse with you, let alone Conversations that guys have in apps is like, hi, hey, how you doing? What's up? You look cute. How is that a conversation starter? What are you bringing to the table that's going to make a woman want to jump onto your conversation? Again, these are skills that most guys don't want to learn, but they're easy to learn. If you join the Introvert Dating Success uh, Membership Academy, you can read, uh, you can watch the whole video thing of um, the smart digital dating program that I have that walks you through the kind of pictures to set up, how to talk to women on dating apps, how to get them off the dating apps. And it's like six videos. It's not hard to learn, but you have to be willing to put the work in because whether you put work into the dating apps or put work into approach women in person, you're going to have to put some work in to get better at this thing. All right. Continuing, he says, with um, without consistent matches, your self-esteem and confidence will lower. Well, that is true. Um, and that goes back to again, but if you're not learning the skill set, or uh, if you're not getting consistent matches, it could be because you don't have the right pictures. You don't know how to, if you get a match, you're not able to keep it because you don't know how to talk to women. Again, 
These are all skills. And I say this, I say I keep pressing the skills thing because so many men think like, oh, I should, if I can't just naturally do it or if I'm not a naturally this guy X, Y, and Z. But everything you learn in life, everything you know how to do up to this point is based on you have some training in it. If you're going to dating apps blindfolded and just trying to throw yourself on there without knowing the skills that it takes to really succeed, then yeah, you're going to be like most of the guys that fail on there because they also do not have the skill set. I did great on dating apps because I learned the skill set. I put it to the test. I learned some things. I learned some through trial and error what worked and what didn't. And then I was able to be successful and get women off of dating apps. And also news to you guys, it doesn't take a lot of conversation. I've literally had like two or three, uh, like gone two or three messages in where I'm on a date. And, you know, I think I look pretty decent, but like back when I was studying success, I didn't have that much confidence. I just knew I got to practice and try something different. If the stuff that I'm doing up to this point isn't working, then I got to practice doing this thing that's uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable and until I'm able to get success. And so it took me quite a few years to get good at my dating. You can curtail all those years by going to the Introvert Dating Success Membership Academy and watching through the Smart Digital Dating Program, okay? But anyway, um, so he says, I really love your content, Harry. It's so great. I'd expect you to tell men to get off the screens and go outside. As you say in all your videos, do not build rapport through a screen or text, but that is what you're forced to do on online dating and it doesn't work. The women don't feel anything and have no desire to meet up. Well, again, that is um, that is a lack of abundance. That is that is a very negative mindset to have because again, I'm, I'm proof that that women, in fact, do desire to meet up. But the problem, because I've, I've done this whole thing where like I posed as a woman on an online dating site. And again, that's why I'm going to tell you guys, like I did, I did it one year where I, I posed at this really hot, attractive girl. And within the first day, I had 169 matches. And of those 169 matches, I think like 70 people messaged me. And like I'd say 80% of the messages are, hey, hi, what's up? How you doing? I could see why a girl would be like, oh, I'm going to unmatch this guy because Women already don't match with a lot of guys. So when they do, they're thinking, oh, I'm matching this guy. And because he seemed pretty lively and jovial. And then to go from that to like, hi, what's up? What does that now do to her impression of you? It goes from this guy might be exciting to like, nope, just like the other guys. And he's out. But these women are on dating apps because this is, they, they want to get dates and they're finding a hard time dating in the real world. And they're thinking, you know what? Maybe online, I'm a, I'm a busy girl out there. I don't always have time to go to bars and clubs. Maybe I can meet a nice guy online if I, if I just get on there and just, you know, try this thing. And then guys get on there and 69 guys match and uh, 50 of those guys are sending, hey, hi, what's up? Another three or four of them are sending like, you know, rude, crude stuff. And it's like, that's all overwhelming to women. But they do get on there because they want to meet. Because again, I've been on plenty of first dates with women from online dating where I'm like, how did I manage to get a date with you? And they're like, well, I matched these other guys, but they all sucked. Or they didn't, they, their conversation was boring. Or their profiles were whack. And you were the first guy that came along and had an interesting conversation and cool stuff to say. So yeah, guy, it's a skill set. Learn the skill set and you can have success. Now, for you guys that are going to say, but I look a certain way or I don't have it all together and that's going to be a hindrance online. I'm telling you, I've been a broke dude who didn't have the best clothes in the world and still managed to get dates. That doesn't, that's not to say that there, there aren't going to be some of you that, that don't struggle. But again, if you're going to, if you're going to struggle, if you want to just struggle and complain about the fact that you can't get women anywhere, you can do that. It doesn't help you get women. So you can complain. I can't get dates on dating apps. How does that help you get women? I can't approach women because they all think I'm such and such. How does that help you get women? You have two choices. Either you can complain about it or you can crap and get off the pot. Learn the skills you need to learn and get it. Because there are plenty of guys in wheelchairs with one leg that have, you know, had their face burned up that still manage to get women. The only thing that's holding you back is your excuses. If you don't want to be single, then learn the skills you need to learn to not have that happen. I have a whole website. You can obviously pay a monthly fee for that. I have one-on-one -on -one coaching, but I also have like tons of free videos and podcasts that you can look at to get the information you need to eventually become great with women. Okay. So if you're not, that's on you, not these women. Continuing on, uh, let's see. Um, let me just let's see what this guy said. Oh, this guy. All right. So, so this guy is, is an introvert, and he has a question about this married woman that he's trying to see. Yes, that's what I said. He says, hi, I'm having this mental disturbance. This married introvert woman, at the beginning, we were texting and calls. She used to tell me that she likes me and my company on going out for movies or walking, we hold our hands. She had this likeness for me. 
But for the past month, calls became low. Uh, late, she late responds to my texts. Sometimes looks at them, but no reply. Sometimes only one word or smiles. And my response is, I can't help you. Why are you dating a married woman? Like, we'll say for argument's sake, if she was married, but she's going through a divorce and she's currently separated, I don't think that's any better. I, I think that ultimately they need to be fully divorced before you try to jump into anything. But the separation thing would be a lot better than I'm talking to a married woman, which from my understanding, she's probably still married and still with her husband or whatever, which is already bad because if she's willing to cheat on him, she's definitely willing to cheat on you. But to the point, you shouldn't be approaching married women. Like there are plenty of single women out there that are ready to date. So you can't find one, go into spaces where they exist and work on your skills there. I'd say don't deal with this woman. Very simple. All right, before I get into this, uh, before I get into this next question over here, I got another question in the chat. And the question goes, if a woman is in bad financial shape, lots of consumer debt, with no career or, or in-demand skills, is that a red flag? As a guy, the honest answer is, it depends on what you want her for. If you are a guy that is a high value guy, or you're not even high value, you're a guy that's like, I want to be the head of my household. I want to be able to be the one that takes care of all the bills. And I want my wife to just stay home and be able to take care of home. And then when we have kids take care of the kids, then most of this stuff's not going to matter. Like her having bad financial situation, it's not going to be the worst thing of uh, her having lots of consumer debt. That could affect you because if she has no career, no job, she's not currently paying off her uh, consumer debt, which means that's going to fall on you. So in that capacity, that could be a serious issue. Okay. But I find that, like I said, if you're overall the guy that wants to just take care of home and have wifey at home taking care of kids, then most of this stuff's not going to be too bad because with consumer debt, you can get a monthly payment, of, like get it, put it all on one credit card, have a monthly payment of like a hundred bucks, and then it'll start paying its way off, but it won't be too much of a dent. But if you're looking for a woman that's going to be, you know, 50 50 in you with the, the bills and the household and take care of the kids and paying for stuff and things like that, then yeah, her not having a job her not having any kind of in-demand skills, having no ambition to be an entrepreneur, having no kind of way that she's going to contribute to bringing money in, then yeah, that's going to be a red flag. So it really depends on what you're looking for. If you're a guy that wants to take care of everything, it's not going to be a major red flag. If you're a guy that wants her to help out, it's going to be a major flag. And then lastly, of course, if you're a guy that really budgets his money and you get with somebody that likes to spend a lot of money and has a bad uh, financial uh, literacy, then that's going to also be a problem because you don't want to be a guy that's frugal trying to marry a woman that wants to spend all this money. That's not hers. Those are the questions you have to ask yourself before you say yes to dating this kind of woman. All right. Let's see. Let's see what this question is. Here's Okay. So uh, I'll read through this question and hopefully be able to help this guy out. So here's this guy's question. He says, I met this girl in a city where I went to visit my brother. I liked her on first sight, but held back. Big mistake. You always, you always want to make a move of some kind. If you have any kind of inkling of feeling, you should be asking for a number. You should be trying to take her out. Now, granted, you guys live in different cities, and I feel some kind of way about long-distance relationships that don't have an end goal in mind of eventually being together in the same city. Uh, but we'll continue on for now. He says, after some time, she got my number from my brother, and we started exchanging, I guess, messages but nothing really serious, but normal conversations. I went back to my city and we continued texting and she told me she likes me first and I just followed the flow. So what that means is he probably said to her, I like you back as well. The problem is there's been no dates. There's been no really getting to know each other time in terms of like in-person stuff. And so this is why I tell you guys, it's not the best idea to be verbalizing how you feel about a woman early on in the dating process. They need two to three months to solidify their feelings. If you're espousing feelings during that time, it's going to come across as too intense for her and she could potentially start to back off. So let's see what happened to this guy. He says, I went back to my city and we continued texting. Okay, uh, we flirted for about two months, but haven't met yet due to the fact that I postponed most of our meetings. For some days now, she's been distant. And for like the last, for like the first four days, I tried to know what was really wrong, but she said nothing and just the fact that she's really busy. That, so anytime a woman says, oh, I'm just busy, 
that's always a problem because that's that's already the talk starting of like I'm trying to slowly like get away from this guy or I'm starting to lose interest. Okay, but let's backtrack a bit. Okay, so the reason you guys didn't meet up is because you postponed the meetings. What is a woman supposed to read into that when you're setting up either you're setting up dates and they're not happening or she's saying, hey, I want to see you. And then you're saying, oh, let's wait. Oh, let's wait. Oh, let's wait. Like as much as I talk to you guys about when a woman likes you, she helps you out by saying yes to dates. You need to be helping her too. If she's saying, I want to see you and you're saying, no, nah, let's just delay and wait a little bit. How's that going to make her feel? She's going to start to feel that you're not really interested and she's going to start to lose interest because it's very important early on to be able to see each other on a consistent basis. If you're going back and forth to your brother's city, you should be trying to see her every time you go to the city. If that's not happening, yeah, she's going to start to feel some kind of way about that. Like maybe you're not that interested or maybe you're, you know, seeing other girls while you're at home, which is fine, except she may be thinking that you're more far along with those girls than you are with her that then you're letting her know about or that you already have a girlfriend, but that you're not letting her know about that, which can cause her to be suspicious. All right. So he says, after the four days of really trying to know, I decided to also act distant. We exchanged very short messages every uh, after two days or so. We just on a flirting, just, people, please work on your English better. We just on a flirting. So what could be the issue for this? Me distant to, is it okay? Or what should I do? So like I said, long distance relationships typically tend not to work out because as much as you guys want to flirt with each other and do things with each other, the reality is if you're not being able to see each other on a consistent basis and be able to touch and feel each other, then that's going to start to cause interest to wane relatively quickly. But to the point, you are postponing meetings. No bueno. If she's suggesting meetings, that seems she wants to see you. If you're saying no every single time she suggests it, that's going to be bad for how she feels about you. So I'd say at this point, at, if, if you guys are still exchanging and texting each other, try to set up a meetup. Either you're going to her city or she's coming to where you're at or there's a meet in the middle. But ultimately, guy, it's, it's really hard to make long distance work if there's not an end game. And right now, this is too early on for her to be like, hey, if this works out, I'll move to your city. And if you're not thinking you want to move back to your brother's city for her, then this thing might already kind of be dead in the water. And I'd say keep talking to other women in your area, but try to set up a meeting for her. For, so when you go to see your brother, you can also meet up with her and hopefully have a good time. Hopefully guy that helps you out. Let's see. Okay. I have a short, this is a short question, but I, I really want to answer this with an in-depth answer. So this guy asked the question. He says, uh, isn't the answer of every relationship problem is that she met someone she considers better than you. And this is, a, he left this comment under a video of mine where I talked about why it is that women will sometimes uh, do the pull away test. And so this is a very common question guys get, which is like, this woman left me, uh, we were talking and having a good time together. And then she suddenly just up and left. It must be because some other guys in the picture. Now, let me clarify. That does sometimes happen where a woman, maybe she was on dating apps, maybe just, you know, you guys were in different cities and she just, she was dating other guys beside you at the time to try to see who she wanted to date long-term and you just weren't it. That can't happen. But the honest truth is that most guys are just horrible at dating. Most guys, they are able to maybe attract a girl enough to get her on a date or to get her phone number. But then what happens? Over texting, showing needy behavior, talking about feelings, trying to get her into a relationship too soon, uh, going on dates and just talking about themselves, trying to talk to her too much uh, in terms of like seeing her, like trying to ask her on a date today, tomorrow, the next day, et cetera, et cetera. And so men just overall, for the most part, don't really know how to make a woman feel comfortable in the dating process. And when women start to feel uncomfortable, they will start to pull away even if there's no other guy in the picture. Because a woman would rather be single and comfortable than being around a guy that's making her feel uncomfortable. Understand, being uncomfortable for women is akin to feeling danger. You got to think back to like the hunter and gatherer days, like a woman is being protected by a guy. And if she feels uh, uncomfortable, that is not a threat to her and her uh, livelihood. So when you cause, when you do things that cause a woman to feel uncomfortable, it's going to cause her to want to pull away and back out because she's like, this uncomfortable feeling, I don't know where this is going to lead to, but I don't like it. So I'm out of here. And she doesn't need another guy in the picture to feel uncomfortable. This is why I have all these materials so that way you can learn how to show up as a confident guy and also show up as a guy that's not going to be needy and desperate and feel the need to text her and call her all the time because those kind of guys 
cause women to feel uncomfortable and cause them to back away. And like I said, she doesn't need another guy to be in the picture for that to happen. Does that happen sometimes? Yes. But the overall uh, overall amount of times I find is that women, men just don't know how to be around women and they make them uncomfortable. So sad to say that's true, guys, but that's why you need to get your game up, be more confident, and learn what to do to keep women around you feeling comfortable. Oh, continuing. Let's see. Oh, I have a great question here, but I'm actually going to save it for another video because I want to do a full in-depth video on this. Um, and it's not an urgent question, but it's one that's it, we're going to make for a really, really good show. So I'll save this question for later. Uh, see, I did that one about abundance mindset. I did that, I did that show already. And uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, this guy. This might just end up being a short that I put together. So uh, I did a I did a video about 15 things that women bring to the table. This guy responded, bro, your list is crap. There's no such thing as a good woman. All they bring to the table is raising your kids, giving you meow and lots of headaches. That's it. So here's my thing. You have options. Either you're going to be gay or go your own way because you can't, you can't complain about women and get women. Okay. And I get so tired of guys being like, women are no good, blah, blah, blah. You can't say women are no good and then be out there getting women. It's counterproductive. Your brain's going to either say, I hate women and I'm out or boy, I kind of like women and I want to get with them. When you're saying, I hate women, but I want to get with them, your brain doesn't know where to go. And the result's going to be, you're going to fail at relationships. All right. So again, if you're not trying to be gay or go your own way, figure out what to do to get women to keep women, because there are a lot of great women out there, but you're not going to be able to keep them if you're having an attitude like this. All right. Continuing on. Um, oh, oh God. I have some great things people ask. I want to do full shows on. Uh, and I'm going to start to lose my voice a little bit. So um, I might do a part two to this live at some point, but I think this is good for now, guys. So hopefully I was able to answer you guys' questions during this live. If you guys, as always, if you guys have any questions you want to have answered on one of these shows or in just a regular video, you can write to me at harrywilmington at gmail.com. Like I said, uh, for those of you that have, okay, I'll put it like this. If you have a question you want answered on one of these shows, Write to me at harrywilmington at gmail.com and I'll be sure to eventually get to that message and answer it on one of these shows. If you have a question that you don't want answered on one of these shows, but you have an urgent question, then I'm going to set it up where you guys can sign up for email coaching. It's going to probably be like some minimal fee, but it'll allow me to like answer your question in an email form, possibly in a video form that won't go out to the general public. Because I had a guy that I did a video for I uh, answered a question of his and he liked the answer, but because his, his woman also watches my show, he didn't want me to like keep the video up. And I spent a lot of time and effort putting these videos together and I'm not trying to take them down. So if you want me to answer your question, I'll have a uh, way for you to be able to pay for that in a way where I can answer your question via email in a faster time frame. In addition to that, I do one-on-one -on -one phone consultations. Also, all that you can find at introvertdatingsuccess.com, right? You can also go there to sign up for the introvert uh, Dating Success Membership Academy. And of course, guys, my puppet character, Non Juan, actually put together an album of songs uh, called No Girls For You, The Ultimate Guide to Losing the Girl of Your Dreams. It is a 10-song album that is chock full of hilarious, hilarious uh, songs that are all about the ins and outs of this guy trying to date. You know what? Screw it. It's the end of the podcast. Uh, I'm going to actually play the video from that uh, one of the videos off the album. Uh, this is a video that we put together called Tongue Tied. It features Don Magic Juan and some a bevy of beautiful ladies. And of course, Non Juan trying to hit on girls at a club. Let's check it out. Hey, Non Juan, why are you putting your head down? Come on now, why are you acting like that? I mean, what did you under cardiacal arrest or something? What's gonna happen? I only asked you to ask the girl for money. Hey, wait, get up, get up! What are you falling? Oh, don't do that. Here we are again, Juan. Another night in the club. So many single girls around here. Only a 
it, girl. Just another human person, so there's no reason at all for you to get nervous. Ahem. Hello, I'm Nan Juan. And what's my name? Wait, I mean, what's your name? <laughs> Just a little joke. Why would I ask for my name? I mean, I already know that. And unless you have my name, it would be kind of weird, like I'm asking a dude out. Not that it appears that you're a guy. I mean, sure, you have a little hair right under your nostrils on your face right there. Not that your nostrils would be anywhere else. I mean, if they were, he'd probably need surgical help. But anyway, hey, don't run away. I'm sorry. That's not what I was trying to say. When I see a hot girl, my tongue gets swirled. I don't know what I'll say. And the next thing I know, my chance with her is blown. Well, my mouth gets carried away. I'm tongue tied, tongue tied, tongue tied, tongue tied. I get tongue tied, tongue tied, tongue tied, tongue tied, tongue tied. Okay, let's try it again. Oh my gosh, there's a girl coming my way and she looks like a ten. My palms are getting sweaty again. Don't panic, Don Juan. Just show that you got it going on. Excuse me, hi. It's nice to meet me. I mean you. It's nice to meet you. I think you look hot in the way that you strut. You look like Halle Berry, but with a smaller butt. Wait, I didn't mean, what I mean was, your butt's not small, it's big. I mean, not that big, not like that big. I'm just saying it's a nice size. Not that I'm just staring at your butt. Your thighs are also nice. I can't see them, but I'm sure they're there, right underneath your underwear. Not that I know if you have any underwear on, but I, wait, oh, another one's gone. When I see a hot girl, my tongue gets swirled. I don't know what. This is a terrible disappointment here. I mean, I I use some real qual hey, I use some quality hours with you. I mean, I explained it to you. I gave you parable. I drew you diagram. I even ran. Hey, we did a rehearsal. How how could you be that disappointing? What is it even like to be tongue tied by a woman? Yeah. So that's a. Uh... That's off of the album called No Girls For You, The Ultimate Guide to Losing the Girl of Your Dreams. It's a soundtrack to my ebook that I put out a couple of years ago. And that ebook is all about why all the things you're trying to do to get women right now causes you to lose them. So when you get the, you can stream this for free on like, you know, Spotify, Apple, yada, yada, yada. If you get it at the website and get, I think it's like 20 bucks, something like that. You'll get not only the album, you'll get uh, the ebook, No Girls For You with it, which is 156 pages of the ins and outs of what not to do when dating, as well as two extra songs that I couldn't put on the streaming services that are also pretty hilarious. I have a couple more videos that'll be coming out for the album as well. So for those of you that like funny music, check it out. Like I said, I just, it's on my recorder because I just like, I, I've, I've done music stuff for quite a while amongst many other things that I've done. And uh, I thought this was just a fun project to put together. But anyway, that's all we got for today, guys. Thank you for checking in with this show. Uh, be sure to give it a like and give it a subscribe. And I will catch you guys on the next one. I'm out. Peace. Okay, IDS Mob. Today, we have a special guest joining us. Uh, her name is Lauren Smith. And she is a renowned professional speaker and author of the Mindful Dating Journal, Find a Healthy Love That Lasts. 
as well as the creator of the Metadata app, which is a tool designed to help people be more mindful daters. Uh, in fact, this whole show today, we're talking about how to be a more mindful dater, um, the concept of mindful dating and how it can be used to help individuals navigate the dating landscape with intention and self-awareness. Lauren, welcome to the show. Hey, Harry. Thank you so much for having me. There was a there was a guy that wrote me a couple of weeks back and he was asking about uh, how to be more emotionally intelligent when dating. And then your request came in and it was just like almost like kismet. Like there are so many guys out there and just people in general that don't know about mindful dating and what that entails and emotional intelligence. So I want to talk about all that stuff today. But I want to start out with uh, the question I ask everybody, which is, um, what is your dating journey like and what led you to start focusing on mindful dating? Sure. Well, uh, very recently, I sort of changed the way that I describe my journey to mindfulness. I used to say that I got dumped at Disney World. And I've revised it to recently say that temporarily loving one human, even though it was short lived, changed my life in the best way possible. I'll tell you the story though, cause it is very interesting, especially like when you think about Disney World, you think, oh, it's happy, it's magic. And that was actually where a really crazy, unexpected breakdown of my relationship occurred. My partner at the time, his name is Marco. I met him when I was traveling in Buenos Aires. He's Argentinian. Picture tall, dark, handsome, the sexiest accent. And I just threw all of my own personal dating rules out the window because I thought, wow, this, this is it. This is the Prince Charming I have been waiting for. And it feels so good. Why even bother thinking about red flags? I was only with Marco in Argentina for a few days before I had to come back to my home in the States. I'm from New Jersey. As the flight was landing, I was thinking about how Marco and I had made plans to get back together. We were going to reunite in a new country, Uruguay, and we had already decided that we were just going to keep traveling, like go to different countries, live our best lives. And it all sounded like such a beautiful fantasy, like everything that I had ever wanted in dating was finally coming true. As that plane landed on the runway, I did what everybody else does, took out my phone, looked right away for any messages from Marco. He had sent me an email. It was titled minus 30. Marco was counting down 30 days left until we were going to meet up together again in Uruguay. I opened it and it was the sweetest love poem, like super cheesy, but like so cute. It felt like an ode to love to me. Like I was just perfect in his eyes. You know, yeah. I wrote him an email back and we did that minus 29 minus one until we finally met up together. We spent that 30 days crafting the world's cheesiest romance novel. So I learned firsthand all the things that are great about a relationship, but I also learned how easy it is to mindlessly follow joy instead of remembering to be grounded and think about things like values, red flags. You got to look for them. <laughs> we'll talk yeah, about yeah. why they're probably there. So eventually I'm going to fast forward a lot because you already know that everything starts to break apart by the time he and I get to Disney World. Okay. At that time, my parents had come to join us. Well, my mom and my sister came to join Marco and I at the park. We went to Epcot. We drank at every country except for Marco. He's not a drinker. He, in my opinion, was pretty grumpy at that point. He and I had been on rocky ground. We were at that stage of conflict where like, you don't even waste energy to talk about things anymore. You just kind of avoid mm -hmm. the conflict ent entirely. So by the time my mom and my sister got there, I was like, oh, thank God, something else to, to do, to talk to instead of Marco right. and this tension that was building. It got to the point where I could tell by, by the time we were eating lunch in Morocco that Marco wasn't having a great time. So I was like, you know what? Why don't you go take one of the ferries back to the hotel and me and my mom and my sister will catch you later. No big deal. You know, 
And he did. A few hours later, he ended up going back. My mom and I, we continued our journey around the world, getting a drink in every country, watched the fireworks, and eventually, after the park closed, we went back to the hotel, too. My mom and my sister were staying in a room down the hall. So they went their way. I headed to mine in Marco's room. And I opened the door, and it was, like, really clean in the room. I thought, oh, Marco, I guess, must have been bored and cleaned up. Maybe this is his white flag. Maybe he's kind of offering a resolution here. But upon further inspection, I realized it wasn't that he had cleaned up. It's that he packed up all of his stuff and left. There was no sign of him except for one love note that I had written to him. He was using it as a bookmark. He took it out of his book and left it on the nightstand for me. And I picked that up and just started crying hysterically. I couldn't be in the room anymore. I ran down the hall, burst open the door to my mom and my sister's room. And I was just like, what is wrong with me? Why does this keep happening to me? Because it wasn't the first time I felt like things just ended out of nowhere, despite how hard I had tried to make it work despite the sacrifices that I thought I made to keep the other person happy. But in that moment, thankfully, I had a solid buzz from being at Disney World. <laughs> and I had the love yeah. and kind support of my family. And they made me realize that it's not that there's anything wrong with me or you guys listening. It's just that I lack some key skills that if I would have known them sooner, I would have been able to see the ways in which our relationship was growing in an unhealthy direction. Hmm. But I just kept following the path that was easy, the one that felt historically safe to me. But that doesn't mean that those default decisions are actually getting me the healthy relationship that I want. So I ended up digging into mindfulness, saying, well, what is it that I have to pay attention to now? How can hmm. I be fully present for all levels of my experience, not just the ones that feel good now? And that's when I realized that if I'm going to go out to date again, I have to bring all these skills with me. Otherwise, hmm. I'm just going to keep finding myself in that same painful pattern where people that I love feels like they abandon me. But it's really not that wasn't the case. It was just yeah. that. Because I lack the skills, I was almost abandoning my own needs in a way. So now, as you, I had as to you figure were doing, out what they were. <laughs> well, as you were doing the journey towards being more mindful, what are things looking back that you realized you were not paying attention to in that relationship that you missed or were just purposely ignoring? Sure. When I first met Marco, he was telling me how he was going through, quote, a career transition. He was leaving a job that wasn't fulfilling and going to find a new career. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Someone that really wants to pursue their passions, um, you know, no matter what, like joy is more important than money. And keep in mind that my American dollar has so much more value than Argentinian pesos. So mm -hmm. I was like, it's okay, Marco, while you're doing your job search, I'll take care of us. Like in my mind, he was the one for me. He even signed all of those minus emails to me with the one. That's how far gone we were just in those first 30 days. So at this point, I was like, we're going to be together forever. I'll just, you know, I'll take care of us. I'll buy the flights. I'll pay for the Airbnbs. I'll get you haircuts. That is, although it sounds nice, that's actually one of my toxic traits. <laughs> oh, like people, people pleaser? Yes, the people pleaser, I swoop in and I over help. And it's not even that they necessarily ask me. I just think, oh, you need this. I'm going to just give it to you without you even telling me that you need it. And that builds resentment because he felt so much pressure to like have to work and to find the job. And then it was like, I felt like because I was giving him all that, that I was required something in exchange. And I started mm. to get really bossy and really controlling and being like, why are you playing video games? You should be applying for jobs. You know, like, that's not my life. That's not my place to say that. So it created a lot of um, mistrust and a big divide in our relationship.
So hmm. those things that, that I just described, I call them yep. uh, toxic dating loops. It's basically a loop of pattern, uh, like a pattern of behavior that we get stuck in, not because we're, we're bad people or because we're bad at love, but because that's all we know from how we grew up. And learning that kept us safe. It served a function. Mm. But unless we can identify the loop to take a step back with that mindfulness that we can talk about, like, how do you do that later? But yeah, if yeah. we can't uh, like really take time to say, hey, there's something very specific that I'm doing here. And if I just figure out what it is, then I can stop doing it and I'll get a different <laughs> result. Now, it's interesting, as you were saying that, my thought was like, man, like, because this could be a very well a scenario where you say, you know, and he was doing all this stuff and it was really his fault and this and that. But you really went into how, like, you recognize the things you were doing were actually contributing to him not liking you. And I try to stress that on my end for guys, like, sometimes when women are pulling away, it's because you're doing stuff that you may be unaware of, but, like, you're, you're doing things that are causing a person that actually likes you to want to like get away from you. So how are you able to bypass the ego part that says, I want to blame everybody else. And then really internally look and say, but wait a minute, like I'm the common denominator. It must be something that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I think that that is built into mindfulness. So maybe we can take a step back and, and say, what even is mindfulness? People okay. use this word in common language so often, and it's, I don't think we're quite nailing it when we're like, oh, be mindful of the oncoming traffic. <laughs> it's not quite it. But then there's yeah. also people that think mindfulness is just for yogis or like people that meditate all day. Hmm. It's really, I'm going to say somewhere in the middle, it's you're noticing things, yes, and it is a practice, but it's more that it's the practice of noticing things in the present moment without judging it. You're not trying to say that it's bad, good, wrong. You're not trying to change it. Just saying, this is a person that I'm dating. They have X, Y, Z qualities. I have X, Y, Z qualities. When I look at the facts of this situation, is it going to lead me to what I want? But in order to do that, you have to learn to really get that ego out of the way and allow things to come up that might be painful to admit. I think that's what you're saying is like, sometimes mm -hmm. it's scary to look at the truth of ourselves or even the truth of someone that we were really excited about. It's, we don't want to admit that things might not work out with them after investing a certain amount of time or something. Yeah. Because we're coming at the situation mm -hmm. with that non-judgment piece, it helps us to let go of the fear of shame the fear of ourselves being bad or wrong. I mean, dating is tough. We're, it's a risk. We're putting ourselves out there to be per, you know, perceived by the other person. And we can take that personally. Oh, are they going to accept me? Am I good enough for them? Are they going to reject me? We're putting the power in the other person. But when we can be mindful, we say, oh, there's no right or wrong. We're all unique, valuable people in our own right. Is, is this person the kind of person that is going to benefit me and what I'm looking for and vice versa? And if not, that's okay. None of us are bad or wrong. Yeah. And I, I think that that's important too. the, the part we said about like, uh, you know, it's not necessarily right or wrong. I think a lot of people go into dating thinking like, um, well, it's, it's very easy to be me focused and, or to be like, these are the, these are the specific rules as I see them that dating needs to follow. So, you know, the example I give a lot of times is like, you know, people try to text all the time. Well, I feel as though in order to build a relationship, there needs to be communication. Therefore, I need to text her all the time and she needs to respond to me all the time because I'm going to feel some kind of way if that doesn't happen. And in the process of that, we, we don't start, we don't think about, but does the other person actually need that? We think this, doing this thing is going to fulfill my need and make me feel secure. But what about that other person? Mm -hmm. That's tough. I mean, ideally you're with someone who knows what their needs are too, and that you mm. can build a space where you both feel safe to share those needs. That was another problem that I had an unhelpful behavioral pattern that I found myself doing is if I needed something, I just expected the other person to know. Mm. I wouldn't say anything. I might be passive aggressive about it. 
but I, I personally didn't know what I needed. I never took the time to sit down and be with myself. So I couldn't communicate it. That scared the crap out of me. I could not have a conversation about my needs. I grew up thinking in a really sad way that my needs really weren't important. And that if I brought up my needs, it could cause conflict or disconnection. So I felt safer to push my needs down to keep the other person's needs met because at least mm. that meant that the, the connection that I had would remain, even if that connection wasn't healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting because I, 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 I like to think of myself as being emotionally intelligent and being somewhat mindful. I, I've definitely been with women who like, I'll very much be saying things like, hey, like, is this what you need or speak up? And they're trying to not tell me because they grew up in that same situation where it's like, you know, my needs don't matter. And I'm trying to say your needs do matter. So it's like mm -hmm. they need to be mindful that it's OK to do that. And I still have to be mindful that if that's not how they operate or that's not what they're used to, I have to be patient with them and also let them know it's OK. But it's I, yeah. I come across a lot of like women like that in general that just come from those situations where they were silenced or told your opinion doesn't matter. And it sucks because, you know, it's like that shapes your whole world and it shapes how you view things and how you think people are receiving you. And then you go into dating and you're thinking that people are thinking things about you that they're not because you're thinking them about yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah. You're really creating a safe space for them. Yeah. It's like when and that's the other beautiful thing about mindfulness, like when you can learn to experience things outside of you and internally without judgment, you just notice them and allow them, that almost gives permission for the other person to do the same. Even if they're not quite aware they're doing it, it just creates a little bit of safety because you're open. You're not in a reactionary place or a fight or flight place. Maybe, maybe you are, we all kind of are in our <laughs> modern day culture, but right, I think right, it, right. it really does help to create a, if you want to think about it in terms of like energy, just kind of brings the energy back to neutral. How does the mindful dating approach differ from what people who are less successful with dating tend to do? Well, I, well, yeah, I would question like what is successful dating is, is well, the just, successful. Yeah. I guess I'll say like, you know, a person that's able to date and have partners that feel like they, they're being listened to and that they're, you know, maybe two steps ahead in terms of thinking about what their needs are versus people that aren't doing that. And then mm -hmm. as a result, like maybe they're not being able to keep around partners as long or they're constantly in, in turmoil and tension with the partners that they have. Got it. Yeah. I think this goes back a little bit to what we were mentioning before about how we worry a lot about what other people think of us and it, our attention starts to go on the other person's experience. But when we can show up mindful and we're paying attention to our thoughts our body sensations, any emotions that are coming up, that helps us to stay on our side of the road. We worry about things that we can control. When we put our worth in the rejection or the acceptance of our date, that can be mm. devastating. And that can really, like at least for me, it tanks my week. If I get ghosted and I take it personally, mm. it, it really takes you out of a place of power too, because I, I used to feel like really desperate. You know, maybe somebody comes into my life and they're not really checking all my standards, but if I start feeling like they need to choose me or else that means I'm unlovable, then I start to really put up with things that aren't healthy. I might default into those patterns of behavior that were morally, more so just to control the situation so that I could feel safe. And mm. It really is almost like it is a fight or flight response. When we start to reach out for ways to feel safe in our own little bubble, it's almost like we're feeling like there's a threat, that that date almost becomes a threat to us. Like they need to choose me or else I'm not okay. safe. And when we're acting from fight or flight, um, that first of all, it's not a, a great way to start out a relationship. Does that mean you'll ever come out of fight or flight? Uh, but also it's not really a great place for us logically to be. We're probably mm. not making decisions that are going to be in our peaceful best interests in the future. Yeah. 
So mindfulness helps to really reconnect you with yourself and just stay in that centered place. It's tough. It's a practice because we're yeah. still going to default and things are still going to trigger us. But you can constantly come back and say, I am lovable. I'm okay. I'm just going to take this moment to get back in touch with what it is I'm looking for for myself and try not to worry so much about being good enough for someone else. Just reminding myself that I'm already good enough for me because I say so. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine that's also got to be a bit of a like putting so much pressure on yourself. It's like you inadvertently are so focused on, OK, what do I got to do? Who do I got to be? What I got to whatever. And you're not really thinking about, again, there's another person that's in this process and they're going to have their own things they're bringing to the table and how am I going to feel about what they bring to the table? And then, you know, this experience is for them too. So I'm trying to make it all about me, but like, what about the experience that they're having? Like, how can I make it to where I'm not focusing so much on myself, but also focusing on like just us both being here and enjoying the energy and space that we're in, in the moment, you know? And I think we get too much in our heads trying to worry so much that like, I used to have the same problem back in the day of like, this has to work. And I don't know if the, there's any other prospects. So I, I, this has to be the thing that works and I'm going to, do all the extras and it's like half the time they didn't need those extras and it just felt like more pressure I was putting on them, you know? Yeah. When we force things like that to me is a sign that I'm out of my connection when mm. there's like a craving and like, it feels like an urgency that it has to work. That's my sign that I'm triggered and I need to take a pause and say, okay, what feelings are coming up in my body? This is another big part of mindfulness is just mindfully, reconnecting with your physical body, with the sensations. And this goes hand in hand with emotional intelligence too. Did you know listeners that every emotion that you might feel also has a physical counterpart in the body? It's going to mm. show up differently for different people. But when I, before I discovered all of this, I really only ever felt one, maybe two emotions, anxiety or mm. rage. <laughs> And it, and it was kind of like cousins of each other, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they were intense and they were so overwhelming that I, the idea of meditating or like feeling my feelings, I was like, hell no, I'm not doing that. Are you crazy? That sounds painful to me. But luckily with the help of therapy and a lot of books and patients, I realized that there was so many more emotions there than just anxiety and intense anger. There was mm. shame, a lot of shame guilt, fear, uh, just plain being overwhelmed by stress. And I recognized these subtleties of the emotions because I learned my body sensations. They I'm curious to know, like for you, what were some of the things you noticed? Like if you're feeling X emotion, you notice this physical result. Sure. When I, for example, let's say I'm on a date and dating is naturally stressful. So we already have that against us. But I, of course, I'm an introvert as well. And I get really nervous socially uh, with anxiety. When I start to feel that anxiety coming up, what happens physically in my body is that I start to hunch over, my shoulders kind of come down, and my abdomen gets tight. It's almost like I'm subconsciously making a six pack, like out of like, like my body's like getting ready yeah. to for the kill, you know, like it's preparing itself for the fight and my muscles tense up. And what I do, what I've trained myself is to say, oh, wow, I can feel that sensation in my body. I'm anxious. And I just give myself a little mantra. You can say, I say, oh, I'm anxious. Let me exhale. I'm safe. So I'll just breathe in, let my shoulders come up, exhale, try to let that tension out and just remind myself that I'm safe which is, you know, it might, it most, it definitely, it does. 10 minutes later on the date, I start to feel my sh shoulders hunching over again, but then I just take another exhale. Um, yeah. Also, when I get angry, my hands clench up. I, I get, feel a lot of heat in my face. Sometimes mm. my jaw gets tight. When I'm feeling sad, typical sad, like imagine that you're going to illustrate a animated character and how okay. you would draw that character when you're feeling feelings that could help you like maybe draw this could be like an art therapy thing draw a picture of yourself sad and notice what 
your body looks like and see if that actually happens the next time you're sad, hunched over, your, your head's down, like you're ashamed to almost in a way have yeah. your head facing up. The whole point of all of this is to build body awareness so that you can learn the emotions language. Mm. Because sometimes it's, it's really overwhelming to feel the emotion, but when you can pay attention to the body, it almost gives you a little bit of detachment so that you're like, right. oh, I am not anxiety. I'm just feeling anxiety right now. And the body helps to confirm that it truly is just a feeling. It's temporary. Yeah. And you do have control over how you can move through that emotion or further push it away, which is probably just going to make it get worse. I know from personal experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, and I do wonder if like, because like the guys that watch my show, I do wonder if I, some of them I've actually been able to coach and talk to and see. And I'll notice just by looking at them, it's like, you know, or they'll still send me their online dating pictures. Like, oh, I'm not getting any matches. And I'll look at their pictures and it's like all their pictures, just the way their bodies are positioned. It's it's projecting out there like a lack of self-confidence or like not really thinking they can actually get the women they want. And it's like, I'm aware, I, I don't know if they're actually aware that that's a thing. Cause I don't think we're really taught to think about like, Hey, like when you're on these various dates, the pe person across from you is getting a read on you or a feeling about you that you are even aware you're putting out there. Cause you're not being mindful of like what your internal feelings and stuff are. You're just trying to go on this date. Like I'm going to wing it and do whatever and I'll be fine. And they can see that you're not confident and that you're anxious and that you've probably never been with a lot of people. Like they can tell that just based on how your body is moving on these dates. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, the connection between our emotions, behaviors, and thoughts are intrinsic. So if you change, if you learn how to manage your emotions a little with this emotional intelligence, it's going to just by default change the way you think and the way you act. There's many different mm. paths to change. Whatever one you can get your foot in the door, go start running. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. Your thoughts definitely. I was just thinking back to like uh, back in my not so great dating days when I was a horrible dater. And, and part of it is I had very, very low self-esteem, but I used to have like really bad sinuses and my nose would be stuffy like all the time. And then I started realizing like I'm constantly telling myself toxic thoughts about myself. I need to change that. And so I would say, OK, for every like one negative thing I say about myself, I got to say like seven positive things. And as I would do that, I would notice that my nose would stop being stuffy. Like I every time that. I started being nice to myself, my sinuses went away. And I was like, how is that a connection? But it was. I love that. And, and that's mindfulness right there. So you train yourself to listen for the negative thought. Yeah. Mindfulness is just like step one of a transformation process. If you don't know what to look for or when you're doing something that's not helping you, how can you make a new choice? And if you don't make new choices, you're just going to keep getting what you've always gotten. So if exactly. you're unhappy with your dating life, if you feel like you're not getting enough swipes or whatever the issue is, you have control to get a new outcome. It might not be the outcome that you want straight away. It's a refinement process. Yeah, but, it takes time. Mm -hmm, but it, all, it takes awareness too of like, okay, it's, a, it's all one big experiment. Do different things, get some data, see what feels good, see what doesn't work and move forward with that attitude. Mm -hmm. And dating suddenly becomes just an experience. It's not a threat. Dating is an opportunity to improve your entire life. Because if in my case, learning how to work on handling my anxiety, dealing with my emotions, working on that self-love aspect to, to be able to show up for dating at all has rippled into every other area of my life. I'm so much more mm. confident and calm. I used to have, um, I would give myself migraines out of the stress of a date. Wow. And I have, I don't want to jinx myself or anything, but I have the least amount of migraines today than I have had in my life, not just before a date, but before talks or podcasts, mm. things like that. It sounds like mindfulness really has an impact beyond just the the dating phase of things. Like it, it seems like it, it really trickles into like other aspects of your life as you become a more mindful person. Because like, how does that help with obviously like, you know, relationship stuff, but also like interpersonal relationships? Mm -hmm. I think it goes back to what you mentioned before, this idea of taking ownership of how you're showing up and how you're contributing 
to either mm. the health or the distress of any connection. When, you know, we're all, we're all not perfect, right? Humans are flawed and mm. we are really limited by the skills that we were taught to us or modeled for us. It's all comes down to awareness of like, what are our limits and what are our gifts? And when we show up to a relationship, just being clear about that, not in any, any way that's self-deprecating or um, even demanding of the other person that they need to change or anything. You're just like, hey, mindfully, without judgment, this is what I'm working with. I got some great bits and I got some parts that need improvement. How about you? Can we balance each other out here? Can we move forward with accepting both of both sides of us, the dark and the light? And right. can we enjoy life despite that uh, constant progress? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do wonder if there's like a fear because you mentioned about um, like, you know, we're, we're obviously imperfect. So in the course of dating, like, for example, I might go out there and I know, okay, the person I'm going to be dating, they're going to have their own flaws, but I'm going to be willing to take a look at them and accept them as they are. But I wonder if we worry so much about what our flaws are that we think we're therefore not going to be good enough. And that makes us more anxious and less apt to want to even go out there and try, you know? Mm -hmm, for sure. So this reminds me of another part of my story. After that breakup with Marco, and I realized, hey, there's something about the way that I'm showing up that I need to really dig into looking at myself and say, well, what, what am I doing and what am I not doing that I can change, that I have control over to make a different choice? So I had all that awareness. I went back out dating. I ended up going out with someone. And wouldn't you know that the awareness alone wasn't enough? The same really? type of breakup happened all over again. I missed the red flags all over again. And that's hmm. when I realized that we have been doing things the way that we always have for so long that our brain just does it automatically. And you yes. know, this is a big part of neuroplasticity of like this idea that like the brain does default to the easiest paths, but we can create new paths based on where we place our attention. So that's why I created a journal form that I would fill out. I literally, I made a spreadsheet for myself because I'm just like very organized like that. So yeah, I was yeah. like, okay, obviously, just because I looked at my trauma and I know what it is now, it's still not enough. I need to literally rewire my brain consistently and train myself to look out for these things that I know aren't going to get me what I want. Mm. So I made a list of questions. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is that one of those questions was, what insecurities are coming up? All those thoughts that say, oh, they're, they're, they have too much money for me, or I'm not mm. sexy enough for them. Their last partner, like, you know, had X, Y, Z. I don't have that. It's not going to work. Those are all our negative critic in, in our heads telling us to just give up. But what if we took time after a date to look at the things that that negative critic was saying with mindful mm. awareness and curiosity, instead of just kind of letting them always be there on autoplay in the back of our mind, right? what if we let them come front and center with kindness and compassion and say, oh, even though you're kind of mean, you're still me. And I want to like, listen to you, you know? And then you just like start debating them. You, you open it up and say, okay, you say I'm not good enough for them. What's the evidence here? Just mm. because so-and-so had a Porsche and I don't, what does that mean? What does that have anything to do with our long-term compatibility? Like you start to kind of challenge this critic with logic and you start to see, I don't actually have to believe this critic. And if you do that enough, suddenly the voice in your head starts getting lighter and lighter. It's almost like you're unplugging the microphone. It's still yeah. going. It's still talking, but it's not commanding the room anymore. <laughs> I, I try to stress that to guys that like when you're going through the process of, I guess, relearning how to date that like because people say, how do you get so confident? It's like the, the, the real secret is that it's not that I don't still have like apprehension or nervousness or anxiousness. It's just I learned to look at like all the other evidence out there that shows that I'm wrong to where it's like that becomes the louder noise than any momentary doubt I have. But in the beginning, it's like that doubt is what's going to like 
be the most loudest megaphone in your brain. And it's funny you mentioned your story because mine was the same way in terms of um, I was horrible at dating. And then I started studying up on like the ins and outs of like female attraction and like what women are looking for and what I was doing wrong. And like I had taken a semester off from school because I, I was doing a, a touring play, but I had, I had five months to just kind of basically study up and I wasn't doing this play. So I got back to school the next year, like, man, I know everything to do, blah, blah, blah. And then the next year I, I, I get connected with a, a friend of mine. I'd been friends with for like three years. She starts showing interest and I'm like, this is going great. And then those same old patterns I used to do popped up and ruined it. And I was just like devastated, but it's like, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just go off of book knowledge. I had to actually like regularly put in the work. And that's what started me doing this stuff was like, I wrote a book about all the things to not do. Cause I had to really sit down and analyze what are the things that I'm doing <laughs> consistently that are like messing these things up. And that's what helped. And that's what started this. But like, yeah, like you have to do that work. Like you can't just read stuff, listen to stuff and then be like, I got it. And then think you're good. It's like, it does take practice. And I, I think we're not in the habit of trying to give like an overnight, like say these three things or three, these three thoughts and then boom, you'll be fine. It's like, that's not really how this works. You have to put the work in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the more you uh, allow yourself to notice the pattern, um, the more you believe it. <laughs> yeah. our, that's what our brain does. Like that negative critic is, is really, it's got our back. It's trying to help us. It probably noticed sometimes in our past where, certain things happened and we got hurt. So it's always on the hunt for that next threat. And it's just warning us. It noticed patterns back then. We can notice patterns for it now. And I think that's why journaling after a date, like mm -hmm. every time you come home from a date, you might have a few different insecurities that you write down, but there might be the same one that keeps coming up. And then mm -hmm. you'd be like, Lauren, why do you consistently think you don't have enough money? Girl, you have tons of money. Like get over yourself. Like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like you, you almost like it, it becomes a laughable thing when you see, wow, I, this makes no sense when you, does it, am I making sense here? It's like the more yeah, it's like you, you see it's it like, come up, it when you start to see, you start to notice like, yeah, cause it's like, you'll start to, and, and a similar exercise that I used to do is, you know, I would think at one time, you know, people aren't going to like me for how I look or the way I am, or I'm too nerdy or I talk too fast, whatever. And I started looking at like, okay, but wait, there's guys out there that literally have your same build and look just like you that the girls you want are getting with. So it ain't that you don't have it because you do, but you're thinking that you don't, which is why they're winning and you're not. And it's like, you have to really start really basically like being your, your own, like, it's almost like you're on trial for yourself and you're both defense and prosecution and your prosecution team has to come in and say, this is all the evidence that shows that you were in fact wrong. And like, the, as you do that, you start to be like, oh, I, I need to shut the heck up. Cause I just, I'm just making all these, these complaints about myself. And most of them aren't actually true. Like, oops. Yes. You know, you nailed it. One of the other questions that I asked myself after a date was what do, what did I love about myself? And it's mm. the first, well, I think it's like the third question on the form that I have, because when you come home from a date, it's like, at least for me, I go into that state of, oh my gosh, when are they going to text me back? What if they ghost me again? And it becomes about them again. You know, I give them all the yep. power, but coming back to that place of self-love, like you're saying, like building up your confidence, reminding yourself that like, you know, I really want to celebrate the fact that I showed up authentic today. And even though I was anxious I did a really great job of trying to be present and not getting wrapped up in my anxious thoughts. Or I really love that um, I had the guts to be, wear something that was comfortable instead of wearing the the low cut boob shirt that I that I thought he would want me to wear. You know, like right, little right, things right. like that. And when you start out your journal session from that place, it just helps you to see, oh yeah, I'm my number one cheerleader. And if that critic tries to make an appearance to tell me that I'm not worthy, that cheerleader is already here. So it's there's more than one person at the party, basically. You did this for yourself. Like you were you were going home from dates and you were journaling up. So how did this, how did this then translate into you making the meta date journal app? And then and then how is that app set up to help people be more mindful in their dating journey? Sure. Well, this spreadsheet that I used, I freaking loved it. I, I did it. Like I went out on like dozens of dates. I used it for multiple dates with the same partner. And as an anxious dater, I felt so much more at ease. I felt mm. a lot more confident that I wasn't going to choose the old unhealthy and 
potentially toxic relationships of the past because I knew that I was carving out time to consciously reflect and make sure that if something did come up, I would catch it as soon as possible. So after experiencing this and just feeling a huge weight lifted, and dating suddenly became like easy for me. It was fun. I wasn't stressed. I didn't feel like Isn't I was- Isn't that great un- when like you suddenly like know what you're doing on dates and just like, you can go on a date like, like I know this is going to be great because you just, you just have that energy about you now. Yeah. I do. I freaking love dating now. It's the best. So I was like, okay, this, I really feel like this is going to work for more people. I want to help people share it just like you. I ended up reading a book by a therapist of over 20 years. Her name is Christy Maxey. She had wrote a book on self-love and I was like, Hey, we zoomed like she's all the way in Arizona. I'm in New Jersey. I was like, Hey, I have this form. I really love it. Is it like just me that it worked for, or could this be something to work for everyone? And she was like, no, there's actually a lot in here. A lot of it, of course, was mindfulness-based, but there's other evidence-based practices that I didn't even realize I was touching on. And she helped me pull all the dots together, like curate the wording of it. And we turned it into a co-authored book called The Mindful Dating Journal. Okay. And since then, we have adapted it for a free mobile app. It's all the same questions. It's completely free, as I said. But okay. I just love it because when you're on a date, chances are you're probably driving to a restaurant or maybe you're taking the subway there and back. That's a key crucial time. I'd say if you can carve out five minutes after the date to either open the app or reflect in your journal, you can really make sure that you're getting the gut instincts out on paper right away. If you wait too long, a lot of times our brain can like adjust. Like we kind of picture, we paint a different picture of what happened. Uh, So I think it's, it's really important to have that convenience of the mobile app that just right then and there, before you even leave the restaurant parking lot, you can say, did Mm. I have a good time? Does this person have the same long-term goals as me? Do they remind me of my parents or past partners in any way? Mm. What emotions did I feel in my body tonight? Did I notice any red flags? How about green flags or even yellow flags? Things mm. that we need to kind of keep a keep an eye out for and make sure that they don't turn into yellow or red flags rather. Right, right. And that can really change your definition of what a good date looks like. When you do mm. that consistently, You know, I used to think that what I needed was somebody that really wanted to watch documentaries with me on a Friday night, like another fellow introvert, you know, but I realized that there's a lot of great things about extroverts that really balance me out. And I used to be like, Mm -hmm. no, I don't want an extrovert, but it's like, you know what, maybe I need to be a little bit open-minded here and see what happens. It's another great thing about mindfulness too, is it helps us to let go of attachments to Mm -hmm. expectations because we're just here right now. If we feel safe right now, we can just experience things for what it is. And we just soak up all that new data, all the information about the world that we might have been shutting out because we thought we only wanted one type of thing. Mm. And I I try to trust to people like, you know, hey, you know, you definitely want to go out there and you want to really, you know, dip your toe in the pool and see, you know, as you date more people, you'll start to know your likes and dislikes and what things you really gel with in a relationship. But I think that's, in, I think that the the app you're, that you created, I think that's really good in a sense of as an introvert, one of the things that we're really great at is analyzing. And a lot of times when we're on dates, we're trying to analyze, but we are kind of haphazardly doing it. And I think the more concrete tools you can have that can really allow you to sit down and like list out, okay, this is what I like. This is what I didn't like. This is where I saw flags. This is where I saw some great stuff. And then being able to say, okay, how did I feel on this date? What were my, it was, I feeling anxious. Was I nervous? Was I happy? Did I, you know, feel something weird about them? Like having that down and, and being able to see it in front of you is actually very, very helpful. Yeah. You, you bring up another great point. Having that time to reflect after the date does free you up to be fully present in the moment. Cause, oh my God, I don't know how many times I'll say something embarrassing on a date. And then for the next five minutes, I'm only half paying attention to what the other person is saying. Cause I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. What are they going to think? And like yeah. going all these conversations inside of my head and that's doing me a disservice and that other person a disservice because now I'm missing any right. data that just came up. 
and perhaps he's feeling distant or she or whatever. So it allows you to just say, oh, you can train your mind with that mindfulness to say, oh, here I go again in my anxious spiral. Let me just come back to the moment. And you can do that with any number of anchors. You can use the body, like exhaling. That's always a great tool that brings me back. Another thing that you can use is um, notice the sound of their voice or just mm. make eye contact with them. That'll bring them back to bring you back into their energy in the moment. Anything that you can use your senses for will help you to break that logic pattern and come back mm. into the present moment. Nice, nice. Uh, what other, for, for people who have experienced like a number of dating disappointments, it can be very, very hard to not beat yourself up and to not think about, I gotta be better next time and whatever. Like what advice would you give them to help them like maintain more optimism and motivation as they're trying to practice being a mindful dater? And also how can you, how can you, like as a person that's trying to get to learn to be a more mindful dater, how can you encourage them not to like beat themselves up if they don't get it right, right away? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a practice. I didn't just come up with this because of that one breakup. I've been doing it for years <laughs> and I did have, like I said, help from therapists. So give yourself grace and recognize that um, it's totally human and normal to have these feelings, to have the struggles. It's all part of our human life. But it's almost like the secret is how I almost started out this podcast, actually. Remember I said that I used to look back on my relationship and say, oh, I got dumped at Disney World. But there's mm -hmm. a lot of negative energy in the victim mode comes out in that. But when you look at it, instead of saying, oh, I've had all these dating disappointments, and nothing works out for me, you could instead say, like I say now, temporarily loving someone cracked me open in the best way possible. So mm. every date you go out on that doesn't work out, what did you learn? Every disappointment, what was it that you were disappointed by? Because that's probably revealing a need. And that's just helping you get clear on what it is you really wanted. And when you have that knowledge, you can make a new choice. So dating is truly just a refinement. You go mm. out there, eyes wide open, and see everything that happens not as good or bad. It's just data. Interesting. I, I, re I appreciate that because I've, I've tried to stress that ultimately – I, for me, what worked was when I started treating dating like a research project, like it's nothing personal. I'm going to go on a date. I'm going to hope that stuff works out, but I'm really looking at, okay, based on these various points, are we going to be a good match? If I ask for a second date and she flakes, okay, what I learned? Okay. That means on a previous date, maybe some stuff came up that I wasn't aware of that I need to be more aware of. So for the next person I go out with, those things won't happen, but it's like, it makes it, it makes me take dating less personally than if I'm not being mindful and I'm making it all about I got to be the most perfect person. They got to feel things for me or I'm going to be disappointed. And I'm basing my success of dating on if every person I go out with wants to have a subsequent date or a hookup or whatever. For sure. I think there's a beautiful balance between the amount of logic we can bring to the dating process and how much we are emotionally present. It's that emotional intelligence again, right? A lot of people, when you're trying to stay safe, at least for me, we do want to just, just look at the facts. Let's leave emotions out of it, right? You know, I don't want to get hurt. I'm, I'm just going to do what feels safe. And that's yeah. fine. It's good to have a checklist of standards. But if you're going to do that, please balance it with the, the emotions too. Because if your emotions aren't present, then any that, of that data that you might be getting from the other person on that emotional level, there's nothing to bounce that off of. So you're going to end up getting into a relationship based on logic alone. And that actually might be one of the patterns oh. that you're doing that isn't leading you to the emotional that that the relationship that actually meets your emotional needs. It's yeah. tough. And, I, and I'll say, too, for guys, I think we we very much think we're because I, I used to think to think of like, oh, women are more emotional. Men are more logical. It's like I don't believe that. I believe that I think that we are more analytically logical. Women are more emotionally logical in a sense. But Guys get in their feelings too. And I think that we, we're we trying to use analytical data points to try to prove to women something about our feelings and that we don't understand why they're going away. And it's like, you have to understand that like, just because you're, well, because this thing and this thing is this thing. So therefore you should feel this thing. Like 
that's still an emotional response. And it's not one that's going to get you the results because you're not being mindful of how this other person is operating in their mental space and in what their needs and stuff are. And it just makes it harder mm -hmm. than it needs to be. Yeah. I mean, regardless of your gender, you have emotions as a human. They are there for you. They're like a really expensive Microsoft or microscope in the lab, right? You can use yeah. that microscope or not. You can use the old one or you can use whatever. But like I'm trying to say here is that they're a tool. And if you can bring that into your dating process along with the logical data, then you have a lens to um, like um, observe all of that logical data. They work together. And it's, it's so... It's a beautiful exploration into your needs when you can see them through the lens of your emotions and to mm. feel safe to do that. And when you right. can appreciate them without judgment, just let them be with you. I think it's shocking how much you'll change in the way you show up for other people too, that the uh, you'll have access to so much more emotional depth to bring to a relationship that that intimacy that you could have with someone deepens as well. That's so true. Well, this, this has been a very fascinating conversation. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? Sure. I invite you to come check me out on my podcast. We talk about mindful dating all the time. It's called Date in Peace. Or you can find me on Instagram at metadate, M-E-T-T-A. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Lauren, for coming on and talking to us about this. Uh, like I said, I've had people ask me about uh emotional intelligence and being a, a more responsive dater and stuff. So this has been, I'm sure they'll find this to be very, very, very helpful uh, as I have as well. Cause I'm, I'm always a student if nothing else. So pr appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Thank you so much, Harry. It was my pleasure. Be sure to go to introvertdatingsuccess.com for more eBooks, audiobooks, and programs designed to help you date as your introvert itself while still getting your alone time. I'm Harry Wilmington and I'll catch you guys on the next one. I'm out. Peace. Hi, is your negative self view of yourself causing your dating outcomes to not be the way they want them to be. Well, on today's show, we're going to talk all about that, how your negative view impacts your dating outcomes and what you can do in order to have a better outcome and a better outlook about yourself. This is the Introvert Dating Success Show. It's the Introvert Dating Success Podcast, the show for introverted men that's all about learning how to attract beautiful women and still get your precious alone done. And now... Here's your host, dating coach and fellow introvert, Harry Wilmington. Hey guys, welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about how your negative self-view can actually shape your dating outcomes. Because I feel as though I get written to by men all the time and I get comments on my videos of guys mentioning all these things and talking about how they can't get the women they want and how they're too tall or they're too short or they're too big or they're too small or how the women that they want, they can't seem to get and how nobody would ever want to date a slob like them or they're ex thirties, forties years old and they still can't get women and are virgins. And they have all these just lingering doubts about themselves that I think they're unaware are actually causing them to not have the dating outcomes that they want. And so we're gonna talk about that today on the show. Plus we're gonna go over various viewer questions and other things that I feel like talking about. So <clears throat> uh, let me get my water real quick because I need some water. I am still getting over a cold people. It's that time of year again. So yeah, I need some water nearby. Here we go. So yeah, today's... <laughs> Today's video is brought to you in part by Crystal Geyser. Crystal Geyser, keeping a brother hydrated when he's sick. Ah, tastes great. So yeah, as always, guys, ultimately this show is about you. So if you have any questions or comments that you want to have answered during the course of this show, you can simply leave them in the comments in the chat and I'll be happy to get to them, all right? So before I get into the main topic of the show, I do want to go over a couple of comments that I got during my recent uh, vacation uh, that I want to answer for these guys because I think it's fair to do so since they so graciously left comments on my channel. I always go to the comment section to look for things to answer for you guys for these shows. So you can definitely leave comments on other videos and I will get to them and be able to answer them on one of these lives. So 
Let's go ahead and answer a viewer question. Like I said, guys, if you guys have any questions during the course of the show, you can leave it in the comment section and I'll get to it. So this guy has a question and he said, I recently moved to another base overseas. So I guess he's in the army or Navy and left an unofficial girlfriend behind. She would Snapchat me every day and I would take my time to respond. Before I left, I asked for a phone call to see if it would be crossing a boundary for me to see other women. She didn't respond. After four days, she Snapchatted me. I replied hours later and she left me on deliver. I only hit her up after she initiates. So what did I do wrong? Well, guy, what you did wrong was trying to set up a phone call to talk to her about potentially trying to see other women and asking her how she'd feel about it. So this is an example of conversations, <clears throat> conversations men think they need to have with women that they never need to have with women. And I've talked about this on a previous show where uh, I watched this past season of The Bachelor where during what they call Fantasy Suites Week, the guy had like three women left to choose from in terms of who he's trying to pick for his engaged wife or whatever. And so he had made a rule. I'm not going to hook up with anybody during the course of this Fantasy Suites. So he goes out with the first woman and they don't hook up. He goes out on a date with the second woman and she's whining her butt off and crying. She has low self-esteem, yada, yada, yada. So inevitably he hooks up with her. And then he gets to the third woman, the one that he actually really likes a whole lot. And he's thinking, man, I just feel so guilty. I need to let her know that I hooked up with this other girl. So they go on a date and before the date can barely even start, he's like, oh, I need to tell you something, by the way. Uh, I made a rule for myself that I wasn't going to hook up with somebody, but then I hooked up with the girl before you. And now you're on a date with me, but I hope we can still have a great day. And her response was telling. Her response was, uh, it's, it basically, it's The Bachelor. I kind of assumed that might go on, but you saying that just confirmed that. So here's the thing. I think as men, we think sometimes we have to be so honest with women all the time about every single thing we're doing, including when we're just in the dating phase with her and other people. Now, this is a situation where this guy is not even in a relationship. He said that this is his unofficial girlfriend, but... I'm going to assume that either there weren't any titles or the fact that it's unofficial means that it wasn't super serious. In either case, the woman that he's dating hadn't asked for that title, which means that there is still nothing in this that says that he has to solely be about dating her. But at the same time, that also means that she doesn't have to be made aware that you could potentially be trying to go after other women to see who's your best fit. And I think men get such a guilty conscience about the idea of, well, if I'm dating one girl, but I'm, I'm consistently, you know, dating other women also and hooking up with them, then this girl needs to know or else, or, or else what? I guess we've been tricked into believing that women are going to be mad at that, but I find women are more mad when you directly tell them this kind of stuff, because in the dating phase, this is just the finding out phase. You trying to say something to her like, hey, so is it cool if I, while I'm overseas, if I see other women, is she supposed to be happy about that? Is she supposed to see, be like, okay, sure, no problem, totally do that. What it's, what's going to happen is it's going to make her feel as though you're already dumping her to the wayside and trying to move on from her. Now, because women are feeling-based people, you got to understand that she might think that you could be seeing other people, but at the point that she knows that you're trying to purposely seek out other people and then you're telling it to her face, that's going to make her feel like she doesn't actually have the amount of value that she thought she was bringing to you guys' situation. So is it any wonder then that she wouldn't want to now stick around? Because now, you before, it was the thought that you might be seeing people. Now that you made it a, a fact that not only are you possibly seeing other people, but you're already trying to seek out other people beyond her, that's not going to make her happy. So it's not, so the, the problem is not that you were replying too fast or too soon or, or not fast enough. The problem was you brought something to light and you were trying to have a conversation with a girl <clears throat> about um, a situation in the dating phase of things that didn't need to be a conversation. And you need to learn to not feel so guilty about doing actions that you feel are going to be against somebody, but is not actually against them because you're not actually in a relationship. Like you don't owe her that courtesy. 
You just really don't. And more importantly, most women don't want you to offer that courtesy to them because they don't want to take it and they don't know how to respond to it. Is she supposed to respond? Yeah, I'd, I'd love you to go overseas and meet somebody. I'll tell you a real quick story, right? My parents, my mom tells this story to this day. My, my dad's been dead since 91, but the, they met through my, one of my mom's friends at school and it was, it was her cousin. And so they dated for five months. After five months, my dad, who was in the army at the time, just like this guy, um, he had to travel over to Korea for a year to fight in some combat thing happening, right? So he went away for a year and then he came back and had my mom meet him at his mom's house. Two weeks later, they got engaged. Two weeks after that, they got married and they were off to California. But in that year's time when they weren't together, he was overseas. I asked my mom if they ever talked or wrote letters. And she said, like, they'd be conversating sporadically here and there. But for the most part, he was just over there. And what she assumed is that he was probably dating somebody else. Like, there was definitely a woman that she knew of that he was probably really spending a lot of time with, possibly hooking up with. But during the time that he was gone, he didn't declare them to be in a relationship. Therefore, she had no care about what he was doing over in Korea. But more importantly, he wasn't bringing to her face that he was potentially seeing somebody else. He wasn't calling her, hey, babe, what's going on? So just so you know, hey, I'm over here in Korea and there's this girl that I really want to hook up with. Is that cool with you? Why? Because that's a stupid thing to do. So you don't need to bring this kind of stuff to women's attention because they will give you a pass. Hey, out of sight, out of mind. You go overseas, she doesn't have to have an idea that you're potentially hook you up with people. She could think you might be doing it, but you saying to her, hey, when I go overseas, I want to hook up with other girls. Now you've made it a reality. And women aren't going to, for the most part, like be able to positively affirm that that's an okay reality for them. So don't have dumb conversations like that with women, I guess. Hopefully this helps you out, all right? Now, I want to answer another guy's comment that was left under a different video. And so this guy left the following comment under another video that I made. He says, this is a different guy. This is a different guy that left the comment. So this guy left the comment and he says the following. He says, what do you do when you meet someone that you know will only stay at your city slash country for a month or two and you know that probably you'll never see again? Wouldn't it be wise to see her more often than once a week? Because I stress to you guys, when you're dating a new woman, you want to only see her once a week until she starts suggesting more times to see her. Anyway, he says, I was seeing her three to four times a week. I noticed when things started to slow down from her, from her end and started applying your concepts, she is texting back now. So good. He was be a little more patient. He laid back. And now she's coming towards him. Cause I always tell you guys, if she's chasing you, she can't be replacing you. But if you're constantly the one going after her and doing all the initiation, then it's, it's very easy for women to feel apprehensive and want to back off. So he says, so she's texting back now, but since there's only three weeks left for her to go, how many times a week would it be acceptable to see her? Well, here's the thing, guy. Ultimately, because it, in a normal situation, you do once a week until she starts suggesting more times and you'd probably see her two or three times a week until such a time as that you guys end up in a relationship. With women that you're meeting on like vacations or trips or when you're out of town or whatever, it's, it's kind of a different story, but also slightly the same in that ultimately- you have limited time, so you you I, in your head, you want to see her more. But what we really want to happen is we want her to reach out when she feels that she's most pressed to see you to then make dates. So what you don't want to do is make the mistake most guys make, which is I have a limited time with her. I'm going to initiate every single day that we do something. No, 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 no. You still initiate like once, maybe twice a week to see her in person, and then you wait for her to come and say, hey, so what are you doing today? Hey, so I was thinking we could go eat lunch with you or I'd love to see this and that because, you know, if you're if there's that high intense feeling on both ends of things, then the woman's going to also know that there's limited time and she's going to want to make the most of that time, but it needs to still feel like her choice. Even when you're on vacation or you're out of town or whatever and you're seeing a woman and you want to hook up with her a lot, she still needs to feel like she's not being forced to spend time with you and that you're not getting butt hurt when that's not happening. I'll tell a real quick story. I, I just recently watched this uh, movie last night. I, I was actually gonna do a whole episode about this because I think it really speaks to the 
what the, the power of what can happen when you're cool, calm, and collected, and you're not so focused on having to be in a relationship with a woman, right? So uh, it's this documentary on Netflix now called uh, Longest Third Date. And it's actually based on this couple that the couple's in it. They're, they're the ones that are narrating the story and showing the footage. But basically, uh, this guy and this girl met on Hinge back in, like, I think February or March of 2020. Yeah, before all the craziness happened. And so they had gone on two dates that went pretty well. And then this guy, he decided to go big or go home, which I don't recommend this, but it worked for him. But I'll explain how he's the outlier in this situation. But don't assume that this means you're going to be the outlier, all right? Anyway, so he says for the third date, hey, we should, like, go to Costa Rica. And she's like, for a third date? And he's like, yeah, we should totally do that. I got the tickets. And she's like, uh, okay. And so at this time in her life, she was just trying to be like, you know, fun and flirty. She just got out of a serious relationship. She was just looking to have fun, not trying to get into anything serious. And he was just kind of like, he was a playboy guy. He, he had been, you know, dabbling in clubs and stuff like that. He was a club promoter at one point. And so he was just kind of like looking for something carefree and not trying to rush into a relationship, but they're having fun. So they go to Costa Rica and then the world shuts down. And so their plan was to spend four days in Costa Rica and then come home. Well, of course, with, you know, the pandemic happening, the flights got canceled. So they had to expend their date from, I think initially their, their next flight was going to be like in April and then it switched over to May and then it switched over to June. So it just kept expanding, expanding, expanding. So I'm watching this documentary like, oh my God, this guy is going to be with her every single day for the next like two months in and out. And things are closed down. So it's not like they can really go and, you know, do like amusement parks or things like that. Like they have to find things to do, like shopping, uh, spending time together at the house. Uh, they're working because they still have jobs that they're doing. So she's working on the computer. He's doing other things. But it's like they got to spend every single day together. And I'm like, I'm waiting for a point in this story where there's going to be like excessive drama because he's getting too needy or desperate. Or he's trying to say, you know, I have feelings for you and I love you this net. And you know what happened? None of that happened. Why? Because I'm looking at the documentary. He's saying the whole time, like, yeah, she's really cute. And I can see this going somewhere. But, you know, I'm not trying to force anything. I'm just trying to go with the flow. I'm taking it a day at a time. You know what? She's feeling things. That, and I'm feeling things. But we're going to, you know, we're having a lot of hookups. And it's a great time. But I don't want to call this a relationship yet. And then you hear her talking about how she had just got out of something serious. And she was really, you know, apprehensive about being open to love again. And so she didn't want to think that she was falling in love with this guy or that it had to be some kind of title thing and she was really having a good time and as i'm watching this documentary and as i see her interviews i start to see the thought process of women and how they go from i don't want to fall in love i just want to have fun this guy could or could not be a thing to suddenly oh i'm having fun with this guy every day oh He's actually really caring kind. Oh, he killed a spider for me. Oh my gosh, he was there for me when I needed to cry about something. Oh wow, we're stuck in this cabin together and I didn't put on any deodorant today and no makeup and he still wants to spend time with me. Oh my gosh, I think I can really trust him. Oh no, we got into this weird situation. He was able to handle it and that's how I want a guy to handle things. Oh my God, he makes me feel really comfortable and safe. And over the span of two months, despite that they're spending every single day together, you see her walls breaking down. You see her start to be more vulnerable. You start to see her open up. And then there was a mistake that happened where uh, he was he was vlogging all this because obviously it's a documentary based on all his iPhone footage. But anyway, so the documentary, he, he posted up the video with, with him and her and the thing, and he posted it on YouTube and he called it Longest Third Date Ever. Well, uh, People Magazine picked up on that and then other outlets picked up on that. And then so now the world is looking at this couple that met on Hinge and they went on a third date. It's the longest third date ever. And now they want to interview them. And so in one of the interviews, one of the interviews asked him if they were a boyfriend or girlfriend. And he said, yeah, she's my girlfriend. At that point, now her mood starts to change. She gets a little apprehensive because she's like, wait, this, this title is being thrown upon me. And I don't know if I even want to be called his girlfriend, even though I like him and I'm building interest. But that caused her walls to kind of close up a little bit. And the dude recognized it. And he said, you know what? He said, you know, he didn't phase me. I recognize I made the mistake of, of saying that we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Not, not to her, but to the camera audience at home. He's saying, I, I know I made the mistake of, you know, saying we're boyfriend and girlfriend without asking her about it. And so, you know, I can tell ever since I did that, that the mood switched up a little bit. So I'm just trying to go back to taking it day by day and not making this thing like feel so serious and whatnot. 
And by the end of the documentary, they finally get a flight home and they land and then they're eating uh, lunch somewhere, some some like uh, like barbecue place. And in, in the on the footage, you see her saying, so, you know, you never actually asked me if like I would be your if I would be your girlfriend. And he's like, oh, you want me to ask you? And she's like, well, I mean, you didn't ask me. So what am I supposed to say? And so he's like, OK, fine. Will you be my girlfriend? And she jokingly says no. And he's like, will you be my girlfriend? And she's like, oh, I don't know. And then he's like, will you be my girlfriend? And then she's like, OK, I'll be your girlfriend. And then the story, and this was filmed in 2020, right? So it fast forwards to now they live together. They got a dog. They've been together for three years and they're still kicking and pushing. But all that to say, how was that able to happen? That he was able to see her every single day and she not get completely freaked out or, you know, suddenly start backing away from the guy. It's very simple. He, for the most part, was not forcing any kind of agenda. He was not trying to constantly make her do things that she didn't want to do or saying just because we're together, we're forced to hang out. It's like he might be in the pool and she comes and hangs with him or she, he might want to go somewhere. He's like, hey, I'm going to this place. Do you want to go? Oh, sure, I'll go. Like it was all very effortless and easy. But more importantly, he set it up to where it made it her choice to want to spend all that time with him. So thereby, it didn't feel like a thing that she was being coerced into or being manipulated into. And I think when these kind of situations happen, most guys are like, well, we, I have all these feelings already. I have to make her do this thing. And, I, and we have to hang and spend time together because we have limited time. And even if you have limited time, women are still going to be women. And you still have to let them come to you. You still have to let them choose you. And you still have to give them the option to say, if you don't want to hang with me now, no big deal. I'm not butt hurt. It is what it is. I'm going to still have a good time either way. I'd love to see you, but if you don't want to do that right now, totally fine. And that's going to allow you to have more success when you're in these kind of extreme situations where you have no choice but to spend a day to day with the woman that you're possibly interested in. Okay. So hopefully this helps you out. But it's directly this, this guy's question. Like I said, be patient. I mean, I don't know when he wrote this, so it might be too late now. He might be already back home or whatever. But yeah, like if you find yourself in a situation like this in the future, like don't be so don't be so quick to rush into trying to hang out with the person every day just because time is limited. Save some space for them to hit you up and to come to you. All right. So hopefully, guys, this answers that question. Now, before I get into the 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 main thrust of today's uh, conversation, I'm going to go through the through the uh, super chats real quick here. Um, oh, so the guy that wrote the, the first question, uh, he says, should you unfriend a girl who disappeared for a number of weeks? And should I ask her friend why she ghosted? So this is, I, I assume this is in response to the same, to the same, uh, girl you're talking about in the previous situation, right? So here's the thing, guy, you don't, you don't look good or win any points for trying to call a girl out or trying to get to her friends and say, your friends stop talking to me and I need to know what's up. Like you don't, that, that's not a good thing. Like realistically, women that like you help you, women that don't won't. So if you find that a woman that you were talking to suddenly disappeared, that's the sign that for whatever reason, it just wasn't gelling with her and you in the situation and she's no longer interested. So you trying to now pursue a woman that's no longer interested is a waste of energy. As for trying to ask a friend why she ghosted, this is the hardest part that I had to learn about dating is that sometimes when a woman leaves you, you do not get to get an answer for that. Sometimes the disappearance itself is the answer and is the closure. And I stress this because it look, it feels and looks very beta and very beggy to try to now try to figure out the reasons behind why a girl left you that's no longer giving you the same energy. Like you're going to spend time and energy and effort trying to figure out what you did wrong and put together, you know, a, a Da Vinci code of matrices to try to figure out what the heck happened. And the reality is it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that she left, she's not there and you move on. And as you get used to doing that, you'll find that when women leave you, it'll be no big deal. I've told the story on here before about, uh, I had a girl I was dating for like six or seven months. And then we get back from a Vegas trip. Oh, sorry, we get back from a holiday trip and I decided to go to Vegas with some of my friends because I just needed a break from her because at that point it was almost over anyway. But like my friend was like, hey, I got a, I got a, um, I, I rented out a timeshare and I have an extra room that's not being used. Do you want to take that room? As an introvert, I needed my alone time and I was like, I can go to Vegas, get my own room, get my alone time and be chill in a nice, in a nice uh, decked out apartment. Like freaky, I'm doing that. And I left and until I was going. And so she found out because she tried to contact my cousin about some birthday stuff that she wanted to do for me. And 
to be fair, she was kind of hurt and I didn't tell her I was leaving town. That's my bad. I got to own that because in a relationship, you got to tell people what you're doing, but I didn't do that. But she wrote me, so she wrote me a text just one morning saying, hey, I don't think this is working out. And so I'm out. And she didn't explain why. She didn't say how she felt about anything. She just was just like, I'm out. And my response was like, okay. Because at that point, I recognized that if she had wanted to talk about it, she would. If she didn't want to, then that's her right. But also, if this was a ploy to try to get me to then try to ask her questions and talk about stuff, that I wasn't that guy either. But the point is that I got to the point where I realized, ultimately, regardless of the reasoning, it doesn't really matter. Like, you're not going to be happy either way you hear about it. At best, you can try to decipher from what you have with your, with your own knowledge right now what you possibly did wrong that you need to fix in the future, which if you were right back earlier in this or saw it earlier, you kind of know what some of those things were. Like the whole talking about um, talking about going overseas and trying to call and ask her if it's okay to hook up with other girls or meet other girls. Like maybe not do that for the future. So that's not a lesson for you. So just don't do that and you'll ideally have better results with the next girl. But like, yeah, sometimes you just don't get answers and you have to be fine with our brains are wired to want to be able to understand things and know the mechanics behind every single thing that's happening to us, including why people treat us certain ways. And as the Joker famously said in or sorry, as Alfred famously said in uh, The Dark Knight, when the Joker was just going around destroying everything, sometimes people just want to see the world burn. Like there's no method to the madness. It's just I want to do a thing and I'm out. And you have to get comfortable with that sometimes being the same way that women are going to uh, get rid of you. So I hope that's I mean, that be the answer you want to hear, but hopefully that helps you get some better understanding about why I consider that a terrible idea to try to uh, ask her friends why she goes in. And also thank you for the super chat money. I appreciate that a lot. Um, another person left a comment here in the, in, the super ch in the chat saying, my girlfriend skipped my messages for three weeks. I feel disrespected. How to gain respect again. This goes, this is literally like the same thing I just talked about is that when people go ghost, well, I don't know, I don't know the reason behind why she went ghost for starters. You know, I don't know if you were just texting her all the time and then she just suddenly stopped. I don't know if you guys had a fight or argument and then she just suddenly stopped talking to you. But I know that women that like you are going to want to have regular contact. So when you start seeing signs that indicate a woman is either disinterested or is losing interest or is out. Sorry to say, guys, you trying to fight that and combat that is not a winning strategy. I think as men, we are very much doers. And so we feel as though we can do something in order to fix situations where women are starting to leave us. And that I find the majority of the time is really not the case. Like if you were in a long enough relationship to where things are kind of going haywire and she backs off for a bit, you can leave her alone for like a month or so and then, you know, hit her up with like a text or something saying like, hey, so, you know, it seems like you want to talk about something. Let me know when we can chat, you know? But for some stuff, it's just they're being disrespectful and rude and you don't have to put up with that. So if they want to ignore you, if you've tried to reach out, because I don't know if you've tried to reach out. If you tried reaching out to her, after three weeks and said, hey, want to see what's up? Can we talk? And she hasn't responded. That's your answer. And you got to move on. And again, the, the moving on portion of dating sucks because especially if it's someone that you really liked and you really thought you had chemistry with or you were with for a good capacity of time, then the idea that they can just up and leave you and be that disrespectful when they leave without wanting to have a conversation is very hard for our brains to conceptually get. And yet it happens all the time. And it's just something that, as somebody in the dating world, you're gonna have to deal with it at times. And it's not fair and it's not fun, but that is a real part. But this is why I tell you guys, it's also important to learn how to be indifferent to outcomes because when this kind of behavior happens, it's not going to affect you as much because you'll just be like, okay, well, they were rude. They didn't want to call me and let me know that we we're broken up. So, all right, on to somebody else. And that's how I take dating these days where I literally, well, for most, these days, I typically have done most of the dumping if I'm getting out of a relationship. But the few times that I've either been stood up or broken up with in the since since I got decent at dating, I have found my result has been like, I'll be sad about it for like a day and then be like, well, ultimately they can choose what they want and I can choose who I want. And there's a plethora of women out there. I can't stress you guys enough. We get so hooked up on this one person has to be our, our, our end all be all. And that is just not the case. The reality is who you are will fit a wide spectrum of women if only you're willing to put yourself out there. But if you're not, then you're always going to have a limited view and think you can only get this person. If it doesn't work out, you're going to be so freaking hurt. And that's just not how this works. And actually, the crux of today's show is going to really deep dive into um, how that 
ties into having a negative self-perception of yourself, okay? But needs to say, when those kind of things happen, recognize it for what it is, and then try your best to move on. If you need help with that, you can go to introvertdatingsuccess.com and you can sign up for a coaching session. All right, so let me get a drink of water here real quick. Uh. All right, so before we get into the crux of the show, we have one more thing. Uh, for those of you that watch it so regularly, I have an album coming out on May 5th uh, called Kevin Samuels Was Right, and it's in honor of the, the Kevin Samuels, who was an influencer on here. He died last year at the age of 56 or 53. I don't know what the age is, but the point is that he had a big impact on just dating advice, and he really told it raw to people. And so uh, I have a segment that I'm doing on the show now called Kevin Samuels Was Right. That's where we look at a clip of Kevin Samuels. And then we talk about why he was right to say the things that he said. And this was actually going to be one that he's talking to men. So let's go ahead and watch this clip. So this is a clip uh, that Kevin Samuels had on one of his shows. Let's go ahead and watch this clip. If you are a single man with no children and you are earning $75,000 or more, you are now platinum. Shout out to platinum. If you are making six figures or more, you are now diamond level. If you're making fifty-five thousand to sixty thousand, you are gold. You are far more valuable than you ever ever been. And here's the trick: you guys don't know how valuable you are, and that is why so many of my critics and detractors are angry at me because I am waking men up to their true value. Yeah, Kevin Samuels is right, and I know some of you guys might watch that and think, "But Harry." Why is my why should my value be based on how much money that I'm making? Here's the reality, all right? Is that much in the same way that we as men value women and rank them based on their looks, that's the same way that women are looking at you based on how much you earn or your position in life in general. Now, is that always fair? I would say on some level, no, but kind of, yeah, because look at the fact that like when you were, we're judging women, right? We're, we're basing a good portion of our judgment on their looks, but that's not the end all be all. It's what gets them in the door for us to continue to further judge them. But, you know, we obviously based on other factors, but much in the same way, like their looks are the way we judge them. Women are looking at how much you make in terms of how it's going to affect their lifestyle, your potential kids' lifestyle, um, how you're going to be positioned in society amongst her family, amongst your family, amongst, you know, how other people are going to perceive you at large. And so it is very important. And so the, but the problem is that there are some of you out there right now that are making 50,000, 75,000, a hundred thousand dollars or more. And yet you still don't recognize the value that you bring to the table because you're still in the mindset of, I, you know, I call it, it's, it's like you're stuck your mindset is stuck in the past of who you used to be and all those ideas you had about yourself back then. And now you're that six figure earner who still has the thought process of a guy that's making like less than four or five figures, you know? And so you can be making a hundred thousand thinking, Oh, but this girl's not going to like me because she's just so hot. And Oh my God, like I'm still nervous and I don't know how to approach women. I've, I've had messages from dudes on the thirties and forties that are making tons of money and still can barely approach a girl or can barely talk to a girl because they're still stuck in the mindset of I don't have value. And what you're not recognizing is that the money that you're making is a significant part of the value that women are going to see that you bring to the table. So if you are making a certain amount of money, then yeah, women are going to see you as the rarity. Because I'll tell you right now, I have yet to make $100,000 a year, if I'm being honest. But at the point that I started making like fifty dollars to $60,000 a year, I am a solo entity. My bills are low. My apartment doesn't cost that much. My car doesn't cost that much. I live in a pretty decent part of town. And so, but I mostly take care of myself. I have my own business and stuff like that. But even with my business expenses, I still make enough to where I can still go on regular vacations. I can still, you know, buy the things that I want to buy, eat where I want to eat. And women are looking at that like, even just with like me making 50, 60, 70,000 or whatever, that like most guys aren't doing that. Most guys are struggling in their jobs and they can barely make their rent, barely make their car payment. So just the fact that I'm even in that range makes me stand out. Now, think picture if you're a guy making $100,000, $200,000. You, the world is your oyster and the women that you want are also your oyster, but you're not recognizing it because you're still stuck thinking, but I don't have all these other things. Like, oh my God, I'm like only five foot eight and guys, women want a guy that's six, two and so blah, blah, blah. And you have all this negative self-talk, which we're going to get into in the main part of the show. But yeah, Kevin's absolutely right on this one is that when you get your goals up, 
and you get your money up, it puts you in a different position to be able to have a wide range of women that are going to now be attracted to you. All right. So recognize that and recognize that you have that ability. If only you would first start by focusing on the things that you want in life and focusing on your successes. And then once you get those things, you'll find that getting women is, is a lot, a lot easier. All right. So anyway, thank you, Kevin Simmons, for that. And be sure to get the album. Kevin Simmons was right on May 5th. All right, let me close this window real quick. And boom. All right. So finally, guys, let's go ahead and get to the main part of the show. And today we are talking about how your negative self-view impacts your dating outcomes. Oh, you know what? Hold on one second. I almost forgot to do something. I wanted to show you guys a few things because I, I really want you to get this idea about the impact that negative perception can have on your life, all right? So I'm going to show you this picture right here. I'm just covering up my family. This is me. This is me, age 15. I think I'm about to go to prom or something or some kind of school dance because clearly that, that, that's me and Nicole. See? So that's, that's what I look like around age 15 or 16. Um, this right here is a picture that I took. I was on a trip. I did a, I took a semester off of college to go on a five month theater tour. And so this was when I was in, we did uh, five shows in Miami. So I was there for spring break for like a week. So that's me, a picture of me back then. This is when I was 21, 21 years old. That's what I look like. Hopefully it's not too blurry. All right. And then this is me. This is me graduation. Fun fact, this is literally like a week after I finally lost my virginity. I was very happy by that point. But this, anyway, that's what I looked like at age 23 when I was graduating from college. Uh, and this is me actually back in the day. Uh, I was a very gifted kid. So I used to go to these gifted summer camps. And so that's a picture of me at, at summer camp age 15, 16, along with a, a bunch of uh, Asian students and one other black person. So yeah. Now, why do I show you these pictures? If you're looking at those pictures objectively and I'm looking at them again, I'm biased because, you know, I'm me now, but like, that's a pretty decent looking kid, right? Like nothing too bad going on. I'd say at best I'm average to maybe slightly above. I mean, I'm, I'm going to judge myself as slightly above average because it's what we do. Right. So I'd say I'll put myself at, I was average looking, but you know what? I wasn't an ugly person. I wasn't a not friendly guy. I was very funny. I was charismatic or whatever. Right. I could not get women to save my life. Like, You've seen my younger pictures now. I, I look pretty similar. I had more hair and stuff like that. But like, I was a pretty decent looking guy. And I'm able to say that now as a 41 year old guy that has had much time to reflect back on how I was in my previous years and what I looked like and how I perceived myself versus how I actually was. Because the, the, the young man in these pictures who to you probably looks like typical decent average looking teen or whatever it's, it's fine um was a guy that was very anxious and was very nervous and was very very considered himself to be very very weird amongst his peers and just had no thoughts or feelings that women would be attracted to this guy now my brother by the way who was a year and a half younger was slightly bigger than me and was a little bit taller than me he had been dating since he was in junior kindergarten so he had, now it wasn't the best women at the time. You know, there were some women that were little, or little girls that were a little toxic back in the day. But for the most part, he had women like throwing, him, throwing themselves at him. The way that he, choose, he decided to choose the ones that were actually great is a different story. But the point is that he had women throwing themselves at him. And part of it was he was extroverted. He was a bit more friendly and easier to talk to when he went to social situations. And I very much was an introvert and was not about that life. I was like, I need time to study people and make sure I know who they are before I start, you know, being my true authentic self. But all that to say, so that kid right there, that young man to college man could not keep a woman and could not get the women that he wanted to get. And for the longest time, I thought it was just me. I thought it was because of how I looked. I thought it was because I was just this weird kid, whatever. Come to find out, wasn't the case at all. It's just that I thought the world was perceiving me in one way. And the reality was that I was the only one perceiving myself that way. But how I perceived myself greatly impacted 
a variety of things about my dating life that resulted in me having negative dating outcomes. And I point this out because just like this young man right here could have probably gotten women if only he had a different thought process. There are some of you out there that have so many negative things you're thinking about yourselves, about how you look, about how you act, about the things that you like or whatever, that you have compromised the kind of women that you're going to be able to get You've compromised how often you're able to go out with women and you've compromised thinking that you even deserve the kind of love life that you could actually have if only you had a positive thought process. So today we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the five ways that a negative self view of yourself actually impacts your dating outcomes. And then we'll go into how to break free from that all together. All right. So let's get into the first way that having a negative self view impacts your dating outcomes. The first one is that it causes you to overlook and miss out on potential relationships. I've told this story before about how I had a college friend that moved out here who was a woman. And when we were in college together, I used to go to her dorm all the time and hang out with the girls that were there. I was friends with the RA there. So I would hang out behind the desk and we would come back and forth and see me like all the time. And I was just thinking they're just being friendly or whatever. They don't really like me. This girl tells me that there were a bunch of women in that dorm that actually had full on crushes on me. How do I not see that? How do I not notice that? Well, it's because I really have the thought process that women are just not going to find me attractive. Like I got called weird a lot and strange in high school. And so I'm in college now. And it's just going to, it just carries over. And I just don't know how women are going to like me because I just don't have any evidence that that's a true thing. And so therefore I was having blinders on and I wasn't able to see the women around me that were giving social cues or saying certain things that inflection wise would have, should have indicated to me that maybe they had some deeper feelings for me or that they wanted me to ask them out. Like I wasn't able to see that because my perception of myself, I was so focused on how I felt the world was looking at me that that became my reality. And as a result of that, I couldn't see what was right in front of me. I you know, I remember in looking back, there was this girl that I was tutoring that year I, that she definitely had a crush on me. And I was just so in my head about like, okay, we're just going to be friends. And she, she's not going to see you that way. I was missing out on very blatantly obvious signals. Like she would come by my dorm sometimes unannounced just to try to say hi to me or see if you could go for a walk. Um, she would ask to do extra study sessions and then keep me over time and just be able to talk to me and eat lunch with me or eat dinner with me. And like, I caught none of this stuff because I was so in my head because I had such a negative self view of myself. And what also happens is that when you have a negative self view, you perceive yourself as less attractive. Like I said, in hindsight, this dude right here, average to it's attractable enough, you know, but it's like, I just thought I was just, just the, not the ugliest guy in the world. I never thought it was like completely ugly, but I definitely felt as though I wasn't the most attractive of the guys that were on my campus and that there were definitely pretty boys out there that had in the looks department more stuff than I did. So how would women want to date me when there's ball players and there's other people out there that have like better positions on campus. And yet again, that was my perception. And I'm the one that caused the sabotage to happen in terms of me not because I didn't have the the feeling that I was desirable then I couldn't think of the reality that a woman could actually find me desirable in spite of the things that I didn't desire about myself so that's the first way that that impacts you the second way that a negative self view can impact your dating outcome is that you will be self-sabotaging of your relationships because here's how this works right so you have the idea that you're not attractive which means you don't believe that you actually deserve a relationship so when you have that as your reality, what happens is that your brain is going to fight to make sure that the reality you believe in is going to stay that way. And so you're going to do things like display needy behavior. You're going to do things like become overly critical of your partner. You're going to do things like um, being nervous and anxious around them and bringing that energy to the situation. You're going to do things like start to project your fears and insecurities onto your partner. And you're going to be doing all this because your brain is ultimately trying to say, no, 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 no you actually don't deserve a relationship. So now we got to subconsciously do everything in our power to make sure that you don't ever get to keep the relationship should you actually manage to somehow trip into one by accident because it's going to be by accident because you yourself shouldn't actually be able to uh, actually think out how to get a woman in the way that's going to actually work. So we're going to make sure that if that happens, that we're, you're going to start bringing things into the situation that are going to make her want to back away. That way you can keep the narrative up that, oh, see, this is proof that women ultimately don't find me attractive. And there's a lot of guys online right now 
You can go to their channels. They're complaining all day about how modern women, this and that, and how, oh, women just want these kind of blah, blah, blah. But all that's doing is allowing them to feed this further narrative that, oh, ultimately, women aren't going to want me because I don't make six figures. Women aren't going to want me because I'm not six feet tall. Women aren't going to want me because I don't have six pack abs. Yeah. And then when you find a woman that comes along and you're five foot eight and you're kind of chubby and you don't make, and you only make like 40,000 a year and she still likes you, your brain's going to go haywire and be like, nope. Nope, we, she's going to, and then you're going to start saying something like, I bet you want a guy that's taller. I bet you want a guy that's more in shape. Yeah, you wish I made more money and that's going to push her away. And then you're going to be like, yep, see, I knew it. She wanted that kind of stuff the whole time. Why? Self-sabotage. So you got to be mindful when you start doing things or you suddenly start having these anxieties about like, like I've had plenty of guys drop me, for example, saying like, well, she makes more money than me. And so, you know, it doesn't seem to be bothersome now, but like, I just know that she's going to eventually dump me and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, but she hasn't said that, dude. Like, she's bringing you into her house. She's willing to pay for dates and meals, and she has a smile on her face. And your worry is that that's going to change eventually. But there's no evidence to that. So that's you in your head, again, trying to throw out a narrative in hopes that you don't want to get hurt later. Because ultimately, self-sabotage is about not being blindsided later to where you'll feel more hurt. Like, it's better for you to sabotage this thing now than to have it come out of the blue. And then you're going to be double hurt because you are finally letting your guard up. And all of a sudden, Oh my God, the thing that I thought was going to come true is happening. Oh my God, I can't take it. I'm not. And you, and it repeats this cycle, you know? So that's the second way that a negative self view can impact your dating outcome. Now get this drink of water. I'm talking a lot. Ah, it's the other super chat down here uh, or chat in general. Um, so I will get to, I will answer this question at the end once I get to the rest of the stuff. Okay. So um, the third way that negative, that a negative self view impacts your dating outcome is that uh, you will start settling for less than desirable partners. So you may think, okay, ultimately you, you don't think you're that great, but you don't want to be alone but you don't feel as though you're actually deserving of the kind of partners that you really want. So what you're going to do instead is you're going to just, you know, if some subsequent woman comes along, it's kind of low value, whatever, but you're thinking, Oh, but she kind of likes me. Then you know what? Fine. I'll go ahead and take her on. And because it's better than nothing, maybe I'll get a hookup out of it, but it's not ultimately what I want, but you may end up selling for somebody that doesn't have your, your same values. Um, they may have potential red flags about them that you're going to purposely ignore just so you'll have an excuse to have somebody. And these are going to be things that are going to result in you having a negative dating experience, which means that if effectively, because you're having a negative self view, you're not dating to the caliber of women that you may actually be privy to. Like I said earlier, you might be a guy that's making like a hundred thousand a year, but if you have a negative view of yourself, you're going to be dating women that are like in the trenches or like, are like cooks at McDonald's or whatever versus dating women that are maybe in your same tax bracket or slightly lower, but, or maybe just are in better social circles in general. Like when you get into those social circles, you're going to still be thinking, but no, these women aren't going to want me. I don't deserve them. I don't know. Cause they're going to find out something about me that they're not going to like anyway. And so rather than just deal with that, I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, date somebody that's of less caliber and you don't deserve that. Like we'll talk if, if you're if you're in a situation in life where you've you know built yourself up pretty well, you your money's there, you're established, then you deserve the best of the best. And even if you're like a guy making forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, you can still find somebody that shares your similar values, has similar interests, and they are out there. But you can't be so self-doubting and so negative on yourself that you're not able to see that or think that you deserve that to where you don't even try to go after it in the first place, you know. Uh, the fourth way that having a negative self-view impacts your dating outcomes is a lack of confidence. When you have self-doubt about how you look, about how, who you are as a person, then that builds up more anxiety and insecurities about yourself to where you'll be doing things like holding on to a woman that, you know, isn't even dating you because you think, but I don't have the confidence to go up to somebody else. I don't have the confidence to believe that there's somebody else out there for me. So I got to try to make this one work. And so you might end up staying in a situation or chasing after a girl a lot longer than you need to simply because you are lacking confidence. Um, also, having no confidence in thinking the things you should do to get women will actually work for you. So, well, let's read that again. Hold on a second. Things you should do. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so I wrote this earlier when I was in a, in a thought process storm. So uh, basically, what that means that you know I teach you guys stuff on here, right? So here's the problem, though, is that the stuff that I'm teaching you guys is based on me doing this for years to where I know what works and what doesn't. And so you're hearing me tell you guys stuff and consciously it appears to make sense. But subconsciously, because you have not actually tried the things that I'm talking about, there is a lack of security about doing those things. And it's even more so if you're lacking confidence because the way you're doing things now isn't working. So then you hear me come on and say, hey, try X, Y, and Z. But if you already lack in confidence just in who you are as a person, then you're going to be thinking, well, I'm already horrible with women. What if I try this thing Harry's talking about and then I still don't get results? Now I'm going to feel even more hurt. And so sometimes people get stuck in what I call their personal hell, meaning the things they're doing aren't working, but it's comfortable for them to do because they know it. And they'd rather do something that they know then try something new that's an unknown that they don't actually know what the results are going to be for them. Because it's easy for me to say, hey, uh, don't call a girl between dates for four days and then you'll find by day four, she'll text you or you can text her and ask for a date and she'll say yes. Like it's easy for me to say that because I've done it so many freaking times. But that first time that I tried it, I was, I was struggling to get past day two, y'all, real talk. I was like, oh my God, it's been three days. She's not going to want to go out with me. Oh my God. And then I finally reached out and, it, and they said yes to the second date. And I was like, oh crap. So this works. I did it more. And as I did it more, I got more confident. But if you're lacking confidence, it can be very easy to not want to do those things. So you end up stuck in the same rut. But that also goes back to you're still feeding the self-narrative of like, see, and this is proof that I can't get women because women aren't going to like me because I'm just not that guy, you know? Um, and actually, also, lacking confidence can also cause you to eventually not approach women altogether. And there are so many women, I mean, so many men out there, you know, the whole going their way, going their own way movement or men that are just like, you know, all oh, women are like this and X, Y, and Z. And so I just don't think they're worth it. Or they're always out to get me or my money or hurt my feelings. And so I'm not going to do it. And so you could do that. You could say it's, it's their fault, but really it's what's really happening is that your negative self view has now concocted this story of ultimately it's women's fault that you can't get them, but subconsciously you're thinking, and it's because I'm the way I am. It's because of my height. It's because of my money. It's because of this weird mole I have on my face. It's because of X, Y, and Z. And that's ultimately why you don't even deserve a woman. So it's no wonder they don't want to date you. So this is why you got to start talking more positively to yourself, which I'll get into in terms of the reasons later on. And then the fifth way that a negative self view impacts your dating outcome is that it creates a negative cycle. So here's how it works. You are already negative about yourself, how you look, how you move in the world. And so now you're looking for confirmation of that. This will be all going to the whole confirmation bias thing where it's like you only have eyes for proof that you are not desirable. So then you end up managing to find a woman that actually wants to date you. And you're like, no, you start self-sabotaging, self-sabotaging, and then she leaves you. Oh, see, this is why. Oh, all oh, women. Oh, I'm, ne oh, I'm never going to get anybody. They don't like me. And I'm such a goof and blah, blah, blah. And then that just feeds more and more. So it keeps feeding into itself. And so it can be really hard to break out of that cycle because you have to be so conscious of the fact that you're on that wheel. I remember around age like 24, 25, I remember stopping a thought like, you know, the reason that you're not having the dating life that you want is because you really have a lot of negative thoughts, dude. Like if you just sit with yourself and be silent for like 10 minutes, just observe how many negative thoughts come into your head. Stuff like, oh, that was so stupid. Oh, you moron. Why'd you make that move? Oh, I can't believe you, you, you caught the, the bus at the wrong time, you dummy. Like those little comments we say to ourselves all day. And then we can't figure out why we don't have a positive view of ourselves or why women then don't also have positive views of us. And so once I started to recognize that, I really started to focus on, okay, anytime I have a negative thought, I'm going to combat it with five to seven positive thoughts about myself. So I might be sitting there thinking like, oh, you're such a stupid idiot for not cooking breakfast this morning. Oh, wait, no, you're smart. You're funny. You're intelligent. You're great to get along with. People like you. You know how to write music. Like, and then that would make me feel better. And I kept doing that. And it took me like a year before I started just having my go-to be positive thoughts instead of negative thoughts. So you got to start observing that stuff, right? You got to start recognizing that you are the first person that is going to, like I said in the previous podcast, either be your cheerleader or your hater. And many guys, unfortunately, have become their own hater. If you your own hater, how are women supposed to be your fan? 
Just real talk. So now, before I get into how to break free from that cycle, I will answer this guy's question. So same guy from earlier. He said, I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but this same girl is still on my social media and watching my stories. I don't think you have a definite answer if I should unfriend her on Snapchat or not. Okay, so this goes back to, again, you're not trying to show actions that indicate your butt hurt or that what she did had an effect on you. And so to that I say, ultimately it's at your discretion. I typically am just like, I'll let them be the ones to unfriend me. Like, because if I unfriend her, she's going to see it and know that, oh, I, she had an effect on me of some kind. And I don't like giving women th that benefit if things go, you know, haywire or out the blue, you know, like, I just don't think that's necessary. If you don't want to see that, you most like, most, I know Facebook, they have one where it's like, you can, you can have it to where you can block a person from either seeing your stories or you can block yourself from seeing their stuff. So that might be an option, but ultimately I think it's kind of silly and stupid. Like, and keep in mind, I, I, I grew up in the first half of my life, social media wasn't a thing. So I'm very much in the practice of like, if they're on my social media or not, I, I could care less because up until I was like 23, the, so social media wasn't a thing. Like MySpace came into fruition in like 2003, 2004, something like that. So it, for me, it's not a big deal. I know today's generation, social media is more of a bigger thing than that. But honestly, as a guy, I don't think you should be on social media all that much anyway. Like you should really cut back how much you're on Snapchat, how much you're on Instagram, how much you're on Facebook, mostly because it gives away the mystery and intrigue, which actually makes women more attracted to you faster. Like if a woman's able to see you posting all the time, commenting all the time on things, et cetera, et cetera, you're thinking, oh, she can see my lifestyle. That's so great. And what's actually happening is she's getting to know more about you than she would if she was just on a date with you it takes away some of that mystery that she can learn about you when she's actually seeing you in person. And so it can actually be more beneficial to not have a, a very big social media presence anyway. Like, so to your, to your response, to your question here, like you could just consider posting less. You could post less pictures, less stories because none of that stuff is actually necessary. Like for me, I have social media accounts specifically for my business. I have a introvert dating success, um, uh, TikTok, and Instagram, which I don't really use a lot even then. I have a Facebook page. I have a YouTube channel, obviously. And it's for business purposes. My social media accounts help me to attract in new viewers. They buy my products. I get money from it. If you're not making money off of your social media, what the heck are you even on there for? Like real talk. And you be on there just to show clout and just show, oh, I'm doing things with friends and I'm looking at them. Like ultimately, it's not a necessary thing for you to do in order to attract women. So I say, let it go or use it less. That's just my two cents. Big drink of water here real quick. Ah. All right. So lastly, guys, so we went into how negative self-view can impact your dating outcome. So if you're a guy to this point that has had a negative view of your dating life or just a negative view of yourself, your situation, your looks, what you're into, et cetera, how can you start to break free from that? Because at the moment that you decide to, at the moment that you decide to change this and turn it around and say, you know what? I don't, I'm tired of being down on myself. I'm tired of beating myself up. I want to feel better about myself. Then you got to start making the necessary steps to make that happen. Because some people will say, I, I wish I could think more about my, better about myself, but just my life's been so, the world is not, you, Kevin Sam used to always say, the world is not owe you understanding. So you can decide to continue to be in this negative spiral and be the victim and, you know, have a negative self view of yourself. Or you could recognize that if you do the work, you can actually start having a positive thought process about yourself, which will then show in your mood and your attitude and your perception in general. And that will allow women to come into your life if they're not already there, that will find you attractive and desirable and you can get the relationship that you want. So let's get into what those five things are. First thing first, therapy. If you legitimately have gone through a kind of depression or experienced any major trauma in your life early on in your childhood or middle school year, or high school years that resulted in, in where you're at now with your thought process, then really consider doing the work of going to therapy and talking to somebody. Hey, I've gone to therapy at times when I just thought, am I tripping on some stuff that I'm not even aware of? Let me just go ask another person and then they can give me the real on that, you know? So it doesn't, it's not a bad or shameful thing to say, Hey, I am always thinking negatively. Maybe somebody that's professional can help me get to change my perspective on things and get a, a better thought process overall. That's the first thing. Second thing 
is to practice positive self-talk and combating negative thoughts. Again, I can't stress the importance of doing exercises like when you think a negative thought, recognizing what it is, turning it around, and then telling yourself five to seven positive thoughts. If you do this exercise enough, you'll start to recognize ideally that your thoughts are becoming a bit more positive and you're less likely to beat up on yourself because it, your positive thoughts are basically saying, in spite of whatever negative thing you're thinking about yourself, there are still more good things about you than negative. And that's what we want to get into your brain, all right? The third thing is to start focus, 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 focus on setting goals and achieving them. And these goals should be outside of trying to get women. When I tell you that for the longest time, I was so depressed because I wasn't getting the women that I wanted. Every time I would try to go for one, they would, didn't want to date me or they'd go for somebody else. And I was really down in the dumps about that. You know what I found made me happy? The fact that, you know, I made a goal, for example, to move out of my mom's house. I, I was living with her right after college and I just didn't know how to get out of there. And I was depressed about it. And I started doing eBay. I did eBay for like, I went to a garage sale one day and this, I had like $12 in my bank account. And I saw a newspaper ad that said this lady was selling everything in her house and nothing would be more than $5. So I went there, I bought like three or four things. I, I had to ask my mom for a little bit of money because I only had like 12 bucks in my bank account. But yeah, I sold those on eBay. I said, oh great, can I do this again? I flipped it, I doubled it, I tripled it. And then in the span of like eight months, I went from living in my mom's house to being able to get a car and to move to Atlanta. That was a goal that I had for myself was to move to Atlanta and I achieved it. And I was so immensely happy about that, that it just boosted my self-esteem. Then the big move was getting to California. And I haven't really told that part of my journey too much, but I'll, I'll give you the short version is that when I was in Atlanta, I actually, I actually made a song that got super duper popular and went viral. And it got so popular, I got recognized by people out here that wanted to work with me. I created some stuff for them. They paid me some money and I moved to California. But the point is, that was another huge goal that made me realize, oh crap, I actually have a knack for like being able to create my reality, to be able to do the thing. I, I put out a goal. I say, I want to do this thing. I want to move here. I want to create this thing. And these things happen. And oh my God, like I can do that. And so all this did was strengthening my, my thought process and uh, it strengthened my ability to think more positively about myself because I knew that if I put my mind to things, I can make them happen. And then eventually that segued over into, and when I'm trying to attract women, I know that if I, if I make it a certain goal and do certain things that I can get the women that I want. And, and I, when I say do certain things, I mean, do things in a way that's like ethical and is obviously going to make the woman feel great and make me feel great and be, you know, positive for the relationship. But the point is that, yeah, like, yeah, then if you start by focusing on your goals first, the more of your personal goals you'll achieve, you'll find that that feeling of accomplishment and that sense of positivity about yourself will then segue over into women. Because when you, when you do a goal, right, you, you achieve a goal and then you go on a date and you can talk about the goal you achieved. You feel great about the goal to that woman. She's thinking, oh man, this guy achieves goals. He says things and he goes after it and he gets what he wants. Like that's a great guy. And now those women are seeing you as a desirable man because the majority of men that they know aren't going after the goals they want or aren't living the lives that they really want. So this is why I say that's a good way to practice is by focusing on your goals and achieving those first and then getting back to women. The fourth way to break free from negative self-use uh, self is to redefine, start redefining past negative experiences as growth opportunities and or simply having a lack of knowledge that you now have. Uh, back in the day, when I was uh, with my uncle, he used to sell rainbow vacuum cleaners, which I still have one to this day. They're absolutely great. I recommend you get one, that they cost a lot of money. But the point is this, is that these machines cost a lot of money. And so my uncle would go to these people's houses and convince them to spend an absorbent amount of money on these machines. But how did he do it? Well, he recognized that the, the main goal is we go into these people's houses and they have a standard vacuum cleaner that they bought based on the knowledge they had up to that point. And now we're going to make them feel bad because they got this vacuum and we know how toxic it is in their house. But we can't say it to them like that, right? So what we would do is uh, we would do some experiments and things that would show the difference between why their vacuum doesn't work and then why the rainbow vacuum actually legitimately sucks up the dirt in their rugs. Because most people, I, I'm guaranteeing you right now, guys, this is just a sidebar conversation, right? If the vacuum you're using right now is leaving dirt in your rug, 
and it's leaving dirt in your environment. And there's ways to prove that. And we used to do that all the time with a rainbow test where simply we would like, my uncle would sprinkle salt on the ground and then have people go over it with their vacuum cleaner like a bunch of times. And then he would take the rainbow, do one swipe, all the salt would still be there. And he'd be like, now why do you think this salt keeps happening? It's because their vacuum doesn't work. So then we'd have to tell them, hey, you know what? It's not your fault. I'm sure when you bought this that you were doing it based on the knowledge that you had up to that point and that you're really doing the best you could for your family. But now that you have some new knowledge, can you see how you might make a different decision with this new knowledge? And you would sell the vacuums to them like clockwork. So how does this revert over to you? Aside from just me liking to talk a lot about rainbow vacuums, you can talk to me all day about that. But the point is that, yeah, so your negative experiences about yourself that resulted in you having a negative self-view, all that was based on the life experience you had up to that point, the knowledge you had up to that point, the people you were around up to that point, and the opportunities that you had up to that point. So for example, in middle school, I was around a bunch of people that just didn't find the kind of guy that I was all that attractive. And what I didn't recognize is when I got to college, I was in a new environment where those people would be able to see me as an attractive candidate to possibly date. So had I had that knowledge back then, I could have said, you know what? Let's ignore all the negative experiences I had in high school. This is a new situation. And even in high school, honestly, I had girls in, in high school that were also attracted to me. I just, again, I still had a negative self-thought about myself. So I wasn't able to take those opportunities. And when they came up, I would wait until it was too late. And then by that point, the person wouldn't be attracted anymore. So that was still on me. But the point is that, so if you have all these negative thoughts about who you are or what you're about or how you look, recognize that that is just based on where you've gotten to up to this point. But if you were able to objectively look outside of yourself, like I can look at these pictures and say, you know what? That guy could have gotten women. If only he had been more, more uh, positive and if he had had a better outlook on who he actually was and how things had differed from where he was back in middle school or high school years. But I didn't. But you can. You can still say, you know what? In spite of how I feel about myself now, where I'm at, like, does the world actually look at me like that? Or am I just looking at myself like that? And also, these negative experiences that I had, you don't know what those other people are going through. You might have been attracted to a woman and be like, she doesn't want to date me. I don't know what's going on. It's crazy, blah, 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 blah. And you don't know what's going on in her world. I had women that I had crushes on in, in college turn out to be lesbians later. But at the time, they were still kind of dating dudes. <coughs> They're still trying to figure themselves out like we all are. And I just didn't have that input. So later on, when, for example, in those situations, when I found out later they were lesbian, it was just like, oh, okay. So that negative, that negative uh, experience I had where I was trying to attract them and they didn't know if they wanted to date me or not, then they just kind of ghosted me or whatever. And I felt some kind of way about it. They were trying to figure their sexuality out. So now I don't need to be mad about that situation anymore because I have a more understanding. And even if I didn't get that understanding, the reality is they, as people, still had the right to choose who they wanted to choose, whether it was me, another guy, another woman, doesn't matter. The point is that I can look at that situation differently now and realize that we were all in our growing phases and that for, for whatever purpose, they weren't ready for me. And honestly, I look back at like the times that I got butthurt about women that I didn't get to get with. I was nowhere near ready to date people. I didn't have a house. I didn't have a car. I didn't have a job. Like I always thought about like, I can't support this person. So like, realistically, I wouldn't have even been in a place to make those relationships last long term anyway. But that by me being able to redefine that, it makes me realize that back then I was so harsh on myself. I didn't have to be, which makes the now version of me not have to be so negative about myself. And then the fifth way to break free from negative self-view is to work on self-care. Like, do things like exercise, read self-help books, uh, join groups or activities that have positive people in them, like surround yourself with positivity in your life and goals and things you can work on that will allow you to take full self-care of yourself. If you're out of shape, I recommend walking, going to the gym, eating better, like do things that are going to make your body feel great. Oh, here's a, speaking of that, here's a bonus reason. Okay, here's a, here's a bonus way to break free from a negative self-view, okay? Eat better foods. I'm serious. Like, I found for the longest time, I don't know when I realized this, but I, I start to realize when I eat fast food, my mood for the rest of the day is usually pretty shy. Like, I feel more cranky. I don't want to be around people. I get really snippy and, and cranky about stuff. And I, I go back to having those negative thoughts. I found the less I ate out at fast food restaurants, the more positive my thoughts got. And I don't think there's been enough studies done between the kind of foods that we eat 
and the impact it has on our mental health and the mental thoughts that we have about ourselves as people. So consider that. And you know what? Try this experiment. Eat clean for like a week and then go to like McDonald's and get like a Big Mac, some fries and a drink and then really observe how you start to feel. If you start to feel more tired, more groggy, and you'll start to see what I'm talking about. Because it really is the thing. Like I, I really don't eat out much these days. And then the days that I do eat out, I usually do it like, like later at night when I know I'm not going to go out to try to hang out with other people because I like to have a good attitude when I'm going out. So yeah, eat better foods and you'll have a better thought process also. So hopefully guys, this show has been helpful and beneficial and it's helped you out. And um, if you guys have any questions that you want me to answer on one of these future shows, you can leave uh, comments in under any of my videos. I always go through my comments every single day to look up things that you guys are asking me and I'm happy to answer them on these shows. Uh, thank you guys for the, that left the super chat. You can always leave super chats. You can always go to my uh, my cash app at Harry Wilmington. If you want to leave a monetary, thank you. Also go to the website. Be sure to check out our eBooks, audiobooks, programs, coaching sessions, etc. All that are designed to help you date as your introverted self while still getting your precious alone time. And guys, uh, again, my album, uh, Kevin Samuels was right. is coming out on May 5th. This, this, uh, uh, I'm bragging now, but this, this album's a banger. Like I don't do anything. Like I said, I, I got to California because I made a song that got popular and went viral. I do this for real. I just don't do it on this channel because, you know, I like to keep it all about the dating stuff. But like this is this is the album that's going to be in the, in the vein of like talking about dating stuff and about some of the stuff that was based on the stuff Kevin talked about. So be sure to check out a brief snippet of one of the songs uh, on the outro here. That's all I got. I'm Harry Wilmington and I'll catch you guys on the next show. I'm out. Peace. All right, IDS Mob. Today's podcast, we are joined by A.G. Reynolds. He is a former software engineer turned dating and life coach. And Ege's mission is to help analytical men attract and date women authentically while also using dating as a tool to help his clients become the best versions of themselves. Uh, he has a YouTube channel called The Charming Man and as well as a website. And Ege provides practical tips and insights to help logical guys build real and lasting connections with their dream partners. Ege, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. Good to be here. Excited for the conversation. Yeah, me too. I, I've seen some of your, your YouTube clips and, and stuff about your website. And so mm -hmm. I really want to, you know, really focus in on the whole thing about you coaching analytical men, because obviously right. introverted men are also very, very analytical. But I always start mm -hmm. off with my guests uh, asking them, uh, tell me a bit about your dating journey and where you started at and then how you got to where you're at now. Yeah, that's a great question to start with. So basically, I grew up in Turkey. I lived in Turkey until I was 18. I came okay. to the US initially for college. And when I was like in high school, I was in the basketball team, but I quit. So I gained some weight during that time. So going into when I was 16, 17 years old, I was overweight, playing video games all the time and had zero skills to speak to women. Like the only woman I would see were League of Legends characters, which I truly loved. But they didn't, they didn't reciprocate the love I felt for them, you know? Yeah. So I came from this place where in my culture, there's a bit of a gap between man and woman. And it's not something you're thought to be able to just speak to woman. And I was overweight and I felt insecure. So I was this smart kid who could show up to math, physics class, know what to do and get good grades. But I was very unfulfilled in my personal relationships and my relationships with women. So before going to college, I lost the weight and I came to the US where no one knew who I was. However, my mind still saw me as that fat kid. So although on surface, I looked quite similar to how I look now, in my mind, if I looked in the mirror, I would have the beliefs of that person. Oh, this girl's not going to pay attention to me. She's not going to respect me why would she even be interested in me and i used that time in college to really use meeting woman as an avenue to challenge my beliefs so first i took care of the social stuff made some friends started meeting people but yet i was still getting friend zone and what really pushed me into growing in this arena was there was this girl i really liked who i was friends with and I remember at some point I got the signal that, hey, you know, she's, she just wants to be friends. But we go on summer break, we come back 
And she's like, hey, we should meet when you come back. And I'm like, what? God is sending me a free opportunity. This is amazing. And then we go on two dates and I never hear from her again. Things just get awkward. And that was the moment where I thought, okay, something needs to change. So I work with a few mentors along the way. I started approaching women in my college campus, like in libraries, coffee shops, walking around. And that journey really led me to seeing what's possible. Like it's so possible to meet someone spontaneously during the day and then start dating. And as I had those reference experiences, eventually I went, every guy should experience this, should know how it is to be completely free, but most importantly, to be the man that we all want to be and be the ideal version of ourselves. So that got me into the coaching, just seeing how things change in my life and knowing what's possible coming from a kid who was just super overweight had no social skills to seeing whoever I want to speak to, I can. And it does lead to amazing experiences. Mm. That's so true. And I feel like, you know, people that are mm -hmm. in this space, like you, like me, it's like, there's mm -hmm. always, it goes from like this journey of, we couldn't figure anything out whatsoever to then it suddenly right. like becomes clear as day. But in the mix of that, there's so much that we go through. But one of the big things obviously is that, you know, I don't know if this is your experience, but I found myself oftentimes like so in my head about every single yeah. move that I needed to make and decide on before I even like said hi to a woman that it kept me just stuck in paralysis right. or I moved too late to get the women that mm -hmm. I wanted, you know? So, but yeah. what, is it, what, what do you feel like puts, puts a person in that space where they're just overthinking things all the time? Yeah, I think for guys who are more analytical, people just get used to having a lot of certainty. Like if you do physics, math, engineering, accounting, you're not going to look at the feelings of an Excel sheet. You're like, here's the formula. I plug in the formula. Here's the result. And for people who are used to that world, like I was, I studied computer science. When it came to the social world, there was no certainty. There was no say this, do this, and that's what's going to happen. So I think a big part of what keeps people stuck in that space is social situations are a lot more unpredictable than writing a program or solving for a math equation. And for the guys I work with, that's just what they're used to. Mm. So the idea of, hey, I'm going to do something, but I don't know how it's going to go. is terrifying to them because they want that control of, I need a predictable outcome and I need to know if I say this to the girl, she'll respond somewhat like this, and then it will lead to something, which is interesting, right? Because if you look at YouTube video titles or thumbnails, that's kind of how we like to phrase things on, hey, here is what you do when this happens, because that's what guys want on surface. But from a deeper level, I think the reason people get stuck into their head, just like I was when I was starting, was because I was terrified of uncertainty and not knowing like, oh, I go speak to that girl, but who knows what's going to happen if she, she's even going to pay attention or I don't know, right? Well, yeah, because like it's like the uncertainty is is really even more so in they don't know the, the level of reaction they're going to get. Like right. if you get a, a math problem wrong, you got it right, or you got it wrong, but you can fix that. But like something with humans, it's like, if I say this thing, are they going to give a gentle no thank you? Or are they going to laugh, laugh me in the face? Are they going to tell all their friends about it? Like, it's just, we have all these cataclysmic reactions that could happen, probably aren't yeah. going to happen, but our brain doesn't know that. Yeah, exactly. And like a lot of the time, because of survival instinct, we're more likely to think about the worst case scenario rather than the best case scenario. Mm. Like for someone who's stuck in their head, they're going to think, oh, this girl is just going to tell me to disappear. She's not even going to pay attention. And I've approached thousands of women and that has happened maybe like two or three times. It has happened. I'm not going to say it hasn't. Oh, yeah. But out of all that sample size, it's very rare that happens. And usually when it does, it's truly something about them. You know, yeah. if, like if you're trying to speak to someone with good intentions and they're just very closed off and negative, 
there's nothing you did wrong there. Your intentions were pure. You were just trying to put yourself out there. And I think a lot of men take responsibility for reactions that are really not their responsibility to fix sometimes mm -hmm. and take things personally rather than seeing, hey, maybe she's just having a bad day. Maybe she just broke up with her boyfriend. Maybe she's been through some trauma, so she's not very loving towards men. And I think a big part of the work is knowing what's our work to do and what's the other person's work to do and separating mm -hmm. that. Right. Not taking on the, the, the burden of everything having to be on us. Yeah, because I think, you know, men are pushed in that direction many ways. Like, oh, you need to be this rock that woman can come back to, which is very true. It's important to be grounded and provide a layer of not just like financial stability, but emotional stability Yeah, and create an environment where woman feels safe around you. But at the same time, I think a lot of men and myself included at the beginning, we forget that we also have a choice on who we date because it's so much about how can I make an impression to this person? Whereas when we switch that and understand, hey, I also decide if I want this woman in my life, then the energy we come on with becomes very different. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Now you've mentioned... Uh unpredictableness being a factor, but what are, what are some yeah. other challenges that analytical men face when it comes to dating? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the first challenge any man faces is not speaking to enough woman and getting stuck, stuck in their heads when there's opportunity. And most men I think will, instead of admitting that they'll say, Oh, there is just no good woman in my city. There are no good women the entire left. Entire city, you know? no girls yeah. whatsoever. <laughs> exactly, there are no women left in the world, unless you live in Antarctica. That's probably not true. And I think what's interesting is when you do get the ability to speak to women, you actually see more women around you, just because your mind's open to the possibility. So I think the first part is just initiating the conversation, and then the second biggest problem I see in guys is understanding that conversations are about emotions and energy rather than facts. So mm. a lot of men, they'll speak to a woman and a woman might say, oh yeah, I like playing basketball or like I like going to yoga. And they'll be like, okay, she said basketball and yoga. Okay, I'm going to talk about a time about basketball and yoga instead of going into, okay, why does this person like that? How does this actually make them feel? Instead of connecting from a feeling level, I think men connect more from a, or try to connect from a factual level. Yeah. And then in their mind, they're like, wait, I did everything I had to do. It doesn't compute what went wrong. And that's when women go like, hey, I didn't feel a spark or there was no chemistry. And the guy is just going back home thinking, I think that was good, but not hearing back from the girl again. Yeah. And it was with, especially with the communication thing too, I've, I've noticed just in my day to days, like how people tell stories is like, like you'll say, mm -hmm. oh yeah, today I had to go to the laundromat and blah, blah, blah. And then rather than digging deeper, it's like, oh, well I went to the laundromat too. And it's supposed to be yeah. like, it's, I think to guys, it's like, I'm comparing your story to mine so I can show you how we are similar in a lot of ways but they're not right. being aware that women are reading that as like, but you're not even trying to dive deeper. I need you to dive deeper into knowing who I am. And you're just going on a story right. about yourself now. I don't feel connected because you're not trying to really figure out about me. Exactly. And I think that ties into how being introverted can actually be a superpower, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of men think, and I'm sure you've heard this from people you work with as well. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of introvert think, in introverted men think this is a bad thing. I think it's amazing because you actually build the ability to listen. Like introverted people are a lot more perceptive about what's going on in the conversation. How is everyone feeling? And being really present in that space. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of power because especially women just want to be listened to and appreciated. And I think a lot of women are noticed, like they're noticed, you see them, oh, she's dressed well, or she's attractive, but they're not fully seen. 
not many men really go into their lives and try to understand what makes this woman thick. What is what is it about her that I like? What are some things about her that are a bit like awkward but kind of cute? And I think if you can be the guy who can really get into that and have her open up, that's how actually women connect with you. So many times, like, I've talked to guys who are introverted who think they need to be amazing storytellers or like, crack, like yeah, like impress her in this like manner where he comes off cocky and extremely extroverted. Mm. And those things are good for us to feel validated. But in terms of a pure attraction level of becoming an attractive man, they're more of the icing on the cake than the cake. Like they're not necessary. It comes down to listening intently and then giving this woman the the space to shine and making her feel really understood. Mm -hmm. And what's also interesting, I find, is that especially with analytical men that have a hard time with women, it's mm -hmm. it's like they they don't see the correlation between like the stuff that they study. Right. They have to mm -hmm. study it enough to where to know how it mechanically works. So they already know that studying something equals being better at it. And mm -hmm. yet when it comes to women, they're not trying to study the women they're talking to. They're not trying to study like the ins and outs of female attraction, how their minds work, what they need to function in a relationship. Um, mm -hmm. In your practice, do you find yourself having like trying to do your best to point out to logical men or analytical men, hey, if you start to notice these things about women, you'll see that they're actually very easy to connect with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I found in your videos, that's something you do really well, like really pointing out where, hey, if you notice this, this is what that means, and then breaking things down. I think when I when I work with people, the way I work with them is a lot more principle oriented, mm -hmm. where I'm like, here are the principles that we're going to work on. And you will see these principles in different situations. And a lot of the time, I, I'm a proponent of just going into the real world first with mm. the minimal amount of knowledge so they get some reference experience for themselves. And then I can kind of teach them, okay, here is what that kind of meant. Because I also feel that a lot of men almost learn too much theoretically. Mm. And then they start feeling like, oh, yeah, why would I listen to you, man? I already know this stuff. I've read the books. I've studied the YouTube videos. But knowing intellectually is not actually embodying the knowledge that you know. Yeah. And all the knowledge is on YouTube. But if you're just watching some videos and taking notes on it, that's not going to benefit you. So when I work with someone, the first thing we do before we even like give them much access to our membership program is go out there and compliment five women come mm. back and let me know how it goes so that they feel like okay i'm doing this now my life is actually changing rather than them having to study for for a period of time and then feeling like okay now i'm ready because that can also create a lot of performance anxiety if you know too much Right. Because then you're trying to go over in your head when you meet a woman. OK, I got to like remember this thing and I got to touch her in this certain way and I got to uh, say this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's that? I'm curious. What's that experience like for the guys that you take out for that first time? Like they they're they're analytical dudes and you're taking them out in the field and you're saying go approach. What is their right. initial reaction to that? And then how are you able to help them progress? Yeah. So I rarely do in person coaching these days. Mm. Well, how I work with people is more we have a virtual program. And the first exercise for them is doing those five compliments. The way we keep them accountable is they tell me, okay, here's when I'm going out. Here's when I'm going to do it. And then we check in with them later on. Um, there are still guys who are in more like intimate one-on-one -on -one mentorship that I take out in person. Okay. But when it comes to just the complimenting, we focus on this perspective of appreciating beauty, right? Because a lot of the time, men come into this and they're like, okay, I want this to be about me. I want to get that number. I want to go on that date. I want to build that relationship with this woman. And that gives off a very needy energy when they speak to women. It's almost too intense. And women can tell, okay, this guy's telling me all this stuff, 
but it's really because he wants something from me. Mm. So when it comes to that exercise, our perspective is don't even stay in the conversation, man. Like just really make this about giving where you go out, you see a girl you want to speak to, you say, hey, excuse me. I know this is a bit unusual, you know, if it's if it's not a bar, but it's just like on the street or a coffee shop so that you sh- you're showing some empathy. And then you just give whatever compliment comes up to your mind. Hey, I thought you looked beautiful. I like your energy. I like how you smile. And then as you give that compliment, you really feel it coming from your heart. So then the energy behind it is from a place of gratitude. It's from a place of giving rather than I'm saying these things so that I can get this outcome from you. So for a lot of guys, that experience is very powerful because Mm -hmm. immediately when we start doing the work, they see, okay, this is what happens when I shift my energy. And this is how women actually respond. Like so many guys, I'm sure you've seen this on your comment section or your interactions as well, they will say, oh, no, women react like this. And you go, how many women have you spoken to in the last week? And they're like, no, none. Yeah. I spoke we, one in last year. And that's we, just not enough. Yeah, we, we used to call those keyboard jockeys back in the day. Like the guys, oh, that, yeah. like, they'd be in the, like, they go to like forums and talk about, oh, yeah, do this next Y and Z, blah, blah, blah. But they don't have any actual experience. And I think we all start out like that to some extent. Like if we're trying to right. learn stuff, we're like, I think I know this stuff now. And it's like, you, you still got to go out there. Like nothing beats yeah. experience. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a common trap people fall into. When I knew I had to get better, that's why I paid a mentor and just signed up for a program to make me get better because I knew as an analytical guy, if I didn't have the financial incentive, I would have just kept learning for two, three years. And yeah. I, I didn't want to be that person who did that without taking action because I think That's almost worse than not knowing because when you study something too long without applying it, Mm -hmm. the further that goes on, the more you doubt your ability of like, am I actually going to put this to use one day? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's so important for guys. Let's say they're listening to this episode and it's the first time they've ever seen dating content actually go out and give those compliments because if what you're listening to hasn't changed the way you live your life, then you just wasted your time. Right. Like you're basically watching content. So you feel good about stuff. Like your brain says, Oh, I get this because I'm listening to it. But yeah, I I, I tell people that watch my show too. I'm like, Hey, all this stuff is great. But like at the end of the day, you got to go out there and use it. Otherwise you're just wasting your time. Right. Exactly, man. That's it. Yeah. Now, um, what other kind of exercises do you take guys through uh, in the process of your coaching? Like, you don't have to go through all of them, but just like a couple of examples Mm -hmm. of of things you do to kind of help analytical men get out of their way or rethink the way that they're dating. Yeah. So the first part is, again, approaching. And we have four principles we focus on. It's relaxation, empathy, uh, expression, and leading. So it's expression first and then empathy and leading. And we look at that as a compass. So, you know, the way a compass works is you don't know exactly where you're going, Mm -hmm. but you know the direction to which you're going to. And these principles are a compass that they can use in any social situation to figure out, okay, what would be a good, good way to navigate this situation? So the relaxation comes from long form meditations. So we have our students meditate for at least 30 minutes a day for like at least five days a week. Ideally, you know, not everyone sticks to it, of course. Yeah. But what we find when people meditate is you see how impermanent your thoughts are. One of the biggest reasons man gets stuck in dating is we have a thought that arises and we take it to be the truth. And then our complete mood and state just changes by one random thought Mm. of like, hey, I'm not good enough or, oh, no, this conversation is awkward. It's just one thought. Like you probably have hundreds of thoughts a day, but we pick to take that one personally and go, "Okay, this means something. Okay, now this conversation is over. So meditation 
allows people to see whatever thought is arising right now, five seconds later, it's not going to be there. So if I have a thought of I'm not enough when I'm speaking to a woman, why hold on to that? Just let go of that and move on because that just comes and goes. And that's why the meditation practice is a big part of it. And then the second practice that's good is to build their levels of expression. We have them focus on how authentic they actually are. Mm -hmm. So a simple journaling practice anyone can do is at the end of the day, you go from one to 10, how authentic was I today? And mm -hmm. then you ask yourself, how did I censor myself today? And you, you reflect back into some situations where maybe you wanted to say something, but instead of saying that, you said something different to manage expectations of other people. Mm -hmm. And then you go, what was I trying to avoid by doing that? What was the pain I was running away from? So that you feel what's motivating you to censor yourself. But the powerful part comes when you go, what did I miss out on mm -hmm. by censoring myself? So an example could be, right, if I saw a girl I wanted to speak to at the coffee shop, common situation for guys. How did you censor yourself? Well, you didn't speak to her instead of speaking to her. Yeah. And what were you trying to avoid? Potential rejection, maybe people looking at you, maybe feelings of insecurity that could have arisen. And what did you miss out on? Maybe that was your future girlfriend. Maybe you could have gone on an amazing date. Maybe she would have had a good conversation with you and recommended you a nice restaurant, a nice coffee shop. Maybe she's in a relationship, but she has a friend and she thinks you're cool so she can hook you up. <laughs> so when, when we have guys shift their attention to what they're missing out on by not being authentic, mm -hmm. because a lot of the time we look at like, how am I protecting myself by not saying something? But we're not looking at, wait, what am I missing out on by not approaching that girl? So when that attention shifts, we see that people slowly become more and more authentic in their conversations because they can see how they're screwing themselves over yeah. by hiding from the world. And that definitely happens a lot with guys because I think they fear mm -hmm. being their their true selves because there's going to be a rejection of some kind, which, you know, that can stem from childhood. They got, you know, a lot of us yeah. get teased in middle school and high school. And then that still carries over into our adult years as if we're going to still get that kind of reaction from people. But like the, the idea of dating authentically, like what, what do you think that mm -hmm. means? And then how do you get guys to be more comfortable being that authentic person? Mm -hmm. I think the idea of dating authentically is sharing your world without trying to impress other people, but also keeping like, almost leading with vulnerability, but relaxing into that vulnerability. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying go on a first date and talk about your life problems and expect a woman to be a therapist. That's a terrible dating strategy. Terrible, terrible strategy, yes. <laughs> no, definitely don't do that. But what I am saying is get comfortable sharing parts of yourself that you may not conventionally see as attractive. So an example of that is when I was a, when I was in high school, I had a big crush on Taylor Swift and she was the girl for me. That's when she played like some country music and it was yeah. a lot more wholesome compared to what, what she does these days. Yeah. And for a long time, especially being a dating coach, I was like, oh, I can't share this with women. It's a bit of a loser period of my life that I don't want to remember. So I disowned that part of me until one day. I was like, you know what, Let, let's just start expressing and see what happens. And what I realized was when I expressed that and I relaxed that tension I felt when I expressed it, because I was like, I don't know how they're going to react to this. Mm. It actually made me more in touch with myself. So the way to heal parts of ourselves that we don't feel as comfortable with is almost like sharing that in the right context with the right levels of intimacy and then feeling the tension and letting that tension know, Hey, I love you too. You know, I'm here for you. And the more we do that, the more our energy expands. So because 
we're loving more and more parts of ourselves. Now we don't have as many parts of ourselves that we need to hide anymore. And I think people feel that when you communicate with them, when you're around someone who's really comfortable with who they are and they're not trying to be someone else. So that's what we focus on with clients. How can they build a relationship with themselves mm -hmm. that's truly loving, compassionate, but also they're still pushing themselves. Like a lot of people think, oh, uh, you're being loving and compassionate, but that's just weak and a simp move. But it's really not. It's about you being the biggest ally for yourself because mm. the, the only relationship we have for our whole lives is the relationship we have with our mind. So why have that as an abusive relationship? Right. As a relationship where we always have to push through. So we build that more loving relationship with our mind. Mm -hmm. And then as we communicate from that place with the rest of the world, now we can see how impersonal things are because the default response used to be for me, like, Hey, if this person is not paying attention, it's because they don't like me, but there can be a hundred different reasons why they're not paying attention. Yep. So, that's to me what it means to be authentic, to build that strong relationship with yourself and getting more and more comfortable expressing mm. parts of yourself that you may think is a bit more controversial, that you might have insecurities around and then relaxing those insecurities. Okay. I also wanted to ask, uh, right. in terms of, auth well, in terms of authenticity and let's say, but also like, you know, a lot of guys go up and they develop, you know, bad dating habits, like say they're yeah. texting a woman too much or calling all the time or being overly needy with their emotions and feelings. And sometimes in the process of trying to help a guy, like part of that is telling them like, Hey, like these are things that these are reasons why these things turn women off, or whatever like that. And sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm telling guys that the response I get is like, you know, for example, if I'm not texting all the time, that's not me being authentic. So how do you mm. get a guy out of doing bad habits that for in the moment him doing those things are authentic, but aren't helping his cause while being able to help him see that by building these newer habits, then you'll be authentic, but in a way that's more effective. Right. Yeah. That's a great question as well. I think at the beginnings, part of that authenticity is the trust that they, they put in you as their mentor. So, you know, if a guy is texting too much and he's like, yeah, it's authentic to me to write a girl a poem after our first date with three pages of just poetry. I'm like, maybe, maybe let's not do that, you know? So I think the, the difference comes from the calibration. And especially when a guy is building that for himself, this is why it's so good to work with a mentor. Because if you work with a mentor and you have a coach, then the first thing you're doing is, hey, I'm paying this person money because I, I accept that they know more than me in this area. Mm -hmm. That's not to say we're better people than them. Right. You know, we all, we all have our own drawbacks and our own weaknesses and all that. But I think for guys who are like, oh, yeah, this is authentic to me. If you're working with someone, hey, they're, you're paying them because they know better than you in this arena. So part of the authenticity is being able to drop the ego mm -hmm. and taking in that feedback and going, you know what? I may not understand why this person's telling me, hey, don't text all the time, even if it's authentic. But because they're my mentor, I'm going to follow their advice. And I think there's a lot of experimentation at the beginning. And certain things, guy guys feel like oh this is authentic to me it's not that it's authentic it's just what they're used to doing yeah true it was like like i said we, we learn a lot of uh bad habits we get influenced by media to do certain things and it ends up being like oh that isn't actually a it's not what women want and also it's not actually effective for us to get the kind of relationship we want in the first place yeah like texting a girl all the time if you're a guy on his mission and you have things to do even if it's authentic, you're not going to keep that up in two, three months. Yeah. So it's not really authentic. It's just guys make this like amazing expression at the beginning. And our brain's very good at backwards rationalizing our behavior. So we want to say like, oh, but it's just authentic to me because mm -hmm. it's more difficult to accept 
hey, actually, I'm texting this much because I'm scared that if I don't, she's going to disappear. Now, we, you yeah. talked earlier about uh, having self-awareness. How can men develop a better self-awareness in the dating mm -hmm. room, whether it's about, you know, being able to read the interaction or, or the, the reactions women's having to them or, or being able to be self-analytical about maybe some of the things that they're doing that aren't actually helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think when it comes to being self-aware, I'm a big proponent that in the moment, just let go. Don't analyze the night as it's happening. Instead, when you go home or the next morning, look back at what happened. Mm -hmm. So with my with my clients, I'll tell them, hey, look, let's say you're going to an event or you're going to a bar with the intention of meeting women and being social. In that moment, don't go back into your head. You know, mm -hmm. if you're having a conversation, just have a conversation. But when you come back, don't go, okay, two things I did well in that conversation and then two things I could do better in that conversation because that puts them back into the analytical mind. Mm. When it comes to being social, the state you're in is extremely important. So if you're in this playful state, but then you come back and you go back to the analytical state, next conversation you, ha you have, you're going to need to step out of the analytical state again rather than if you're just focused on what you're doing, then you can ride that playful state. You know, I'm sure you've had a night where you had one conversation and another conversation. And then three hours later, you're like, how did I meet all these people? I don't remember. And we want guys to experience that, but they cannot experience that if they're always reflecting in the moment. Right. So what I recommend is have those experiences when you go out and then the next morning, really reflect, okay, what did I do well tonight or mm. yesterday night? What are two things I could do better for next time? How did I feel during this experience? Having a bigger focus on feeling what they feel, but right. also how did people around me feel? Which is a very important question. Mm. And then asking themselves, was I authentic during this time? And if not, in what ways was I not as authentic as I could be? And then the last question we always have is, what am I going to do differently for next time? Right. So the focus is always on one thing at a time rather than 20 things to fix on one night. And if it doesn't happen, the world is over. Right. So they're still being analytical, but it's, it's very focused analyzation at a very specific yeah. time. It's like when you're in the moment, because I know in the moment, it's like we're trying to be very logical. But a lot of the stuff in those moments is more about like following your instincts, your emotions, your intuition. Um, and speaking of mm -hmm. that, like how can men that are analytical strike a balance between using their logic and being analytical and being using more of their intuition when it comes to like dating and relationships? Yeah, that's. That's a very good question. So I'd say when it comes to who you pick to date, then it's it's good to be very analytical and not just think with your brain downstairs and actually look at the woman and look at how she's adding to your life. Because mm. I think in that sense, a lot of men don't pick the relationships they get into. They just settle into relationships with women who they kind of like were friends with and something happened one night and now they're together. Mm -hmm. Although yeah. this may not have been what they wanted to be in. So I think the analysis and the logic comes from creating that higher level perspective for your life and looking at how am I doing in my health? How am I doing in my career? How am I doing with my overall well-being? And almost mapping out this ideal version of you and then a big part of that is your relationships and specifically your relationships with women. So that when it comes to the present moment, when you're interacting with women, mm. that's when intuition plays a big role. And a big part of the work we do with clients is helping them step out of their head in that mm. present moment and get more into their body. So looking at what are they tensing up in their body when they're speaking to women? Because mm -hmm. usually a thought is accompanied by a feeling in the body, like your chest contracts or your shoulders are like very tight. And 
as guys get to relax that, then whatever relationship they build, it becomes stronger. So it's not that analytical guys don't have a relationship with their intuition. Right. It's that they haven't consciously built it because their profession also relies on logic and al- analysis. Mm. If you speak to someone who's a dancer, like who dances salsa or bachata, if you look at like a basketball player, their intuition can be very strong because what they practice for a long time is that fast twitch muscle of like, hey, I'm, I cannot overanalyze shooting this three. I'm open now and then 0.5 seconds later, I'm not going to be. So I better mm-hmm. shoot it. So it's finding that balance by allowing them to build that muscle stronger um, and then using the logic to create that higher level picture for who mm-hmm. they want to be. Interesting. Interesting. That's so true. Cause like, even like to your, to, with your examples, it's like, there was a point in time when those people had to be analytical about the stuff, but then mm-hmm. they eventually got over to where they could like do it with uh, intuition based mm-hmm. on them having the skill set that they built up through years of analyzing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning, there's definitely going to be more analysis within the process. I think even then though, only this is something very important. Only analyze situations you're actually in. Like if you are struggling to approach woman, there's no point on you watching a video about how do I juggle three girlfriends all at the same time? You're not there yet, bro. You're not there yet. <laughs> approach some woman first. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I got a lot of people watch my videos and they'll comment like, you know, oh yeah, but then these girls do this, this, and that. It's like, have you ever actually been in that situation? Like, yeah, that's a great I don't, question. I don't talk about like, I don't talk about threesomes. Cause I've never had one. So why would I bring that to the channel? Like I, I don't, I don't yeah. do that kind of thing, but to act like I did or that I know all about it. It's like, what are we talking about? Yeah, exactly. A lot of the time, like guys in the comments are like, Hey, Ege, can you make a video about this? I'm like, how does this relate to your personal life? And they're like, it doesn't. I just think it would be cool. But then that's not very helpful. So when when we can reduce our analysis into just what's going on in our lives, mm. then there's actually not much to analyze. Like if every guy listening to the podcast looks at, okay, what is the one problem I have right now? Is it I'm not speaking to enough woman? Okay, what's your video about that? You watch one or two videos, found someone you resonate with, Okay, now go out and approach. Don't watch a video on how to have a conversation. Don't watch a video on how to go on a date. Don't watch a video on how to get into a relationship Mm. if you're not there yet. Yeah, it's so true. Um, Last question. uh, For for those guys Mm. that are analytical, obviously we've we've talked a lot about how guys get in their heads about things and how they need to kind of like move towards their intuition. But like, what's what's a positive benefit for somebody that's analytical in what ways can that be used in a positive way to actually help them towards getting the results they eventually want yeah i think the common theme with analytical guys is they're very quick and smart with figuring out patterns so once things click for them once women start to make sense then they can become very innovative and they're like oh i see it now it's almost a switch that clicks at some point where now they're completely self-reliant. And I think that's the benefit of being very analytical, but also, you know, most analytical guys are also highly intelligent. That's why they see, okay, this is something I, I like to fix. And I think the good thing about being analytical is when you do experience that further stages of a relationship, women really love you for it. Like if they have a problem, you have a great solution for it. They love how you think. You know, you can think in ways that's outside the box and women value intelligence and your ability to fix problems. So I think it's important for men to realize being analytical is not all bad. It it just means in earlier parts of the dating process, you might experience a bit more problems, but in later parts, it can also be a strength. And in some situations, it served you very, very well. Like if you're a software engineer, if you weren't analytical, you wouldn't be making that money. You wouldn't be at that company with all these benefits. So I think for men, it's very important to feel gratitude for the cards that they're dealt with instead of trying to be like, 
oh, I wish I wasn't analytical like this. I wish I was like this person who can just go for it and take action because for all you know, they're struggling in a different part of their lives. Yep. Like they might be taking action, but in the 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 consequence of that, they're not they're not taking enough time to think about. But like, if, if exactly. I take this action, what's what's going to happen? Versus, you know, analytical guys might need to move a little bit faster, but at least they're they're looking out the pros and cons of stuff. Yeah, and they can see when they do take action, like why did this work? Because they're analytical, their mind is used to being like, okay, this worked, but why did it work? Mm. And then once they make that conclusion, they're like, oh. That's why it worked. Oh, I get it now. And then their growth is just exponential. Excellent. Well, Ege, this has been a great conversation. Please let the people know where they can find your website, your YouTube channel, all that great stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Yeah, it's been it's been a great conversation. In terms of, I guess, following me on social media, on Facebook, it's Ege Reynolds, Instagram at Real Charming Man. And then our YouTube is The Charming Man. If you want to get in touch, you know, under any YouTube video, there's a link to book a call or on Facebook or Instagram. You could just send me a message there. Thanks for having me on, bro. It's been a great conversation and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, no problem, man. For the rest of you guys, be sure to check out his YouTube page. He's got some great videos on there as well. And uh, yeah, see if you can sign up for him for some coaching as well. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, For the rest of you guys, we will catch you guys on the next episode. We are out. Peace. What up, IDS Mob? Welcome to the Introvert Dating Success Show, Saturday edition. I'm your host, as always, Harry Wilmington. This is the show where you go to learn how to date as your introvert itself while still getting your precious alone time. We do these shows every Saturday and every Tuesday at 5 p.m. I'm trying to keep this on a regular schedule of doing it on Saturdays in the afternoon, but uh, we had some schedule stuff today, and I said, you know what? I'll do a nighttime show instead. I, I don't know who all's at home on Saturdays watching this, but if you're home watching it, thank you. So today, or tonight rather, I want to talk about how treating dating like sales is going to improve your success with women. I think a major problem that men have in general when it comes to dating is that we fall for the lie that we need to be as emotionally invested as women are when it comes to the dating process. And unfortunately, Guy, our emotions are going to tend to trip us up and cause us to not really go forth in dating in a way that's going to actually be uh, satisfying to the woman overall when we try to let emotions run the show. Like guys will get hung up and be like, you know, oh, well, I want to be able to tell her feelings and I want to be able to, you know, do these expensive trips for her right away. And the reality is that if you don't, as a guy, know or understand how to do dating effectively, then you're going to take whatever the world is throwing at you and think, this is what I need to do as a guy. And then you're going to have a, a lack of success. And this is me speaking to you all as a guy who in his past very much did not have a roadmap or a plan of action on dating. And as a result of that, I was very emotional. I was writing all these kinds of poems to women and buying them whatever they wanted and all sorts of stuff. And they would leave me for a guy that was doing little to none of the stuff that I was doing. But where was I tripping up? Well, I truly believe that as a guy, it's a lot easier to take your emotions out of the dating equation if you're able to parallel what dating should be like with something else in the world that you've actually seen proven examples of. And so for me, how I started to get great at dating was there was a guy named Doc Love who deceased in 2020, and he was the first guy that did a parallel of how dating had a lot of similarities to sales. And at first I was like, Probably like you guys, like that seems very unromantic and not a good thing at all. But as I start to look at some of the things that he was talking about and then just things that I developed and started to learn in my own life as a result of my successes in dating, I realized, oh, my God, like sales and dating have a lot in common, especially when I started actually doing sales like I sold vacuum cleaners i've sold knives i've been I, i did i dabbed a little bit in trying to do insurance for a bit but that didn't go whatever but through doing those jobs I was able to see what Doc Love was talking about. Like, oh, this thing in the sales process is very parallel to this thing in the dating world. And it actually helped me to not be so emotional when a woman was either saying yes to a date with me or saying no. 
because I would just treat them like a potential sales prospect. Like, oh, I'm going to present the best product, and which is me, and see if they want it. And I had to learn over time how to do that in a way that more often than not would get me the results that I wanted. So we're going to talk about that tonight. I also, as always, this show is ultimately about you guys. And so if you have any questions you want to ask me during the course of the show, as it pertains to something happening in your dating life, as it pertains to the subject to hand or just anything in general, you are welcome to ask me your question and I will happily answer it during the course of the show. All right. So we're getting to all that wonderful stuff today, but this is the introvert dating success show. Let's get it. It's the introvert dating success podcast. The show for introverted men that's all about learning how to attract beautiful women and still get your precious alone time. And now, here's your host, dating coach and fellow introvert, Harry Wilmington. All right, guys, we're going to get into it. And as always, if you need help in your dating life, and you want somebody that's going to help you walk through that journey, you can go to introvertdatingsuccess.com and sign up for my Introvert Dating Success Coaching Academy. It is a 12-week transformational academy that is designed to help you figure out the various things that are holding you back from dating. We talk about everything from how to do online dating, how to get rid of any kind of angst, anxiety, how to make you a more confident person, and tons of other stuff. We show you a blueprint roadmap on how to actually get through the attraction process for women so you'll get more dates, you'll ideally get into more relationships, and you will be a more confident man overall. Again, you can check that out at the introvertdatingsuccess.com website, all right? And so with that said, we're gonna go ahead and get into... Before we get into the main subject, there was a guy that had commented on a video of mine earlier today, and I liked part of what he had to say, and then he had questions about something else that I had said, and I told him on this show that I would answer his question, and so I'm a man of my word, at least I try to be, because sometimes I forget, so since I'm rumoring it now, I'm going to uh, answer his question first, and then we'll get into the main topic, all right? And again, if you guys have any questions during the course of the show, you can leave them in the comments box, and I will be happy to get to them. So. With that said, so I got an interesting comment under a video that I made, and the video that I made was called Exclusive Dating is Not a Thing. And in that video, I talk about how, you know, people, sometimes guys will try to be like, well, we're not together together, but we're like, we're exclusively dating. My my thought process is that until you guys are actually boyfriend and girlfriend, everything you're doing beforehand is just dating and figuring stuff out. Whether you choose to just date that person and nobody else is up to you, but you try to preemptively tie her down by saying to her, hey, we should just be exclusively dating and not seeing other people, that can make it feel like to her, it's not her choice to do that. And we want women of their own accord to come to you at the point that they're choosing you and say those kind of things. You you presenting it is rarely going to go the way you want it to go. So this guy left a comment and the comment he said was this. He said, that's quite decent and reasonable to me. Not sure if you just said this in a comment or the video too, though I somewhat disagree with one of your points, which is letting the woman, quote, come to you with the relationship talk. So what I always tell guys is that on average, it takes a woman two to three months to solidify her feelings as she's dating you. Once she's fully solidified her feelings, then the way you get into a relationship is you let her come to you and start saying things like, oh, so what are we? Hey, are you dating other people? Hey, so my girlfriends want to know like what our titles and stuff are. I've had women literally just say to me flat out, so like, are we going to be in a relationship or what? And so that's what you want. That's what I, that's what I stress to you guys. That's, that, that's the best way for you to get into a relationship that is guaranteed more often than not to not be broken up, at least on her end of things. So anyway, so he said, I'm not necessarily saying she shouldn't, vice versa or whatever. Though odds are she's getting advice to let the man bring it up first, which she likely probably prefers too. The biggest issue I think is when the guy just isn't the right match or plays his cards all wrong by doing things like asking to be exclusive or committed way and sometimes way, way too early. If he does things right and is even reasonably a good fit for her, then he may not have to have much to lose by asking uh, around the two to four month mark, I guess, to, to be in a relationship. I think if he solely puts it on her to ask, and she's especially more so wanting the guy to ask, he risked another guy doing so before him and that more or less making the difference, which if he's willing to take that risk, then that's on him. I think I just wouldn't make it a hard and fast rule either way, though, especially on the guy side. Well, I'll say this. So 
to the to the end sentence, I'll say that a lot of the advice that I give you guys, it's pure black and white. Like I either say yes, do this, or I say no, do, don't do that. I don't really. I don't like to live in the land of maybe. I don't like to live in the land of gray areas where, well, but sometimes this thing, and so well, what this and that, because I, I found that for me personally, living in the land of maybe and living in the land of gray areas and oh, but what if or, well, this person's different because X, Y, and Z usually resulted in me not getting the results that I wanted. Like, for example, to his point, there could be a woman out there that is like, well, my girlfriend said that the guy, if he wants you, is going to come to come to me and ask me for the relationship. There could be a woman out there that, is, is built that way and is waiting for the guy to come to her. And if he doesn't, then she's going to drop off the face of the planet, right? Those women could exist. But in my experience, I found that more often than not, when I wasn't the one going to them to ask for a relationship, they would come to me. And I found it was immensely easier and better for the relationship, a better indicator of her attraction for me if she was the one to come to me and ask those questions first, right? Now, I'm going to go back to his thing just a little bit to kind of clarify some points that he made, right? So he said, um, he said, the biggest issue is I think when guy it just isn't the right, the right match or plays his cards all wrong by doing things like asking to be exclusive or committed or committed way way too early. Uh, if he does, if he says, if he does things right and it's even reasonably a good fit for her, then he may not have much to lose by asking around the two to four month mark. So this is one of those things. And this is, I, I talk about this extensively on the show too. This is one of those things whereby I, I coach you guys based on the probability of you being able to get the outcome you want, right? So here again, we have two situations, right? On the one hand, you have it where the guy's saying, hey, around month two to four, you should go to her and potentially ask her for the relationship, no harm, no foul. We have to ask though, what is the probability of that being successful versus what is the probability of you waiting for her to come to you and asking for a relationship to be successful in getting into a relationship, right? So here are the things that that men don't oftentimes factor into that, right? So for one, as men, we typically fall for women a lot faster. Like most of you guys by date two or three, even maybe date one, you have a good conversation, a pleasant meal, and she hooks up with you. You're kind of like, I'm done. That's it. Whatever. So as men, we're already going to be designed to do a hyper-focused, quick analyzation of the woman we're dating. We're going to see she got great curves, smells good, laugh is nice, and she knows how to cook. I'm already good. I'm, I'm all in. Anything else she brings to the table later on, I can work with it, but I'm done, right? So we're going to make our decisions a lot faster. So here's the thing. Women need at minimum two months, but most of the time I find between two to three, maybe even stretch it to four months where they're going to be doing their due diligence. I did a show last week where I talked about what the attract. Oh, I did it on Tuesday. What the attraction process build looks like for women in terms of like how they start to develop feelings for you. Right. And so it's not one of these for them. Like they, they go on three dates and they've already made a decision. It can take time. And so here's the thing as a guy moving from dating one woman to the next, you're not going to know what timeline frame these women are on. I can tell you as a general average, it's going to be two to three months. I've had women come to me in the first 90 days and be like, hey, what's up? I've also had women that it took me about four months before they came to me and said, hey, Harry, what's up? But in, in all those cases, at the point where the women came to me, what information does that tell me? What it tells me is that she has done her full due diligence. She's done, been able to see the consistency in me, I've been able to give her a lot of good times, if you know what I mean, to where we built up consistent feelings. She can predict that like it's going to be a good time more often than not. She's been able to open up to me and see that I'm not going to judge her for a variety of things. And so at the point that she comes to me, whatever vetting process she has, she has closed that file. Yep. Based on the amount of time that I spent, I spent just enough time with him to be able to solidify in my head that this guy is a great guy. And now I want to be in a relationship. And for some women, it's going to be 90 days. For some women, it's going to be four months. And you are never going to know which one it is. So let's say you're dating a woman. And at the two month mark, you decide you're going to ask her for the relationship. And, and lo and behold, she's a woman that after 90 days was already ready for it. Well. That woman's going to be very happy you came to her and asked her, congratulations. But let's say that fizzles out. You date the next girl, right? The next girl, you come to her after a two-month mark, and you say, hey, I want to be in a relationship. And she's a woman 
that needed more time. She was she was uh, in a previous relationship where she got tricked over and she wants to t- do extra due diligence this time just to make sure that she's not missing any signs of things that she didn't see beforehand, right? And she's a woman that needs three and a half months before she would come to you and ask for a relationship. And you're at month two and you're thinking because it worked on the last girl, it's going to work on this girl. And now you go to her and say, I want a relationship. And she thinks, why is he rushing me? This is too soon. Oh my God. Like, uh, why is he asking me right now? Like we, we've had, we had a good thing going. I was starting to build stuff with them and now he's trying to ask for a relationship. And now she's thinking, man, if he's asked me for a relationship, he must be already head and heels in love with me. And I'm not there. Ah, I don't want to, fool him or drag him on or make him think that that if he's already there, that I'm never going to get there. But I don't want to keep doing this not because I'm not sure yet if I'm ever going to get there. So I'm out. And then so she leaves and you're like, what's going on? I thought things were going great, right? Versus if you did nothing, then you just kept showing up the way you were. You kept being consistent. Three and a half months in, hey, so it, I've been having a great time with you. Like, what what are we? which is, again, is the woman saying, I want a relationship, right? They're never going to come out fully and say, I want a relationship, but they're going to say things that indicate they're ready for that conversation. And then at that point, all you do is say, oh, we should talk about that. So on some level, it's almost like you're both bringing it up, but she's the one, again, in this scenario that I painted, right? You have two people, one that's like, um, you, go, you go to and ask for a relationship, one, one that doesn't. So now you're, this guy's thinking, okay, but like, like you said later, he says, what if, you don't come to her, and she's a woman that was is trained to, to believe that the guy's got to come to her and ask for a relationship. And this is what I want to stress to you guys, right? Is that at the end of the day, women are going to act on their emotions. So it doesn't matter what logical thing she had in her head about, well, logically, the guy should come to me and blah, blah, blah. Because for one, it's, it's, it's based on her emotion. She wants to feel as though she's needed and connected with you. And so if that means having to go to you to ask for that, then she will. And number two is that ultimately it, it speaks to their ego, right? Women, if you're dating them and they like you, they want to be chosen. They want to feel as though the guy wants a relationship. And so if a woman that has high interest in you and sees you as a viable candidate to date is continuing to see you and you're not the one reaching out to her, then there's going to be there's not going to be any of this like oh there's another guy in the background that's going to try to ask me for a relationship first no even if that's absolutely true she's going to be like yeah there's another guy asking me but I want to be with this guy so I'm going to let him know that there's a guy over here just to see if that now opens him up for the conversation but that move is still her saying there's a guy over here bro but you know whatever is saying I want a relationship with you first so you don't lose points I try to stress you guys you don't lose points if you don't go to her and ask for a relationship, but you have a higher probability of losing points and losing the girl if you go to her. And again, I wish it were different, uh, but I, as I, as life has taught me, I, the women that I have gone to first or early on to try to ask for a relationship, it usually fizzled out and I never saw them again. The women that I had high interest in them, they had a high interest in me, but I was able to just be patient and wait for them to be ready when they came to me, if they're if they're chasing you, they can't be replacing you. If they come to you and ask, what are we, blah, 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 they're asking for the relationship. They, they're not going to ask you for the relationship and then say, oh, but I don't want one because they're the ones coming to me. So that's why I say that it is better for you to wait. And the problem most guys have is that on some level, a lot of you guys feel as though if there's not a title that's out there, that you're going to lose her. You're not going to be able to lock her down. Like if you don't establish this thing as a relationship, then she, what, what if she has some other Chaz or Tyrones out there that are also chasing her? And to that, I say, you have to have more confidence that you have better game going on than Chad and Tyrone. Because let's say she is seeing you with two other dudes, right? I can assure you, if you're patient, what's going to happen is this, is those two other dudes by date three or four are going to try to ask her to be in a relationship and she's going to get freaked out by both those dudes. And then come two months in, she's going to be like, you know, those other two guys, I had a good time with them and, but they, they asked me way too soon, but it's like, I've been dating this guy for three months and I really like him, but he hasn't asked me. The next move is not going to be, well, I guess I got to walk away. Do, 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 do. No, the next move is going to be, you know what? I need to hint at him or let him know on some level that I want this to be a relationship. And she goes to you, hey, so are you seeing anybody else? So do you have any 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 other people you're talking to? Because I'm not talking to anybody else. And, you know, just I'm just curious, like, where your head's at. And, you know, where, where do you see this potential? They'll start 
asking those questions. And all you got to do as a guy is know how to respond when they ask those questions if you're interested. So if she comes to you month three, hey, so what are we? Now you know, oh crap, this is this is her. This is what Harry talked about. This is her saying she wants a relationship. And now I need to proceed accordingly in order to have that conversation. At that point, you you start, you play dumb initially. Like, what do you mean? Well, just because we've been dating for a couple of months and blah, 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 blah. Okay, interesting. So, uh, you're, so you're saying you want to be potentially in, in a relationship. Well, let's have that conversation. And then you go into negotiations. Now in the Introvert Dating Success Coaching Program, I go extensively into the kind of negotiation talk you need to have with a woman before you full out agree to a relationship. But I will say this, your immediate answer is not, yes, it's being in a relationship. You want to make sure that you're getting in a conversation that allows you to make sure that you're going to get out of this relationship what you want and that you know what her needs are, what your um, non-negotiables are, what your boundaries and stuff are. Like All these things are very important things to have before you outright say yes. But also having that conversation will let her know that you're not pressed and desperate for a relationship because i can guarantee you the majority of guys that she's dated have probably not sat her down and say and said to her what does having a relationship actually mean to you what does it entail what are you looking for right and so those are the guys that after two or three weeks of being in a relationship with the girl end up getting dumped because they didn't do their due diligence they didn't ask the right questions and they didn't sit her down to figure out what she actually needs out of this and if they could give it to her you be that guy that does that and I can assure you, you're going to have long lasting relationships. But oh yeah, so all that to say, in terms of this guy's worries about that, I totally get where you're coming from in terms of like wondering, well, if I don't ask her after two or three months, uh, what's going to happen? And what if she was told this is not? Her being told by other people, hey, the guy should come to you is not going to matter because if she has high interest, her emotions are going to push her to the edge of the earth to come to you and ask for that relationship. Again, I'm, I'm speaking from personal history and experience. I've seen it time and time again, all right? Now, if you have not seen that, what that means is you're probably a guy that has been doing too much action. You've been going to her, asking about feelings and telling her your feelings and trying to say, well, what are we? And when can we be in a relationship? It's been like a month and a half, what's going on? And that means you don't know the, the full on roadmap and blueprint of how attraction works for women, of how the buildup works for them, and during that during that two or three months, what things you should be doing and not doing in order to establish yourself as a guy that she's going to want. That's why I got a whole program called Introvert Dating Success Coaching Program, which not only walks you through that, but also helps you with any kind of blind spots that you may have that you're not seeing that we can work through so that way you'll have a better understanding of your reactions to things and why you feel anxious at times and how you can bypass that stuff to be able to effectively do the things you need to do to make sure that the women that you want are the ones that you get. You can check that out again at the website, introvertdatingsuccess.com. All right. So with that said, before we get to the main crux of the show, I, I usually have water here and I forgot to get water because I was rushing to start the show. So I'm going to get some water while you guys watch uh, this video right here. Hey guys, Harry Womanson here. And I just want to tell you really quickly about some of the awesome eBooks that I have available at the website. So to start off with, we have my brand new book, Stop Losing Women, which is based off of my previous podcast. And it's over 284 pages of life changing advice for your dating life. You're going to discover in the span of these pages, the ins and outs of how to become more confident, the do's and don'ts of how to attract women, how to pace yourself during the dating process, and ultimately what it truly takes for you to be a more confident dater so that way you can get out there, attract women, and more importantly, stop losing women, okay? Uh, the other ebook that I have on my website is called No Girls For You, The Ultimate Guide to Losing the Girl of Your Dreams. This is the first book that I ever wrote. And simply put, it is a 12 chapter masterpiece that is designed to, in a very funny way, mind you, uh, guide you through the ins and outs of why all the things you're trying to do right now to attract women can actually cause you to lose them. I mean, things like being the nice guy, uh, overextending yourself, getting too many gifts, too many compliments, and a variety of other things that you may think as a guy I should be doing. This funny book's gonna help you figure out once for all why you should not do those things and how to better yourself instead. So be sure to check that book out as well. Uh, the other book that's been very popular at my website is called Texting Like a Boss. This is where, for all you guys out there that have problems texting women or don't understand why she starts off so chummy in the terms of the texting things and then she starts to kind of go away and you can't figure out what's going on or why, or you're not an efficient enough texter to be able to actually get dates by way of texting, well, this book is gonna give you 21 do's and don'ts that are tried, true, and tested so that way you can get the results that you want with women when you're texting them 
and ultimately not do the wrong things that are going to cause her to eventually ghost you in the texting room. All right. So check that book out at the website. Lastly, my my other popular book that I have there is called 10 Steps to Winning Back Your Ex, the step-by-step, no-nonsense guide to reconnecting with an old flame regardless of who ended the relationship. And so for you guys that are like, hey, I think I lost a great one and she, she left me and I want to get her back. Or you might have been the guy that's like, hey, I dumped her and then I realized I made a mistake and I want to get her back. Well, this book covers both of those scenarios in a very detailed step-by-step way that is designed to allow you to figure out what you did wrong, how you can show up better, and the sequence of events you need to go through in order to effectively win back the woman that you are no longer with. So if that's if these things sound like things that'll be helpful to you, then definitely go to introvertdatingsuccess.com, click on the products tab, where you can find a summary of all these books as well as my various programs, and they will be more than happy in helping you figure out whatever part of the dating journey you're on, so that way you will not be confused and you will ultimately be able to have the dating life that you want. So check those out at the website say all right we're back uh one other thing too i actually have an album out too as well so i did an album that i put out last year called kevin samuels was right uh you're gonna see a music video for one of those songs at the end of this show but like it's a it's a jam-packed album of 10 songs that use some of the quotes that kevin said as album titles and then it's just songs that are pretty funny and poignant about relationships and dating and stuff like that so you check that out it's on spotify now it's on apple music so you can check that out. I was trying to find a link to it, but I forget where the link is. So I'll have to figure that out. But anyway, so back to the show. Uh, let's see. Before we get into the main topic, I have a question in the chat. Uh, it's a very simple question, but okay. So the question in the chat goes, uh, what happens when text conversations aren't as good? Well, my ultimate response is that you should not be having a lot of text conversations I typically tend to save my texting for when I'm asking for dates and nothing more. And that even goes into when I'm in a relationship. Like I'll use texting to set up plans. If the woman that I'm dating at that point wants to send me emojis or memes or whatever like that, then that's fine. I'll sporadically send those here and there, but I'm more concerned about conversations in person. Like I really, I really try to stress to you guys how important it is to make yourself scarce when you're not in front of her face. Like even let's say you met a woman on a dating app where initially by default of it being an app, you got to message her because you're trying to, you know, make sure that she feels you out enough to want to at least have an in-person date. At the point that you two have an in-person date, your level of texting should really die down because at that point, she's willing to see you in person, which means she's going to spend more energy on you, getting to know you, hearing from you, all this other stuff when you're in person. And so when she's away from you, what we want her doing is thinking about you and pondering when you're going to contact her again and talking to her girlfriends and her mom and her family about you and the date that you guys went on. And, you know, they're going to spend time. I did a, I did a video on Tuesday where I showed a girl doing this where like the girls will be like, you know, going over every little bit of thing that you said on the date and what you wore and how she made how, how you made her feel and just analyzing. And women need that exercise to happen in order to convince their brains that they're feeling things for you because women's are feelings based, right? So when you're not there and she's talking about you and wondering when you're going to call again, what that's feeding to her emotional brain is you keep talking about him. You keep wanting him to call you. You must really, you must really like him if that's the way you're feeling about it right now. And so when you're nonstop texting, you cut off her ability to feel those things. And that that's why you'll start to see women start to ghost. Like guys think, I've had so many men comment on my my pull away test video about how a woman pulls away, blah, blah, blah. Have you considered that the reason women are pulling away over time is because they need to hear from you less in order to feel more for you and you're not allowing that. So she has to make that happen. Like guys don't consider that, right? I've had it before where I'd be texting women nonstop and then she'd start to slow down. And then I gave her like two or three days of not texting. Boom, she starts texting back at the same level she was before. Why is that? Because she had three days to feel what it would be like without me being there. So I say to guys, if you would just start off by doing that, you would find that women will go out with you and say yes to to dates a lot faster. They will hook up with you a lot faster because everything becomes their choice versus when you're texting them all the time, they're feeling forced to have interaction with you. You're forcing them to have to think about you when you're not letting it be kept to when they want to do it, right? So all that to say, yeah, Texting conversation should be dying down and you should only be doing it to get dates. If you're doing more than that, that's about 97% of the problems that you're having in terms of like 
being able to keep these girls long term. You know, and that, I learned that the hard way. So I, I only tell you guys stuff that I trust me. If you're asking that question, I have gone through the ringer of trying to text all the time and seeing the results of that. I'm 42. I've had more than enough experience to know that all this texting you're trying to do is not a good idea. You know, uh, he says, uh, example, I sent her a few messages one night asking how her week was, uh, how her week was was going. We had a few exchanges, but she responded 24 hours later with a few words. You know why that is? Because and this is the this is by the way, if you ask women this stuff that I'm telling you, they will fight you tooth and nail and say it is absolutely not true. I don't care about what women are telling me. I care about the results they're giving me. And so I have found doing this exact thing, thinking I'm going to text in the middle of the week because women like uh, women bond quicker with through communication. And so if I communicate with her all the time and ask how she's doing, then she want to respond back. Do 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 do. Hey, how was your week? What's going on? Gorgeous. What's going on? beautiful? Crickets or a, a, a slow slide into like one or two word answers versus if you just save that question for the date, then you get her on a date and then you ask her how your week was. And, and here's the thing too, for women asking that question is now a 20 minute conversation. So when you ask her how her week was, she knows if you want a good conversation out of that, that her trying to text you her answer is not going to cut it because she also needs to feel satisfied about the answer she's giving you, which is probably going to be very, very detailed and full of like side characters and plot twists. And that's a lot to have to ask a woman to do over text. But you can ask it in person. And now it's a jovial conversation. She can give you impressions of things and tell you the, the things that, that that would take too long to do over text, you know. So this is where I say guys fall for the lie that they got to build rapport. They got to ask women as soon as uh, so many guys, as soon as they meet a girl on a dating app or go on one date, they're doing every morning, good morning text and good night text. And how was your day text? None of these texts are necessary. And women don't actually need it from you in order to build attraction. What they need is time away from you so they can miss you and anticipate the next interaction they're going to have with you. When you do all this texting, you know what happens? 24 hours of silence because now she's not anticipating hearing from you. She's like, oh, he's going to keep texting me. Well, I'll get back to him anytime. And that is not a man that she's going to ultimately have long-term satisfaction or feelings for. So, and again, I know I'm coming from like, I always feel like I'm coming from like the later stages of dating. Like I've been through this stuff. So I can tell you on my side of things, hey, all this testing isn't necessary. All I'm, all, all I'm telling you to do is try it out. Try not the next, either this girl or the next girl you talk to, try leaving texting specifically and only for when you're setting up a date and see what's happening. Because if you're losing out by texting him all the time, the worst thing that'll happen when you're not texting him all the time is you'll lose out again. But going with probability, I have found you stand a better chance of keeping a woman's interest in you a lot longer and making it feel a lot stronger if you are not the one that is constantly reaching out to them. Again, if she's chasing you, she can't be replacing you. But if you, by way of texting, feel makes it feel to her like you're chasing her, then she's going to lose interest a lot faster. And I've been able to turn this kind of situation around. I've had women that I text that were like, they didn't respond back for like, an, like two or three days. And I had to finally just stop texting them. And then they come right back. So you don't lose points again for slowing down your texting. It, at worst, I found women will be like, hey, so I know she don't text me a whole lot, blah, 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 blah. One, that lets me know that she really likes me because she wouldn't be saying this otherwise. And then B, I just say, ultimately, I'm the one that set the parameters for this. I'll just be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I really like talking to you. But I just find that I always say this. I say, I find that I really like to save most of my conversation in person. And I don't like to, I don't want to unintentionally say something over text that gets misinterpreted that won't be misinterpreted if I say it with a certain inflection tone or whatever. So that doesn't mean, I, mean, I always tell women, I say, hey, anytime you want to reach out to me, I'll be more than happy to respond back. And, but, and, and I'm still going to be asking you out, but just, I just don't text that much. Like, and again, I can say that I can totally be like, I'm not a big texter, but I still want to see you. If they feel some kind of way about that, that's on them, not on me. But I find women, women are great at being able to go with your program. If you set up your program the right way early on. So because I start out not texting a whole lot, women that I'm dating never expect me to text a whole lot. But if you start off by texting a whole lot and then you try to slow it down on your end of things, because women are looking for consistency from you, that's not a consistent action. Now it looks suspicious. So if you don't text all that much in the beginning, you can never be accused of that. Again, just things I picked up along the way, you know. Uh, he says, is bad text conversations an indicator of no compatibility or just bad communication? No, bad texting conversations are indicative of you as a guy thinking that texting conversations are a barometer for how much she feels for you. And it is not. 
I dated women that barely texted me at all and actually would only respond when I was asking for dates. Because again, I'm not a big texter. They might not be big texters. Most women I find don't actually want to text a whole lot. Like when they like a guy, they would rather sit there and think about how great you are versus you trying to send these little silly texts that in her head, it honestly starts to feminize you a little bit. Like you texting is a way of saying, please respond to me so I feel approval. And that turns women off. Again, I'm, I'm just speaking from experience, right? So that's why I'm saying it's not a matter of, are they a bad or good communicator? It's a matter of, look at this, right? How is she talking to you in person versus on the phone? Because all I care about more often than not is how good are we connecting in person? So if you're judging her based on how bad her texting is, but in person, she's saying all the things, she's laughing at all your jokes, she's you know praising you and all this other stuff, I'm going with that because that's her. She's saying a lot more words in person than she's ever going to get to say on text. But so many guys have become dependent on if I'm not getting a text from her all the time, or if she's not, you know, if she's sending like not sending me more than three words of an answer, then oh my God, this is not going somewhere. Dude, at the end of the day, most women are not actually trying to be on the phone to talk to you. Like that, that's the real lesson here, right? And again, if you ask women, they will fight you on it. I have yet to lose out to a woman because I was not texting her a whole lot. Like, unless unless it was a woman that was like, had an anxious attachment style or is hella needy, in which case we're not gonna be a good fit anyway. I'm an introvert, I need my alone time, I don't need you. I, the few the few times that I dated women that, that were the opposite, where they wanted to text me all the time, what would happen is they would be texting me and then I would be the one where like, I'm trying to stop the conversation, I'm trying to go play a video game, hang with my friends, and then they're texting me, hello, hey, what's going on to them? I'm sure I had a bad communication style, but they were over texting and it got annoying. And at that point I was like, oh, this must be what women go through. When they're like, I like the guy, but dang, I gotta hear from him all the time. And that's a hard thing for guys to get. It's like, how could she not wanna hear from us, but still like us? And the answer is her brain is wired to build feelings for you based on how she's feeling about you at any given time. When you are constantly texting her, she's feeling annoyed. Annoyed does not equate with her being attracted to you versus when you're not texting all the time, that equates with, oh my God, I think I miss this guy. I wanna see him, I must like him. She can connect the feeling of missing you to, therefore she must want you around more. So that's why you win and you get women faster when you're not texting them all the time. So yeah, if a woman's a bad communicator, what that should signal to you is you are actually being the bad communicator by texting her too much and you need to back off and save it for asking for dates. That's that's what really that, that, that amounts to, you know? So hopefully some of what I said has helped you out. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Somebody's trying to advertise my thing. I don't know what that's about. Okay. All right, so we got a question in the chat. The question goes, does it mean I'm doing something wrong or not interested if by three to four months she doesn't bring up the what are we talk? I don't know if you have answered that today or in a video. I'm late to the show. I have not. I've, I've literally have not answered that question. So I will go ahead and answer that question. So well, I, I tell you guys, on average, it takes two to three months. For some women, if they've gone through trauma, if they had you know an abusive ex in the past or had other various situations that you know resulted in them putting too much trust in men early on, then it could drag out to like four. I've I've seen no more than usually like five months. Um, but also, so that's one 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 thing, right? That's why I say it's not it's not a perfect system. I, I I'd say probability wise, the average is two to three months, right? But here's the thing also is that if if it's going beyond three or four months, you have to look at a few things. One, you honestly you have to look and see if like is she just using you for money and for for good dates, but not actually wanting to be with you. But you got to look at her 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 actions overall. Is she consistently complimenting you? Is she giving you hookups in the bedroom on a regular basis? Um, if that's the case, if that's if that's going well, then you have to look at like okay, how often are you guys seeing each other? I have found usually when women are hesitant to come to you for that, then it could mean that you're seeing her too much. If you're if you're seeing her three or four days out the week and you've been doing that for like the last three or four months, that's probably way too much time spent together. Um, the other one, honestly, is that some women think like, some women just feel as though, like there doesn't need to be titles. Like they just think, well, we're hooking up and it's a good thing. And some women are scared by titles. Like, oh, if we, be, if we become boyfriend or girlfriend, now there's more responsibility and oh my God. And that could also speak to in the past when that happened, she had a bad experience. And so she's not hoping for that, right? So this is one of those things, this is like little advanced type stuff, right? But this is one of those things where if it's going four or five months, like say you get still, okay, three, four months, 
I'd say just give it a little more stretch of time. Again, it's not a perfect system, so it might have to stretch out to four months, right? If it gets to like month five and nothing's happening, that would be a point where if you're still wanting a relationship, then there's ways to bring up those kind of conversations without you directly saying like, we need to be a relationship, what's going on, right? Like, for example, let's say like, you know, with these days, videos on TikTok, videos on YouTube are a great way to introduce topics, right? So there's plenty of, plenty of videos on there. You could type in like, you know, oh, uh, a girl or guy won't ask dude to, for a relationship after X amount of time, right? So you can find one of those videos on TikTok and then be like, hey, I came across this video, like, and it'll be a video of like this, this girl saying, it's been like five months and we're not in a relationship, blah, 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 blah. And then you say like, yeah, I thought that'd be an interesting video. Like, what were your thoughts on that? Boom. Now she can, now, now because it's not being directly at her, you're, you're using, in this case, you're talking in a woman's passive language, which you're saying, hey, this is these people's situation where it's been four or five months and they didn't have a title. Like, what do you think about titles? Like, do you think that's like a really important thing? In a, like, if people are dating, does that need to come to that at some point? Like, what are your thoughts about that? And then you can hear her out and see what she has to say about that. Like, oh, well, you know, I think, you know, people have been dating for, for, for a bit of time, then they should consider titles. Oh, so how long would that be for you? Boom. Oh, well, maybe like four or five months, maybe like, oh, okay, cool. And then you leave it alone. And then four or five months comes, see what happens. And if it's still, she doesn't come to you, at that point, you got a couple of decisions to make. Either A, you can just keep going as is. Also, you know what I found too sometimes is that sometimes if, if a woman has been with you that long, and again, this is, you got to look at each woman different, right? If, she, if it's a situation where she's doing all the right things, she's, you know, again, regular bedroom action. She's regularly going on dates. She never flakes on anything. She's done much of friends at this point, and they all like whatever. Like it could be one of those things where, because she already feels as though it's it feels like a relationship that she's like, why call it anything? Like I've I've had it where like I've dated people where it's just like it, it kind of felt like we knew each other for a while. We were clearly, clearly doing all the things, and we just never had that official conversation. It just kind of became like we just kind of knew like oh this is like it is what it is, right? And so it could be that situation also where she didn't think she had to bring it up because again. Even though, again, I, I teach you guys on averages and probability. So while the majority of women will come to you to ask for a relationship, not all of them will. So th this could be, this could be an outlier situation. And that does pop up. I don't like to teach outliers because I don't want to give guys false hope that they're going to be the outlier situation. So that's why I say this is like general advice that works overall and probability, stuff like that, right? But in your situation, I would say if it gets to month five, and she's doing all the things that are right, but just hasn't called to anything or come to you or that, about the situation, then you got to decide if you want to try to call it out and say, hey, so just so we're clear, like we're in something, right? Like th this is what we're doing. Or again, do the, the, the TikTok uh, YouTube video thing I just told you about and see if that's a way to introduce that conversation. All right. But like I said, on average, I found, again, for me, women typically come to me and ask that. The, the latest I've had is like three and a half months. So you're still taking the right path. In the meantime, you just keep being consistent. You keep asking her out once a week, showing up for her, all that stuff. You keep doing that part. As long as she's not continuing to reject that stuff and is still doing the things I talked about, then you're still good. It may be at this point that you want the title and it's just not being spoken. So that's something you got to come to terms with and figure out which one to do based on how you're feeling about that, you know? So hopefully that gives you a little help about that. Uh, let's see. Hold on a second here. All right. We got a question in the chat. And the question is, is there any advice for dating women attorneys with complicated schedules? I dated one and she had a lot of family abuse cases. And over time, she developed a fear of physical intimacy because of the things she saw. I had to end it. Now I'm dating a new attorney. <laughs> oh, man, you must have been in an attorney town of some kind. Callie's the same way. There's a lot of a lot of attorneys out here. Um, now I'm dating a new, well, also, also kudos to you guy for ending it because there are so many dudes that are write me and be like, well, you know, we're not hooking up, but I really like her. Would it be wrong of me to dump her? And my answer is always like, no, you want to hook up. She doesn't. Those are different. Those are different realities. And so you can feel empathy for her and still not want to stay with her. So I'm glad you're able to be like, I can find somebody else. This is what we call guys having an abundance mindset where it's like, you get the things you want, and if you don't, you know that there's somebody else out there. You don't ever want to force the person you're with to do things that they don't want to do. But if you want them done, and they're not from her, you can find somebody else. That is in your perfect right. You ain't got to stick with them just because they're a good person, like, but they don't want to do some of the things you want to do that are normal to a relationship. Get the freak out, you know? Anyway, he says he fears the same thing will come up. The situation will repeat itself. I feel women with careers like that absorb a lot of their work issues and bring it to their personal lives. I've seen it with doctors before and haven't learned to deal with it, LOL. So 
<laughs> so here's the thing. The reality is that lawyer that you dated previously was just one lawyer and that was just one woman and she had trauma. I can assure you as a guy that has dated lawyers, doctors, teachers, they are not all like that. And it, it just comes down to like conversations. This is also, but I also hope you're learning that this is also why you as a guy should also be vetting women for two to three months instead of falling head over heels after two or three dates. Because these are the kind of things that'll show up that if you're being patient and not being fully emotionally invested into the process, you'll be able to have an objective analytical mindset and be like, oh, I see this thing popping up again. I need to have a conversation about that. And then if the conversation goes badly, I got to get out. If it goes well, we'll adjust and figure out what to do. So I would say that ultimately you don't want to, you don't want to do what women do, which is like have baggage from a previous situation, drug over to a new person just because there's slight parallels. Like, oh, this one was a lawyer and other one's a lawyer. Oh my God. That'd be like if a woman was like, you know, oh, with the last guy that I hooked up with on a one night stand, he ended up abusing me. So no more one night stands. And then you come along, you're a nice guy and you're thinking everything's going great. And you're like, oh, if you wanted to do some stuff, you totally could. And then she's like, if he dares ask me for one night stand, I'm going to dump him. Like, I was just asking lady, like, if you didn't want, you would have said no, but no, you're going to be toxic. Like, don't. So, so it's, it's hard because our brain starts to, what our brain wants to do is keep us as safe as possible. And so what our brain's going to do is try to make connections to things that don't connect like, oh, lawyer and no sex. So that must be the connection. So this next lawyer is going to also want, no, don't do that. Like you, you trip yourself up every time and you'll end up losing out on great women that would have actually given you what you wanted off of the history of somebody else that's no longer there anymore, you know? So I would just say, don't like, don't buy into that thing that like, oh, all these female lawyers, again, I've dated plenty of freaky teachers, lawyers, doctors, all the other stuff, like they're out there. If you found the one that doesn't want to do that stuff, it is what it is. Now, in terms of the other stuff, in terms of the uh, aspect of their lives being busy and stuff like that, the reality is women that are in high powered jobs are going to be busy. They're going to be traveling. They're going to have meetings at times that go late that results in them being hella tired. You have to know going in that that's what you're signing up for. And if it so happens you can't handle that, then you don't want to stick there and continue with it as if you could handle it only to be bothered by it later. As a guy that's an introvert, if I'm dating somebody that is regularly traveling or not there, my typical response is like, fantastic. I like my alone time. I do find that in relationships, I like another person being around a lot more than when I'm, I'm single. But suffice to say that I sign up for, when, I, when I'm dating a person and I'm learning their jobs and what they do, I kind of know based on what their description is of how their job's going to be. I If I decide to date them, I can't get mad at them if their, their schedule ends up being the way that I, I thought it was going to be based on our conversations, right? So you just have to learn how to like maneuver around that in a way that's going to be suitable for you and for her. It's not going to be her fault that she gets called to stay late sometimes, but it's gonna happen. There's gonna be times where you're gonna plan a date and the last minute she's got a case going on that she's gotta go to and you're gonna be mad about it. But guess what? You can't let it bug you because you signed up for it, you know? So all we, all I care about in those, in those situations is, is the woman still trying to show effort that she still cares about me. If she's staying late to the thing, she's sending me a little text to say like, hey, just thinking about you, wish I, was, wish I could come home. Like for me, that's enough. She sent that, okay, great. Have a thing at the time, you know, if she's got to do a work dinner or she's got to travel out of state to go to some lawyer thing, just, hey, you know, hey, hey, see when you get back. No harm, no foul. I don't hold them against them. That is part of their job. And I knew that when I signed up. And I think so many guys get butt hurt by actions that women are doing that they knew the woman was going to do when they started dating her. So if that's the, the lane you're going, then you got to accept everything that comes with the lawyer lifestyle if you choose to date them. If not, find somebody that has a less paying job that's going to be around 24-7. You might need that, but ideally you would not because I know me personally, that would drive me freaking crazy, you know? So hopefully that helps you out. All right, so we're gonna get into the, the main topic of discussion real quick. Let me just get this water real quick, this delicious water. All right, so let's talk about how treating dating like sales will improve your success. So like I said before, guys, and any, guys, any questions you guys leave, I'll get to after this segment of the show. So Here's the problem that most guys have these days with dating is that they have bought into the lie that for, they bought into a few lies. Actually, a big lie that you guys have bought into is that women want a man that is emotional or as emotional as them. And so this is where we buy into the lie that we need to tell them our feelings and emote and text them all the time and all these other things that we don't need to do. All right. The other lie, though that's equally important is that 
if you are a man with a plan, if you're a man of that 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 has a systematic way of dating, that it's it's unromantic and therefore it's manipulative and therefore you're just trying to trick women into getting with you, right? But and that and, and a lot of that narrative and a lot of the things that we hear from that way come from women because on the women's side of things, and by the way, women can be as calculating. At, most women are more calculating in the dating world and in their romantic relationships than men are. Like women have figured out, for example, if I just say a certain thing or say like, oh my God, I, I wish I could get this blah, 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 blah. Oh, like they, they know how to, how to string us along with their tears and their perfumes and stuff to make us do darn near anything. The number of guys I see on, online, for example, that are like, will willingly just send women. Like they'll meet a woman on, on Facebook and be like, hey, I want to send you like a thousand dollars. Why? And, and all she had to do is with that little sob story, oh, boo-hoo, I wanted to get a dress, but I couldn't do it. Like, but anyway, not the point. So the point is, so, so men, though, we think that if we're logic and calculated in how we date, that it means that we're tricking women, we're manipulating them, and we're not making them do what they would actually do, but we're tricking them to do things that they wouldn't want to do as it pertains to dating us. And I've said on this show time and time again that women like to date a man who has a plan because the man that has a plan is saying to the woman subconsciously, I know how to handle you in a way that's going to keep you safe and protected. And I know this because I have these parameters that I put together that are going to allow you to have a good time, allow you to get to know me better and are going to make you feel like you're with a guy you can trust. Right. And so even though they won't say that out loud, subconsciously, that's how they take it. That's why players do so well. Like men think players are the bad guys. Players are dudes that know how to handle women, and women can tell, and that's why they keep sleeping with Chads and Tyrones instead of you. So one of the things that helped me early on in my dating life was when I, I started studying a guy named Doc Love, and then there was a guy named David D'Angelo, and there a bunch of other guys, right, that had processes in place. They had processes down about certain mechanics of the dating game working in a certain way, how they function, why they attract women, and then the steps you could do in order to make those things a reality. And I did them and they worked. But the big one for me at the time was Doc Love. When I was 21, um, in my in my late 20s, or, or late, in my 20th year of, of here, I don't know what I'm trying to say. The point is, when I was 20, about to turn 21, that's what I'm trying to say. There was a girl that I had a crush on uh, at my college and she had a crush on me. And so at some point, I started to realize that she was acting weird around me. And part of it was honestly because I was doing all the, the weird thing. Well, I was doing all the things that I wasn't noticing her signals to me. I wasn't noticing when she would invite me over to have a private study session. I wouldn't notice when she would cook for me. Like, none of the stuff retro in my head as a girl like me, right? So by the time I figured that out, my plan of action was, okay, I'm going to call her up and tell her I like her, and then we can start dating. So I called her up. Hey, so just want you to know that I like you. Her response. Yeah, I kind of figured that you liked me. Oh, uh, okay, great. Well, all right, cool. I'll, I'll see you in class tomorrow. And then for, for the rest of that, my junior year semester, uh, it was weird. Like, I, I tried to go around her. She wouldn't talk to me. I was trying to get her a gift for her birthday, and she wouldn't even open the door for me. It was a whole bunch of stuff, right? And so at that point, I'd gone 20 years now studying how to date. I've been studying these Christian dating books. I've been studying these, you know, how women take things. And all these books will tell you like, oh, women want, a guy, women want a guy that's sensitive and in tune with the emotions. And they don't want a guy that's going to try to just sleep with them and just use them for sex and blah, 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 blah. But all that stuff, right? And I found at the age of 20, it was not working. And at 21, I had a semester off from college because I, I got into this uh, live theater show where I'd be going up and down the, the coast and through Kansas and Nebraska and all this stuff in a van with six other dudes um, doing this tour, right? And that was when I started observing the guys that I was with, the, the ones that were straight. We'd go to clubs. I'd see them like getting women left and right. And they were doing all the things that I was told not to do. They were slapping girls on the butt and they were, you know, darn near neck hitting them and stuff. Like I was like, what is going on? So I started doing internet research because I was like, there's got to be something on the internet that's going to help me. And that's when I found Doc Love stuff. And the thing that he said that really solidified for me how dating should work was when he said that dating is very much like sales. And I was like, at the time, I'd never heard that before. Like, wait a minute. Like, how are sales and dating the same? Now, at the time, I had not done sales. So there were other things that he said that were helpful. But the sales part of it didn't really click until I started doing sales like two years later for my uncle. Oh, actually, sorry. It was that. It was later that summer when I I started doing sales for him. For he used to sell uh, rainbow vacuum cleaners. And so, 
as I was learning sales tactics from him on that job, and then later on I sold Cutco knives, which are still the best knives in the world. I still have the ones I've sold 20 years ago in my kitchen right now, and they cut just as sharp. I'm not trying to plug Cutco, but if you're watching, cut me a check. Anyway, so yeah, when I started doing sales more and more, I was doing sales, and then by the time I got to knife sales, I finally lost my virginity, and I was starting to able to I was able to start to see parallels between how I was trying to sell knives and vacuums and what was effectively working for me in the dating world. And I was like, oh my God, Doc Love was right. Like sales and dating actually have a whole lot in common in terms of if you want to be successful at sales, a lot of the tactics you need to use to be successful at sales are the same things that you need to be using in order to be successful in the dating world. Now, I will say this. I've expressed this thought before on TikTok and the response from women has been, that shouldn't be a thing. And understand, oftentimes women, they're not gonna like the way that guys say things or think about things because their process of how they think about dating and how they think about relationships is completely different. Even though they do their own sales job, them calling it that in their head to them sounds like manipulation. And because it doesn't sound pretty, they're not going to ever say, yeah, I use sales tactics to try to get guys, but they totally do. They totally do. And so, but for you as a guy, I tell you this because I think there is a wiseness in taking some of the romance out of dating for you. Like, yes, you need to be a guy that is able to do romance, but for you to be a guy that is obsessed with emotions and obsessed with, she's going to buy me flowers and candy, blah, 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 blah. It's going to trip you up every time. And more importantly, romance is for women. So, on your end of things, you need to be the guy that uses the powers of your analytical brain to be able to do things that are going to get you the results that you want and need from women, but in an ethical way. And I want to stress that too, because when I say the thing of like, you know, dating is like sales, sometimes people come and say, but, you know, salesmen are so sketchy and tricky and they're just trying to do this and that. And so I'm going to go over a little bit of that when I go over these points here. But suffice to say is that the majority of salespeople that do a good job at sales are ethical people. So this is not going to be a lesson on like how to trick women into trying to get you where they wouldn't want you in the first place. No, 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 no. That is not how good sales works. Every single knife set that I sold when I was doing uh, Cutco was, I, I would, first of all, I would, I would prospect them. And then more often than not, I was trying to sell to people that actually wanted knives. So at that point, am I trying to trick them into getting knives? Or am I trying to help them better make a decision about why these particular knives are great. And so in terms of the sales to dating scenario, once you start looking at it like that, like the goal of sales is to help the other person make the best educated guess they can about the product that's being placed in front of them for them to make the best decision for them. Then you will see how doing the same thing in the dating world is not only ethical, but it's actually, it actually behooves you to do it that way. So that way women will feel 100% solidified about choosing you as the person that they date. So with that said, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about, I have 13 things here, 13 parallels that sales has to dating that is going to help you out immensely to hopefully get your head on the right frame of not being so romantic focused and more so sales focused. So let's get into it. So to start off with, in both situations, whether it's sales or trying to date, in both situations, there is a product to sell and it has to be branded well. So in the in, in the sales world, it could be, again, it could be knives, vacuum cleaners, everything you've ever bought in your entire life is a product and it had to be sold to you. I, my, my friend got married and had these mugs. I was like, I like these mugs. I wouldn't got these mugs. Like, and the, the mug didn't have to talk to me and try to convince me to buy it. I liked the way it looked. I needed mugs. I got it. So you have to look at yourself as a product, right? You are a product that a woman is looking at and determining, does she want to get that product? But here's the, the caveat, right? Is that ideally you are a product that has branded yourself well enough to where it's going to be not so hard of a decision for a woman to want to, at the very least, canvas you and prospect you, right? And so what I find for most guys is that they have not branded themselves properly. Now, what does this mean? Branding is everything. Your car, the way you walk, the way you talk. You know, I have a particular branding for this show, which is why you guys are watching it. So whatever, whatever I'm doing that is making you feel a connection to me, guess what, guys? I sold you. That's brand. This shirt. I got these shirts because I'm like, I'm trying to look nicer for the show because I'm trying to get a certain type of clientele coming in to watch videos and buy my extremely expensive programs, right? So I have to know 
what brand does that audience want? And so this comes to, if you are a product that is out there for women to consume, are you giving the market what it wants in terms of putting yourself out there to the women that you want? If you're not, then you're not doing a good job of selling yourself to women. And it's something that can be worked on. Number two, uh, much like in sales, you fare better if you go in knowing what your average buyer's wants and needs are. And what trips a lot of men up is on the one hand, they want a feminine woman, but they want these feminine women to think about things and act in ways that we want. So we want a woman that's going to be more so in her logical brain than in her emotional brain or, and not use this passive language. If you want a feminine woman, that's that's what she's going to do. So you got to know going in that that's the thing, right? But suffice to say, so yeah, so you have to know going in also that women are going to have certain wants and needs that may be different from you. You may want direct communication, but she may want somebody that knows how to be flirty and playful and, you know, use passive language that means to hint at things, you know? She may want a guy that not necessarily is like overly emotional, but is able to not make fun of her when she's crying a whole lot, you know? She, women need, want guys that are protectors and providers, right? And so if you're not if you're not able to protect her or look like you could at least, you know, afford a meal, then you can be mad at women all want for not choosing you, but if the market at large wants X, Y, and Z things, and you're trying to give them F and Q, you're going to get effed, sorry, and not in the way you want, you know? So you have to start studying, okay, beyond my feelings about those things or what I think women should want, what are the things that they actually want? What are the things that they're saying they want, but like they actually need this thing over here, and why is that? And when you start to study that stuff, you'll start to listen less to women's words and more to like the things that they actually like go for. Because like women will say things like, you know, I would never date a man that does X, Y, and Z, but look at her track record. She's definitely been with guys that did X, Y, and Z, right? And so that lets you know that if you don't know your market, much like in sales, then you're going to be prospecting to the wrong people, or you're not going to be able to present yourself in a way that demonstrates to them that you're able to give them what they want on their side of the market, all right? So you can't be offended by that. Just know, just like, you know, we try to teach women, hey, this is what guys want. Guys want this and that and this and that. And so if a woman comes along that doesn't give you that stuff, you are also in your full right to not to not go with her. But suffice to say, it's the same is true for them. So don't be mad at what the market wants. Learn what they want and then learn what you can do in your own way that you are willing to do in order to make sure that the market sees that you are now a viable candidate to give her some of her wants and needs. The third way that dating is like sales is that much like in sales, you also fare a lot better if you let the client speak more than you do. And too many of you guys go on dates and try to tell her your whole life story and try to over talk her. She asks you one question and you just talk nonstop at the monologue for 20 minutes straight. I'm like, unless you're doing a podcast, what are you doing? And so what I have found is that if you learn how to ask better questions to women, and let them talk, they will tell you all you need to know about how to attract her, about her likes, her dislikes, her favorite color, what she likes to do on the weekends, the kind of day she likes to go on. Like, you will learn all this stuff if you listen to them. Now, in the sales world, you go into a house and you say, hey, so tell me about yourself, tell me about your situation, how long you've been here. When I was selling uh, vacuums, it's like, oh, so tell me how long have you had this place? Okay, so like, you know, what what situations have you had with your with your vacuum cleaner? How how your rugs, have, have your rugs been coming out clean or have they still been kind of dirty afterwards? Like, what that, what's that been like? And you sit there and listen. And the more they talk, they'll tell you what they like about their current vacuum, what they dislike, what things they wish their vacuum did, if only they had a thing that did X, Y, and Z. And then from there, I'm like, okay, great. They give me all this information. Okay, so based on that, okay, so they want this and they this and that. Does my machine do that? Okay, how can I now tell them about that? But I, but I only get that if I was listening to what they were saying. And some of you guys, like the guy earlier asked about texting, we try to say so much to women. We want to text them all the time and you know get on dates and talk, 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 talk. You listen. When you listen, you can figure out what they want. If you're constantly talking, you're gonna get home from a date, not know anything about her and be like, I barely know her, her middle name. Like, I don't know anything about her. And that's your fault, guy. You got to, of the two of you, it's better to you for you to come to the table and be more of the listener early on than the over talker, all right? And you get a lot better results because you'll know where she's coming from. And then from there, it's just easy peasy. Like, you'll know what date to take her on. You don't have to ask her what her favorite food is or is it okay if you do X, Y, and Z. You'll know that because the prospect told you what they wanted. The fourth way that dating and sales are related is that, and I stressed this earlier, but I'll say it again. Sales is not about tricking somebody into getting the thing. It's about helping them say yes to a product 
that they're already interested in, okay? So for example, if you ask a woman on a date and she says yes, at that point, if you go on a date and try to do all the things, you don't have to put so much effort forth. Her saying yes on some level should say to you, I'm already interested in this product. And what some guys do is they'll, you know, they'll, the woman will say yes, and then they'll go home and think like, but she didn't really want to want to date me and I must have forced her into saying yes and I feel bad, so I need to, you know, make sure she really, and then you, they, you end up talking to chick out of a date, you know, versus just if she said yes, regardless of how you thought she said yes or why. I, I've told a story before, but like I had a, a female friend I was interested in a while back and I asked her on a date and she was looking like I'm crazy for asking her, but I was like, no, I just want to do the date. Like, it's not a, is this, I said, this isn't a marriage proposal. This is just two friends going out to see what's what, no harm, no foul. And I was like, she's going to cancel. But she she said yes to the date and then we went on the date. So even though we ended up not getting together, the reality is she was still willing to do the date to see what was what. Right. If I try to stay there and, you know, try to convince her, please, I swear to God, oh my God, blah, blah, like that's not the goal. Right. Because here's the thing it's again, we're not trying to get somebody interested in you when they're not. So if they're saying yes, that means on some level, there's enough curiosity there for them to want, want her to go on the date. But I don't want you to feel bad to when you ask women on dates and they say yes, and you're thinking, these are reluctantly, oh my God, they were totally enthusiastic. Like this isn't how that works. Women are the queens of giving excuses as to why they can't show up for a date. Oh, my dog died. Oh, something happened at work. Oh, uh, it's raining outside. Like, trust me, they will find a way. It won't be direct, but they'll find a way to say no to you if they don't want to see you, all right? So don't assume that you're tricking these women into seeing you. You're not. You're not that great, all right? They're saying yes because there's a level of interest there that they'd be worth, it'd be worth exploring for them. Uh, the fifth parallel between dating and sales is that both of these things involve persuasion, and negotiation and this especially is true for like the the bigger moves in dating you know the trying to get that first kiss that first hookup getting into the relationship these are things that it's going to take a slower process but it's just like in sales like in sales let's say again i, I was selling cutco knives but at the time they're, they're more expensive now but at the time a whole set could be like a thousand dollars so this is where it's like i know they want knives but do they want a thousand dollar knives or $600 knives set. So that's when I get into, I'm gonna do the best during this presentation to show all that I have to offer. And then at the end, that'll help them make an educated guess. I can show them the knives, why they cut so well. I can show them the various cutting boards. I can show some of the freebies that they get when they get the set. All I can do is try to do the best I can to persuade them. And then from there on, I get to the end. Hey, so you wanna get these knives? They're thousand dollars. Well, I don't know about a thousand, great negotiation time. She might not want the thousand, but she might want the 600 or 700 set. And I sold those sets. That's how I know that happened. I never quite got to the upper echelon, but like I sold like $13,000 worth of knives in the span of like three months because I would go in there. I would persuade people. And the way, by the way, I'm not persuading them by tricking them. And, and in, the, in the knives case, I'm literally cutting things with the knife. I'm cutting leather. I'm cutting foods. I'm showing them their knives and how they work versus my knives. Like all I'm doing is saying, Hey, I got this product. Let me show you what you can do. So when you're dating, you're not trying to overly extend as a means of trying to force this person into thinking of you as a relationship candidate. All you're doing is you're going on a date and you're persuading her. How? By listening to her, by making her laugh, by picking out, not the, it ain't gotta be an overly expensive dating spot, but like something that looks like you put forth effort. Like you're showing that you're putting forth effort. You're giving her little hugs here and there, maybe a compliment or two, but like these are things that are just going to naturally persuade her into thinking, oh, he feels like a good guy. Oh, I think I can trust them. And for women, that, that persuasion time takes two or three months because they need to be able to see you consistent. And so part of persuading them is being able to see the level of consistency you are bringing to the dating table, right? And so again, just like sales, you persuade, persuade, persuade. And then when it comes time to, to get into a relationship or it comes time to hook up for the first time or whatever, this is when negotiations happen. They're not always verbal negotiations, but trust negotiations are happening. Now, again, in my Introvert Dating Success Coaching Program, we talk about the kinds of negotiations to have verbally that get you what you want and make sure she knows that she's getting what she wants out of this as well. Check that out at the website. All right. Another parallel between dating and sales is that as you're learning your client, you learn to adapt in the moment. So I teach you guys frameworks of things. Like I'll say, okay, this is 
This is typically how a first date's gonna go. This is typically how the dating process is gonna go. When you're having conversations with women, this is typically the way it should balance back and forth so you have the best rapport possible with this person, right? That said, there's gonna be things from moment to moment whereby you are gonna have to be able to end up possibly um, moving things around in the event that things aren't going the way you were anticipating they were gonna go. So for example, I dated a girl one time where I, I, I met her online and I actually ended up, I met her online and then we, I was like, hey, so just, you wanna go on a date tonight? She was like, sure, let's do it, right? So then for the moment I heard that, oh crap, like, okay, she was gonna, she's good for a date tonight. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta move in the moment because I thought it was gonna be like, I'm gonna take her out tomorrow night, but she had plans the, the next night. I was like, okay, let's do it tonight. So I said, okay, I'll find a place. Great, found a place. So we get, I, I pick her up from her place. So she, she allowed me to pick her up. And we, I took her, I planned her to take her to this Mexican restaurant that is very popular here in, in LA, right? So we get there, it's a little too popular because they were, they, were, they were full to capacity. So at that moment, did I panic? No, because in my head, what I tell you guys, you should always have two or three spots you can take a woman to at any given time on a date. So I knew there was a second version of this restaurant that was like 10 minutes away. So I said, hey, no worries. We'll go to the other spot. Fine. So we drive all the way to the other version of this restaurant, also packed. And at that point, I was like, crap, two restaurants? What the freak? But wait, I said, you know what? I got a third restaurant. Took her to TGI Fridays. Open, not a lot, not a big crowd. Went in there, and we had a great evening, and then a great evening later on. But suffice to say, guys, like, because I was able to just go with when things weren't going the way I wanted them to, where does it show the prospect now? Oh, this guy thinks on his feet. Oh, he knows how to listen to me. You could be in a situation where let's say you're you're planning to take a woman to like um, a pizza restaurant and you get there and she's like, oh, actually, I, I have a gluten allergy. Oh, crap. You got to now move in the moment, but that's okay. You can adapt, right? Or let's say you had plans of like, you were thinking, okay, if this date goes well on the next day, I'm going to hook up with her. And then you get to the end of that second date and she's like, well, I had a good time and gives you a hug and a kiss, but we'll let you up to her place. Do you get mad now? Or are you just like, okay, I'll pivot. Hey, you know what? Uh, that's cool. Can I come up to your place? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, great, no problem. I'll see you next time. Do, 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 do. Like, you don't get butt hurt. You know, things can change. And you just know next time you plan something else that's maybe closer to her place to where she's going to feel more comfortable bringing you up afterwards. Like, but these are things as a guy you need to always have is that the prospect in front of you, they're going to throw something at you that you didn't anticipate or life's going to throw something at you that you didn't anticipate. Can you pivot when that happens? If you get freaked out because things aren't going your way, that is not a guy that a woman's going to trust because they want guys that can go with the flow or that when something happens that they're not they're not too pleased with or they didn't anticipate that the guy, they can follow that guy's lead into what to do next. And so women are studying your leadership from day one, guys. If you're not good at it, then you're probably losing out just because you're like, what should we do now, princess? I don't know what to do. Women don't want that from their guy. Women want to be able to be like, what's your plan to get us out of this? Or what's your plan when I bring this thing to your attention? And you're going to get tested from that, by the way, early on in the dating process. So get used to it. Uh, let's see. Another parallel between dating and sales is that the best the best salespeople ultimately are authentic people. I get it, guys. I know there are guys out there that are lie to women to get, get what they want, but they don't leave those women happy in the long run, right? But I don't, that's so why I say, I don't want you to think of sales as a bad thing because inherently sales are good. Sales people are trying to sell people on stuff that they themselves already express interest in. You know, the, the, the salesperson at the car lot gets a bad reputation, but it's not like they're going out into the street and saying, hey, you, come check these cars out. Somebody had to come to them. So all these car salespeople are trying to do at this point is trying to say, you came here for a car. Let's see if we can find something that you want because you came to me. So understand when your women are saying yes to dates with you and when they're going out with you, they're not looking for the fake version of you. They want to get to know the authentic version of you. Now, the problem most guys have when they hear that is like, but I try to be my real something's that. But the problem could very well be that the version of you that you currently are while being authentic is not a version that is going to benefit women that you're trying to date. And also, let's be real, is that you may think that right now you're being the authentic version of yourself, but guys develop a lot of bad habits in part because of uh, we get a lot of rejection early on in our dating years, and so we start we start thinking, okay, I gotta be the perfect guy, I gotta be this way, and I can't ever fight with women, I can't bring up sex and X Y Z, and I gotta make sure that I that I cater to them and tell them I'll give them whatever they need, like all the R&B songs tell me to do, and then we believe 
that that's us being our authentic selves. And so women are looking at this like, this is not authentic at all. Why is this guy overcomplimenting me? Why is he trying to like already give me a hookup at at um, a, a hamburger place down downtown? Like, why is he trying to overextend himself to me? Like, because because in, in a relationship, like that's not what she wants. Like she's she's not expecting you as the guy to overextend yourself, even in a relationship capacity. But you do it early on. I will tell you from personal experience, women get very suspect. They start wondering, why is he overextending himself? This doesn't feel authentic to me. And so you got to really figure out if some of the habits that you have, are you being your authentic self or are you catering to women? You know, I because I've, I've had some people ask me before, like, you know, well, for example, well, you know, if you if you take a woman out for a dinner date, are you being a simp? And my response is like, not if I'm hungry. Like if I'm legit hungry and I want to go and I want somebody to be there with me, I'd be like, hey, I know it's the first date. I remember one time I, I dated a girl. Our first date was P.F. Chang's. And I told her, I said, hey, like. I'm hungry for P.F. Chang's, so I'm going to go get P.F. Chang's. If you want to roll, let's do this. It wasn't, hey, oh, princess, I found a great restaurant for you, and I want to make sure I'm going to find the priciest thing I can. Like, there's a difference in tactic. Even some down to, like, giving women money. If you decide, hey, I want to give you 10 bucks, whatever, you can do that, but it's your attitude going forth. If your attitude is, I'm doing this to try to get something out of you, or I'm hoping this is going to lead towards sex, women can read that, and that's not going to read for them as authentic. Versus, yeah, you can take a woman to an expensive restaurant on a first date, but are you doing it because you like that restaurant? Or are you doing it because you're trying to impress her and score points? Women can tell that, at which point they're going to be They'll still go for the food, but that doesn't mean it's going to attract them, you know? And so, yeah, just like in sales, there are salespeople that are downright and dirty and are trying to trick people. And those salespeople, they get bad reputations and they don't get to last for a long time versus a sales guy that's just like, look, I'm over here because you said you wanted some knives. You said you wanted a vacuum cleaner. I'm here to show you the best I got. Hopefully you'll like it because I know that I like it. And that's the thing too, is that Ideally, you like your product. Like, I would not ever sell anything that I didn't like. I loved selling Cutco knives because I thought they were the best knives. They're still the only knives that I use in my entire apartment, you know? I sold the rainbows that I sold back in the day. I have a rainbow. Like, I had the stuff that I authentically used and was excited about to show the people that I sold to. So you have to ask yourself, are you excited about you as a dating prospect? Because if you're not excited about you, She's not going to get excited about you. And then you're not going to be able to be authentic because you don't even authentically like yourself. And that's inner work. And that can take time. That can take effort. It can take a coach like me, which if you sign up for a program, I can totally help you with. But suffice to say, get to like yourselves because it's the fastest way to start having better self-esteem and then being able to show women who you authentically are. And hey, newsflash guys, whether you're a nerdy guy or a suave guy, women will go for all these types of guys if you know how to present yourself in a way that is not only authentic, but shows women that you actually like yourself. Anyway, moving on, uh, another parallel between dating and sales is that, yeah, uh, if you talk too much once you've made the sale, you're probably going to lose the sale. What does this look like? Well, in the sales world, it looks like, hey, so I get to the end of my presentation. Hey, so uh, you want to buy these $1,000 knives? And the prospects is like, sure, I'll go ahead and get them. Oh, thank God. That's so great because you know what? I didn't know if you were going to buy them because, you know, most people only get the $800. Oh, there's an $800 set. Ah, you lost a $1,000 sale. So, guys, this is going to be hard, right? When you ask women out on dates, the best thing you could do for yourself, and it's going to be hard. You're going to have to practice this, right? Is to ask for the date that you want and then shut up. I learned to do this in sales where I get to the end of the presentation. I say, so how much... Uh, so so we showed you the knives, the knives the, the, we told you the price. So what can we do to get you to be a customer today? And the hardest part was doing what I'm doing now, just staring them in the face, waiting for an answer. And they might start to squirm. Well, I mean, uh, do I want to get him today? Uh, I don't, this, this, this. And the hardest thing to do is to not try to interject and say, but I mean, if you don't have to, if you don't want to, or, well, I mean, if you don't want to get those knives, like, Mm -mm. you sit there and wait. And so I found the same tactic also works in dating. You ask women for a date. Hey, so I was thinking, you know, of this new restaurant came open this weekend and I would love to take you. Are you free on Tuesday? And you just sit there and you just wait for her to answer. And it's going to be the longest, probably 10 to 15 seconds of your entire life. But I'm going to tell you right now, being able to sit there and wait for her to answer you, it displays so much confidence to a woman 
Oftentimes, even a woman that would not have initially said yes will be sold on just. And so you have to learn, again, when to talk and when not to talk. And it may very well be that some of you guys are either talking or texting yourselves out of dates with women that would have actually said yes had you not continued on after you asked for the sale. All right. So remember that, guys. Remember, it's it's very powerful to be able to just ask whether it's like so even if it's like through text, you text her, hey, let's go out. And you're like, she didn't respond back right away. It's been 10 minutes. It might take an hour, two hours, four hours. You don't know what she's doing, but you sent your text, you leave it there, and you don't send another text saying, are you still there? I asked you a question, what are you gonna answer? You send the text, hey, was thinking we're free uh, on, Tuesday, on Tuesday and Thursday to go out, let me know if you're free and available, and you leave it at that, because I tell you now, she's had the experience of guys asking her and then trying to continue to sell themselves, and those guys, I mean, to, to them, talk themselves right out of a date with her. So don't be that guy. Be the guy, much like in sales, you ask for what you want and then you wait for the answer and you wait until she gives you an answer. It to take five seconds or a minute. You sit there like, like I'm waiting. It's anybody yes or no, tell me something. Like, like, but don't, don't say that part out loud, you know? So anyway, um, okay. Another parallel between dating and sales is that anything that shows a lack of confidence in the product will make the prospect say no. So if I were to go on these cut code demonstrations and say, yeah, these are the absolute best knives ever. And then they'd be like, uh, are they better than Henkel's? Which was their competition. Are they better than Henkel's ones? And I'm like, well, I mean, I don't know because I never tried one. And let me, let me, let me test your knife out. Oh, this knife kind of cuts good. So, I mean, mine's still good though. Like at that point, if I'm doubting how great this product is, then why would the customer want to buy this product? And the way that you're showing this in your dating world is the way you walk, the way you stand, the way you talk, the way you talk about yourself. All these things are letting a woman know whether you have confidence in yourself or if you don't, all right? And so you got to look at that because women might have empathy for you and sympathy for you, but empathy and sympathy does not equate with attraction from women, all right? So you guys that are on dates like, you know, oh, you know, you know, my, my last girl, she just dumped me for whatever reason. You know, all the girls I try to date, they just treat me so wrong. You're, you're saying that in an attempt to get her to treat you better. And she's gonna be like, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And then never talk to you again. Because again, just giving that display, it doesn't show confidence. You slouching over in your seat like this, doesn't show confidence. You walking behind her when you're walking the place, it doesn't show confidence. When you're not confident in yourself, the woman's going to be like, why would I want to buy him as a product if he's not even confident in himself as the product, you know? So you got to start learning that whatever, whatever is causing you to be a slump guy or a guy that's, you know, maybe talking too fast on dates or whatever, you got to look at why that is and start working on that. And again, that's a lot of the inner work that I go th over with you extensively in the introvert dating success coaching program, because I used to go through the same thing. I was very much like a guy that I could get a date. And then I'd be on the date the whole time thinking, she doesn't really want me. I don't, I can't think of a conversation and talk about, uh, she's probably having a bad time. And what that does subconsciously is it projects to women. And women can pick up on these kind of things subconsciously way better than we can. So we don't think we're showing ourselves in a non-confident light, but that's all the energy she's picking up from us. And therefore that's all she's gonna feel. And it's not going to make her sold on you as a potential dating prospect. Let's see, another parallel between dating and sales. I said this earlier, but knowing when to talk and when to be silent and patient is powerful. But this is especially true for you guys that are over texting, you're over communicating. You know, in sales, you wanna say just enough so the prospect gets an understanding of why your product is great and nothing more. The more you try to explain to a, pro to a prospect why your product is so great, that starts to make them think, he's saying a lot, why is he trying to push this so hard? What's he not telling me? And so you have to know when it's best to try to say things. And that's on a date, when to listen versus when to talk through texting. Know when you should reach out, i.e. when you're asking for a date versus when not to reach out, i.e. anytime else. Like these are all important things to know, all right? Um, also to that point is that being patient is powerful and not talking is powerful. And so that means also in between dates, you should not be having all this communication. You know, there are times during a date where it might go silent for a little bit and you're thinking it's, it's too silent. I got to think of something to say. 
Those are the moments where, again, if you're confident in that silence, it's powerful to women because then they become they become the ones that are like, oh, he's he's just OK. I, I got things to impress him to say, like, let them be the ones that are in that anxious area of the dating aspect of the world. OK, don't you cannot be there. All right. But again, yeah, very, very important is that sometimes not saying things and not communicating are the best things you can do to attract that woman in front of you, all right? Because what you don't want to do, again, is talk a woman out of wanting to see you or talk to you. So something to consider. Uh, another parallel between dating and sales is that it's very important here, okay? Uh, persistence is key. Now, you might be thinking after all that I've said, but Harry, haven't you said you shouldn't be like chasing after women or like trying to like, you know, be there too much than that? So we're not talking about that level of persistence, right? We're, for one, we're talking about being persistent and making the right moves, i.e., yes, if you ask her on a date and she says yes to it, you take her out, you want to be persistent in following along on the program that you're doing in order to try to attract women. So if your your plan is to try to call her once a week to get a date, keep doing that. That is that is a level of persistence that women can like. If you ask her on a date and she cancels or flakes like that, you ask her out one more time after that, and then if she doesn't respond or flakes again, you leave her that freak alone. We're not in the habit of like, you're going to be chasing these women nonstop. And even if she starts to lose interest, I'm going to keep texting her and calling her. I'm not talking about that in terms of persistence. But I am talking about is the exercise and the drive to learn women, to grow, and to eventually land someone. So you ask a woman on a date, she take her out, have a good time. You ask her out again, she says no. You ask her out one more time, she says she can't go or she would snap, right? So now the persistence part is, okay, that's one prospect, didn't work out, on to the next. You know, in sales, when I would go to his house and sell somebody, I'd say, hey, give me uh, like 10 referrals. I need 10 referrals. And then I would call each of those referrals. Hey, can I come to your house to, to do the uh, the presentation? No, I'm not interested. Okay, hang on. Next one. Hey, can I come to your house to like do a presentation? Oh, I'm free this day. Okay, great. Boom. Next one. Hey. so And so I'm persistent in the pursuit of eventually getting a prospect that I want to sell to that's going to buy. In the dating world, I'm persistent in putting myself out there, whether it's through dating apps, whether it's having friends hook me up, whether it's going to various events, but I'm persistent in my goal to meet with, meet more women, interact with more women so I get an idea of the ebb and flow of how conversations go with them. And then also I'm persistent in my learning about what they want and about putting myself out there to have more practice dates to where I can eventually get a woman that I'm in a relationship with, right? So that's where the persistence part comes in because a lot of the persistence part is gonna be about you being able to put yourself through enough practices with women to where this stuff will not offend you. Like if you ask them out, they say no, you won't be bugged by it because you've gone through this so many times being persistent that you just know that that no leads towards eventually yes, you know? So that's why I say, that's why those of you guys that watch these shows on a weekly basis or check out my videos or do my programs, like that's you being persistent in your knowledge of how women function so you can eventually land a woman that's gonna work for you. And so I commend you by the way for that because I know it's Saturday night, y'all could be at the club, y'all could be doing whatever, but you decided to watch this, you're being very persistent right now in your knowledge of getting to know women. And that helps you not only in the sales world, but also in the dating world. So kudos to you. Um, a few more here. Oh, two more. Uh, uh, okay. Another important, this is a very important way that dating and sales are related is that you must always be willing to walk away from a bad customer or prospect or a customer that is not interested. So let's say I talk to somebody on the street and I'm like, hey, so uh, I'm selling knives and there are these really, really great knives. I would love to be able to come to your house and give you a full demonstration of these knives. If they say to me, no, thanks, I'm not interested. It is not now my job to try to sit there for another 30 minutes and convince them about why they need to let me in their house to sell the knives and how great the knives actually are and how they're doing a disservice to the knives and like what other knives do they have right now that probably aren't as good as the knives that I have, blah, 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 blah. Now, you're probably watching this and thinking, Harry, that's stupid. Why would anybody do that with some knives? But men do it all the time with women. You go up to a woman in a club, hey, beautiful, so, you know, I was thinking maybe you should, like, get on the dance floor. No, thanks. I'm not interested. Huh, why would you dance with me? Oh, you women are all the same. Why don't you? Or I'm a nice guy, really. I swear, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing? What are you doing? What you're doing is you're thinking, well, my the amount of women I'm able to get with her is limited, and so I have to have this one. And so... If I ask her to dance with me or ask her for a date and she says, no, maybe she's not seeing it or I just need to sell myself harder. You do not need to sell yourself harder. What you need to do is get an abundant mindset that says, if she doesn't want to date me, that's her prerogative. She's in her full right to not want to talk to me. 
I'm going to go talk to one of her friends or somebody else is here. I'm going to swipe. She didn't swipe left on me or she swiped left on me instead of right. So I'm going to talk to somebody else on this dating app. Like ultimately, guy, you don't want to be obsessed with any particular outcome. So I tell you guys, it is important to become indifferent because part of being indifferent is knowing that one no is not going to ruin your day. One woman deciding she wanted to flake on a date last minute isn't going to wreck your entire evening. Like women of their own accord can decide that they want you as a, as a, as a potential or not. In other words, if you, as the product, they're going to see you and say, I'll try that out or eh, I don't want to try that out. But this is why when you get out of, the, out of being so emotional about dating, when you stop trying to, to think of it as like flowery romantic and you start to be more analytical, you'll just think, okay, well, I, she was one prospect that I tried today. You know what? She don't want me. Okay, cool. As part of the dating process, I'll probably have to go through like asking out 15 women to get one yes. If that, those are the numbers, let's go ahead and do it. And you won't be so hurt by it or, or you won't take it to your ego. Oh, a woman didn't choose me today. Oh my God. Like that's what I'm trying to get you guys to see is that ultimately if a prospect doesn't want you or if it's a bad prospect, then it's totally fine if you don't ever get with them. You know, I've had guys before that have hit me up to ask me about trying to get with a potential woman. And then I'll ask for like, okay, what are her stats? Oh, well, you know, she lives at home and uh, she's she she did drugs for a while and she's got like five kids and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, why would you consider that as a prospect? If I'm doing sales, right? And I ask somebody about, they want to buy these knives and they're like, well, I don't really cook, but sure, give me the demonstration. Why would I go do the demonstration to somebody that doesn't want to use knives in the kitchen? Like, that's a dumb thing to do. And yet again, guys will do it all the time. Oh, this girl said that she doesn't date tall, she, she doesn't date short guys. I'm a short guy. I'm going to go talk to her. Do, what are you doing? Like, save yourself the energy and time for women that would actually want to talk to you. They are out there. I know some of you guys, whether you're in small towns or big towns or you think there's no prospects, there are women out there right now that will date you as you are. For you to come up against one that doesn't want to date you, they've done you a favor by telling you for one, because a lot of women aren't upfront like that, but also it, you now don't have to waste your time trying to convince this person to date you. But if you aren't doing that, then you're wasting your time that you can be spending with other people and it's just not worth it, you know? And finally, a very, very important way that dating and sales are related is that at the end of the day, in order to get what you want, you have to ask for the order. And what I found in my practice is that there are too many guys out there that are not asking for the order. These are the guys that like get on dating apps and they match with a woman and just talk to her for two to three weeks thinking, well, if she wants to go out with me, she'll eventually say something. Now, I tell you guys that after two to three months, it's the woman's job to come to you and say, hey, what are we, blah, 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 right? But in the early stages of dating, it is your job to ask her to see you so that way you guys can start off this path towards eventually landing in a relationship. And so closed mouths don't get fed. Women want to see that you are bold enough and daring enough to not be afraid of her and to ask for what you want. And this goes in all realms. This goes in asking her for a date. This goes into getting a kiss from her. This goes into trying to get a hookup with her. Like these are the situations where you have to ask for the order. Now, for the other ones, not you're not going to ask verbally for a kiss and verbally for a hookup. Like you can do that stuff in ways that indicate that you want these things to happen, but you're still putting the moves forth that let her know. Oh, this is his his way and action wise to say I want to do some stuff, right? But yeah, if you are relying on her to solely give you all, not only give you all the signals, but then also say, oh, and by the way, I want to go on a date with you, then you are not going to get as many women to date you as you could possibly get. You know, and again, personal experience, but also in the sales realm, you know, if I get to the end of a sale, I don't show this woman a bunch of great knives and a bunch of great vacuums of the snap. I'll tell her all the features of the snap. I get to, the end of, I get to the end of it and say, so that those are the knives. Well, am I going to wait there for her to be like, they look great. So can I buy some? That's never going to happen. I got to be like, so these are the knives. So what set would you like to get? Would you like to get the small set here or the bigger set? What would be best for you? But either way, I got to ask for that order. So same thing with women. You meet a woman at a party, have a good banter with her. At the end of that, you better be doing something like, hey, it's great to know you. Hey, you know what? Let me get your number. Or you meet a, you meet a girl online. This has been a fun conversation. Hey, let's go on a date. You got to ask for the order. And again, as I said before, you got to be indifferent. You're going to either get a yes or, or maybe, which is a no or a no. But basically, you're going to get one or two answers, right? And whatever the answer is, you cannot be butthurt by it. But 
you got to at least ask for the order, you know? So hopefully this gives you guys a, a better vision and idea of why it's good to think about dating and sales in the same realm. Because a lot of the things that work well in sales work well in dating, you know, knowing how to how to prospect better, knowing the right kinds of questions to ask, being willing to not talk and let a person in front of you like think out if what they're trying to consider in terms of dating you is going to be a good thing. You know, these kinds of things are immensely beneficial. And also more importantly, also like knowing how to brand yourself and being able to authentically show the best parts of yourself on these dates. I think so many guys get caught up in the whole, you know, women want a guy that's honest with them that you want to go on a date and show her all your flaws. It's it's okay to have flaws and it's okay that she gets to know them at some point. But in the dating process, much, think about it like if I go to buy a car, right? Let's say I get a, I'm going to go to a car. A car salesman, salesman is going to be like, oh, hey, so this car right here, it's got X, Y, and this, this, and that. They're not going to be like, oh, but well, it kind of both steers weird a little bit. Here's blah, blah, blah. Like, they're not going to do that. They're going to be like, hey, Take it for a test ride. I can then drive the car and find out on my own, oh, this turns weird. Oh, the AC is a little too cold or whatever. But like, they're not going to pitch that out there because it's my job as the person buying it to feel out that stuff. It's not their job to try to call it out. So the same is true for dating. Like you have flaws. Great. Let her figure them out down the line because it may be that a flaw that you think is a big flaw, she doesn't even notice. You know, I talk fast, for example. Most women that I've dated have not minded that I talk fast. But if I were to be like, yeah, I know I talk kind of fast and, you know, I wish I wish I could stop it, but I can't. I hope it doesn't. Like, I would lose out. So you just got to know, like, in terms of selling yourself to women, you're trying to sell the best version of yourself that you can possibly do. And you got to know that when you ask, some are going to say yes, some are going to say no. But you ask for the order. You show them the best show what you can, i.e. you show off the product, i.e. you, the best way you know how. And then at the end of the day, they're going to either choose to continue on with that product, you, or they're going to say like, this one's not for me. I think there's a better product out there for me. You don't take it personally. You move on to somebody else. All right. So hopefully guys, this gives you just a different angle and a way to consider dating out there in a way that's not so personal and not so emotional and not so romanticized, right? Like if you treat it as a tactile sales equivalent, then you will be less emotional in the process, which means you'll have your analytical hat on and you won't be persuaded by like their boobs and their butts, which is what they're trying to sell us, by the way, by all the outfits that they're wearing. Just saying. So hopefully it helps you out. All right. Uh, we have some some comments in here. Hold on a second. I'm looking at, the, I, I, I'm going back in the chat now to see what things were, were said here. Uh, uh Kuman, you may want to have you might you might want to sign up for a session, dude, because I mean uh, you have a lot of questions, which I love answering on the show, but like I could definitely help you with a deeper dive of this stuff and get uh your your mind frame and dating situation like figured out a lot faster with a personal coaching session. Just putting that out there. But I got time tonight, so let's go through the questions. All right, so uh let's see. Let's get them. <laughs> <laughs> is it so question first question here is uh is it true that women can detect little lies i tend to do it a lot um i mean you shouldn't be doing it a lot but the reality is it's weird because like women do go on dates very hopeful and they go on dates thinking that okay this even though the last guy lied to me i i really want to believe that this this guy that's in front of me is not going to do that and so because they're going on dates with such hope they might not initially be trying to detect any kind of lies you're telling. But that said, I, you know, as a person that has, hey, I've been through earlier in my dating life where like I was trying to, I was trying to present myself in a way that women would like, even if it meant hiding parts of myself that they would need to, that they were going to find out about eventually later anyway, you know? And so I found in the long run that that's a disservice to women and it's not fair. But I also find that if you're doing those little lies, that means that on some level, there's levels of shame about whatever it is that you're lying about that you maybe weren't aware were actually there. And so to that, I would say, figure out why it is you feel the need to lie about those things and become e either fix them so they're not things you do anymore or become okay with whatever things you, you, you're lying about are. So that way you don't have to walk around in your head wondering, did she catch my lie? Did she catch what I'm doing lie? Because then that's not fair to you also to have to always be stressed about having to keep up with the lies you're trying to tell to people, you know? Uh, let's see. Did, did, what was I Okay. Another question in the chat question goes, coach, you mentioned vetting. What are the main ones we should look for on the first date? I heard one is daddy issues, which are the other big ones we should look for. Oh God, daddy issues are definitely big. Like if a woman has a bad relationship with her dad, I can assure you 
it's going to project onto you. Like, cause that's her earliest, that's her earliest situation with a man in her life. And if whatever reason she got abused by that man, or he did things where he wasn't trustworthy, then that's going to parlay over into her dating life where she's looking at you at some point and you're trying to come to her to tell her something. And she's thinking you're lying to her or you're, you're, you know, potentially going to try to abuse her in some way. Like those women I find just, and I, again, I feel bad for them. I feel bad that they've gone through that situation. I've just also found that I've been that guy that tried to date women like that. It, it does not work out very well. They're constantly nerve wracked and anxious and it's just, it's not worth your time, you know? So I would say that that's not good either. But aside from that particular thing in terms of vetting, like you got to look at things like simple stuff, like how they, how are they treating the servers? If you go to a restaurant, see how they're treating their servers, how they talk about them. Um, you can ask them questions about their day-to-day lives or who their best friends are or whatever, and see the kind of stories they tell about them. If they're like, you know, kind of slightly dissing them versus like praising them up. Um, you can see in the course of the conversation if she's interrupting you. I mean, because, you know, as much as guys get a bad rep for not having a good communication style, the reality is I have found that if you as a guy are a great communicator, you get to learn that there are a lot of women out there that also cannot communicate very well. And so if she's interrupting you or she's saying you guys have like a disagreement about something like, or sorry, you have a differing opinion about something. And then she gets like really mad that your, that your opinion isn't her opinion or looks at you some kind of way like, oh my God, like, a good one now would be like, you know, yeah, like OJ just died. You know, like, yeah, I mean, he died. He died like, but I don't, I don't think he did it. What? How could you? Uh, that could be a whole conversation piece. If she gets mad and yells at you, you've dodged the bullet, you know? And so just kind of things like that. Because the first day is really just going to be like, the, it's ideally it's short, 45 minutes to 90 minutes tops. Just kind of get to know each other. You want to see if she has a good sense of humor. If she's able to laugh at certain things. Because if, if, if a woman's hard-pressed to laugh, I can assure you she's not going to be a joy to be around. Like, and also, women that laugh at your jokes are typically already feeling some kind of levity of like for you, which is always a good thing, right? So look out for those kind of things. Ultimately, you want a woman that's going to have a good attitude, can go with the flow. You could definitely try the, the check test where it's like the check gets delivered and she starts kind of playing with her purse if she's going to pay. Spoiler, they're probably not going to pay. But the fact that she's acting like she might potentially pay means that she's a person that down the road will probably pay for some stuff for you. So just those are a few things that you can do to start trying to test that stuff out early on, you know? Uh, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, somebody says, it's interesting hearing you make a link between sales and dating. I was thinking similarly a while ago and was looking to make the link too. Uh, yeah, like I said, like, and that's one of the things that again, some people get, I, you know what I found? It's just a sidebar conversation. Because as a guy, I have found that for, for us, at least I'll, I'll speak for me. That, so other guys, they can agree to speak in the chats, right? But I have found that for me to get a concept, it's good for me to, to compare it to another concept, right? And so I find that sometimes explaining that to women, because I'm comparing these two different things, that to them doesn't seem like they go together. The response is, well, that's not a thing. Like I, I, I did the thing on TikTok where I said, you know, I said dating is very much like sales. And their response is like, but sales is different because sales isn't a human. And how dare you? At that point, this is why I don't coach women because I, I have found uh, this is just generality because there are some women out there that I've been able to help that listen to me. But I've just found that like like in, in terms of how I try to describe things, it doesn't always gel with them. And I'm like, but the advice isn't for you. It's for guys and guys will get when I'm trying to make these comparisons of things that to them seems like it's just concrete like stuff, but they'll be able to get it better when it's not coming from an emotional context. And I think that's what men don't get is that is that for men trying to explain a concept to a guy from an emotional concept, it doesn't work nearly as well as coming into them from an analytical concept where they have to, they can say, oh, so you're saying X and Y equals Z because of this. Okay, I get that now. Versus, well, you should do X because the, the emotions the woman's going to feel is Y. Like men, I have found based on coaching them, it doesn't work as well for them to explain it from that angle. So when Doc Love started talking about the sales thing, I was like, I get it. Like I've done sales. And you're saying this thing is like this. And so just like over here dating, I now know how to put this where I'm going to get the emotional response I want from her in, in, an in a more authentic way to her based on doing this thing that has no emotion to it. You know, so uh, so I'm glad that you were able to, to get the idea of that. Uh, question in the chat. Why are some women into lots of texting while others are just not interested in texting, but do like to go out? Which type would you go for? Well, that is a lie. And I'll tell you why, because. You're basing this off of when women, when you when you meet a woman in the beginning, oftentimes the texting is hot and heavy, right? It's like almost nonstop. But that, but if you notice, even women that like to text a lot, it'll start to die down. 
Where does that come from? That comes from the guy buying into the lie that we are made to believe that women want this kind of texting all the time. You being new stimuli to her is going to hype her up for texting. And I have found that you can actually keep up that level of texting if you as the guy are not trying to initiate text all the time. Now, guys will feel some kind of way about that. And sometimes women will too. So I'm going to stress, I always say initiate. If she hits you up every single day and she's the one initiating more than you, it's totally fine to then initiate, I mean, to then respond back. But I found as a guy, if I'm the one every day, early in the morning, good morning, beautiful, next day, hey, how's your day going, blah, 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 that I'm constantly initiating, that's when the woman's desire to want to be the one to reach out starts to die down. So it's not a matter of some women like to text more than others. It's a matter of you as the guy, when you start texting too much, whatever life they have for texting is going to be lost. But again, this also speaks to more often than not, you don't lose points for not texting a woman too much. Because let's say, worst case scenario, you're not texting her enough. She'll come to you and say, hey, I noticed you don't text me a whole lot. What's going on? Again, like I said earlier, that's a positive sign, but she's not docking points from you for not doing that. She's expressing that she has so much like for you that she wish it were more. But you have to also look at does what a woman say, it, does the thing a woman is saying that she wants actually what she needs? I've had plenty of women that I dated say, hey, so like, I, it would be cool. I, I want you to text more. And the one or two times that I acquiesced to that, I would start texting more. It didn't make them res respond to me more. It made them respond to me less. So they're saying they want me to text more. I'm texting more. And now they're texting me back less to where I would just stop doing it. And then it gets back to normal. So here's what I say is that ultimately your texting ratio should always be three in, to be three initiations to one. So for every three times she initiates texting, like let's say brand new day, right? She sends the first text. Next day, she sends the first text. Next day, she sends the first text. Day four, you send the first text. It should be a three to one ratio because women feel things three times more than guys are intending. If you try to match up her level of texting, it's like, oh, we're texting 50-50. It feels to her like you're texting 150% versus 50% versus if you text her one to three, your one time is 33% to her, was that three times out of four? Sorry, your 25% to her 75%. To her, it feels like 75%, you know? So that's how I measure that out. But if, regardless, Ultimately, I'm not letting how a woman texts me determine how I text her. I text the way I text. I do three to one. I only text for dates. And if she doesn't like that, my question to her is always like, are we still going out on dates? Well, yeah. Am I taking to some good places? Well, yeah. We having good hookups? Well, yeah. Do you feel like I emotionally get you? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So you're saying that of all the things, the one thing I'm not doing right is texting you as much as you want me to, right? But all the other things are great. Yeah. So then... Is texting really a big deal? I guess not. Boom. Because does she want me to text her on and off for three or four hours out of the day? Or does she want to see me in person where we can see each other, feel each other, touch each other, hear each other? That That is the better simulation. So this is why I say you can't buy into the lie. Even if you heard women say, I need a guy to text more. Because here's the thing. Women are going to say things from moment to moment that feel right, even if they're wrong. And so a woman might feel like, I need to hear from this guy more. But she's mistaking wanting an interaction with this guy from having to hear from him by text all the time. And moment to moment, I have found if I go for the lie of trying to text her nonstop, there's going to be a point where she's like, okay, I don't feel like I need to hear from him now. And I'm going to text again. Oh, it's too late. I texted too much. Now it's too late. So you don't lose points for texting less is what I'm saying. Anyway, a uh, person here says, <laughs> I like the name run from hookups. Uh, this person says, personally, I used to be into texting mostly because I just had a lot to learn and I wasn't quite in a place in my life that I could fully date. Now, a lot of things about my approach are changing fast. <laughs> uh, so you say, change up everything, figure blah, blah, blah. One of them, I don't care about the height thing. Okay. Oh, so this is a woman. Awesome. So she says, uh, I'm one of them. I don't care about height. Uh, definitely, even as a woman, I implement a lot of tips like these and in my own way. I say, don't get so attached to the outcome. Plenty of fish in the ocean. <laughs> Um, and now they're having a little conversation in the chat here. Uh, let's see. Oh, question here. All right. So we got a question in the chat and the question goes, Hey coach, I may be in the autism spectrum. Congratulations. Uh, which can literally blind us in the dating market. Any experience or suggestions? So I say 
congratulations. We just found out that I'll say a, a close personal relative of mine that is that is young in stature. Uh, we just found out they were also autistic. And traditionally, uh, traditionally, autistic people tend to have tend to be like they get really good and focused to like one particular thing and they make like all the money. So not that I'm saying these people are necessarily on the spectrum, but picture your like Mark Zuckerberg's picture, your uh, Elon Musk type, like people that like, they just all they focus on his cars, all focus on his computers. And then they end up getting all the monies, you know? So that's why I'm saying congratulations. Obviously it's something serious that you got to deal with, but realistically we all have stuff that we do in our lifetime. I will say this uh, as a person, if, if you are hypothetically on the autism spectrum, then it definitely behooves you to learn the exact blueprint that will be beneficial to you being able to date. Because I'll tell you, I, I don't believe in more the autistic spectrum. I maybe I don't know. But I found just in my personal life, as me personally being like an analytical person, I found that, again, the emotions of dating oftentimes trip me up. Like having to know the ins and outs of why when I said this thing, this woman got offended or why I did this action, she got turned off or whatever. It got very confusing and annoying. And so I found for me personally that, that part of the reason I put together the Introvert Dating Success uh, Coaching Academy is that, I actually found a consistent process that worked to be able to uh, attract women, approach them, get dates, get them to say yes to dates, um, and then be able to consistently, like week after week, take them out, know what conversations to have, know when conversations were too soon versus when they happened at the right time. I, I got to learn like the exact things women are feeling at any given moment during the two or three month dating process to where I didn't have to now think about where a woman was in her attraction level or think about what she's feeling about me based on if she texts me today or not. Like I just knew, you know? And so I find that again, by taking the, the romantic and emotional side out of the dating process for me, it resulted in me being able to show them more romance simply by understanding how they function, being a better listener, knowing when to compliment them, when to not also the stuff, it made it a better process for them. And all I care about in the dating world and the dating process for you specifically is, are you doing the things that make them comfortable? And I found early on without having a, a blueprint to date, I did not. And so once I had a blueprint and I understood the mechanics behind why the things I was now doing was going to be more comfortable to women than it was before, then I was able to test that out quite a few times to see if that works. I could then put together a program that would hopefully work for other guys. And so far it has, I've had guys that I've helped get into relationships, get full on marriages because of it. And it's simply just, again, taking the blinders off of being, not being aware. And so if you have autism, the lie is you're going to, you're going to go out there and think, okay, crap. Like I got to do all this stuff that I'm not, I'm not good at emotions. And so, and then kind of find out women don't want us to be all that emotional. They want us to understand their emotions and not judge them for their emotions. Damn, if we have emotions, not like the, the, don't buy into the lie. Well, I want a guy that's going to cry and be able to. They don't want that because we're, we're push comes to shove. If something happens, they don't want a guy that's going to be a sniveling idiot. So you can take that part out and then learn an, a, 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 an analytical process of dating that, again, is going to be beneficial to you because you won't ever be lost about what's going on. The one downside I will say is this, is that it can feel at times at the point that I learned the, the exact process of how dating should work to where I can get to a relationship. Like if I, if I end up single, I can go back out there and be like, you know, oh, I know the next 10 things I got to do to get to a relationship. It does take a level of like, it, it's amazing. Like you wouldn't think this, right. But like, it's almost like when you don't know, there's a level of excitement of like, I don't know what the next move to make is. So I got to figure it out. So knowing what to do is like, you've beaten Mario one. You found all the warp zones. You found how to get to level eight in Bowser really, really fast. And you can now do that every time you play the game. It's like, I mean, I can do it, but it's just, it's just not as exciting. But again, dating for you should not be exciting. It should be a means to an end to land in a relationship with a really great girl. And then you can do all the exciting stuff once you get in the relationship. But the dating process should not be this thing where it's like, it just happens. Every time something just happens, the girl doesn't feel like you know what she, what, that, how to do anything with women and they feel unsafe and they feel like you don't get them. And then they go to another guy that's like, oh, he knows exactly what he's doing, even if he's a toxic guy, you know? So I would say for you, Learn a process. Now, obviously, I teach a great process that I feel works. It's a it's a full on blueprint. But in my program, I also talk about you know maybe some of the challenges that you're having in terms of like being able to read women properly or not knowing why they say this thing but mean this thing over here. Like I go into all those kind of things also because even getting to to understand how women function, whether you have autism or not, I can assure you, it's still a crap show to figure that shit out. But you can 
it, you can get through it a lot easier if you have somebody to guide you through that to be able to pinpoint out things that you maybe not have hadn't had noticed or observed before, you know? So I would say check out the program at the website. You have nothing to lose by checking it out, but like you have a lot to gain once you get this stuff under control. So hopefully that that helps you out. Uh let's see. Do, 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 do. Um, in terms of the, the, I'm still doing the photo booth stuff. So I got some stuff that's coming up in May. So uh, thanks for asking about that. I'm, I'm still setting up things. I still got my machine. So uh, we have some good things going. I've, I've connected with a couple of sororities and fraternities that I can start going to events for. So you'll say, again, building a business. I mean, it's funny, like building a business, that's a new process. I mean, outside of, I built this one up, but like, doing an outside business that's different. It's like, it's it's all these new things that I have to learn, which is exciting. It's exciting to have to learn the ins and outs of like, how do you how do you sell people in your machine? What what things do they want at these parties and all this other stuff? So it's been quite the journey, but you know, I, it's, it is what it is, you know? So we're, we're still kicking and still, and still thriving right now, but thanks for asking. Uh, let's see, do, 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 see. So you don't know, it's a television. We can probably assess the pre-chat for a day. Okay, we got a question in the chat and the question goes, uh, can compatibility be assessed in a pre-chat before the in-person first date? And can compatibility come with time? So these are two different questions. So I'll answer the first one first. So can compatibility be assessed in a pre-chat? The the goal, here, oh, hey, look, the goal of a chat, like if you're meeting them online, Facebook, a dating app, whatever, is to just get the date. Like ultimately you're trying to see if you can get the date. Now, now if you're doing this online dating, you go to their profile, you're going to see their pictures. You're going to either read their bio or read the prompts that they put up. You should start to get an idea of like just if you're into some of the stuff that they've mentioned or into the person you're looking at or some stuff they have in their pictures, right? So beyond that, you have conversations. In the conversations, you're just trying to assess the person enough to get the date. Like I, I'll ask you a question, hey, where are you from? Or like, what are you into this, this, and that? But like my goal is to like get on the date to be able to do all that stuff, right? The other thing too is this, is that I think a lot of guys, because I've had some guys say things like, well, I want to have a, I want to go from the dating app to getting their phone number to having a video chat. And for me, there's just, there's, there's a, I, I, I genuinely believe that you need to get as much practice as you can with women in person. And I think trying to have all these conversations and all these video meetups before you see the person in person, it, it robs you of being able to practice doing in-person dates. Because what's more important than if you're able to determine compatibility in a conversation is how you are on dates. And the only way you get better at dates is if you meet with women in person to practice conversations, to practice opening their doors, to practice listening, to practice being in an environment where you have to be in front of a person and be able to have a conversation without getting nervous. And I think too many guys are honestly taking the chicken layout. They end up talking to women for two or three weeks on end, hoping that eventually whatever conversation we have is gonna, is gonna allow me to be able to read that she has feelings. You can only read so much through an electronic device. Like all these words on this phone are like text and stuff. And they're like, they're little like uh, digits. And we, we try to do LOLs and emojis. None of that stuff is giving authentic emotion behind the situation. The only way you get that is to meet the person in person. Now you could argue, but wouldn't a phone call do the same thing? Wouldn't a video chat do the same thing? And again, I want to stress, you need practice meeting with women in person because the only way to start getting an idea of compatibility is when you guys meet up, do you like the way she smells? Do you like how her hair looks? Do you like the way that she sounds? These are all things you're not going to get. And even if you get them through phone or through video, you're not going to be able to like you're not, not going to be able to get smell at all. At least not yet. But you won't be able to touch her. You won't be able to like really like interact with her in an environment where you can see her how she is in that environment, how she with other people, how is she when she eats her food. Like you need to experience all that to really accelerate how well you're going to do in the dating world. And so to that, I say that you it, you can assess. A, a small bit of are there things that we seemingly have in common, but even people that have stuff in common, that doesn't mean that she's going to feel like you guys are compatible to date. You know, oh, I can date somebody. Oh, you have a podcast too? That's amazing. Oh my God, you like to wear a shirt like me? That's amazing. That doesn't mean we're going to get along in a relationship. There are plenty of people that have almost nothing in common with the person that they're with and they've been married 20, 30 years. You know, um, also, also, he says, uh, he asked, can compatibility come with time? The reality is, yes. I've heard plenty of stories where it's like a woman will say like that first date, I didn't really like him or I met him at this party. I thought he was just so cocky and arrogant. I didn't really blah, 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 blah. 
and it can come over time. Yes. But even with that, because I, I did a whole show where I talked about how, like, you know, people that started as friends, apparently there's a high percentage of people that start off as friends and then end up in a relationship. But on average, it takes 18 to 21 months. And then when that happens, usually if it's going to work out, the woman's got to be the one to come to the guy, like I talk about all the time, and be like, hey, so I'm feeling you. Or hey, so like we've been friends for a while, but like, could we be something more? Like, that's more often than not how that's going to work out. So basically, as a guy, you're probably going to feel the compatibility a lot faster. She needs to be the one to feel that there's also compatibility here in order for this to be taken to the next level. And that could take a bit of time around you. I have some friends that were friends in uh, high school and they were friends for like three years before she started crushing on him and then decided to do some stuff, right? So, but that whole time that they were friends, they were trying to feel if they were compatible or not. And that's that's totally fine. But suffice to say that she had to go to him at some point to let that stuff start popping off. And so it can take time. Sometimes a woman just needs to be able to see you in different environments or she needs to start realizing that, oh, you have other prospects out there. Does she want to risk losing you to one of those other prospects? And sometimes it happens and sometimes it doesn't. But you as a guy should not be relying on that to happen, which is why I tell you guys, you should be dating like two or three women to start because even if you're feeling compatible with this one, we need to make sure that she gets there too. And it may not. So while she's figuring that stuff out, you go see who else you're compatible with and then hope to God that she becomes compatible, at which point you can cut these girls off over here. Or you might find, surprise, surprise, one of these other girls you're more compatible with, you know? So that's just how it kind of plays out. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Questions. Blah, 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 one more time. <laughs> he said, the reason I ask is because I get the date and then when I meet her and I feel disappointed, that's why I quit online dating and prefer meeting people in person. I mean, it's a crapshoot. Part of my part of my um, introvert dating success coaching program. Uh, we have a whole section where, where, where I, I do a call like once a week for 12 weeks. And so part, one of those weeks is all about like how to approach women, including how to do that in the online dating space. Uh, because how you set up your pictures and your bio, it really will help. It, it, the way that, again, treat yourself like a product. The way that you're presenting yourself to the world is going to determine the kind of women that want to match with you. So if you find you're getting a lot of crappy matches, chances are you probably have a crappy profile, or at least not one that's going to make the women that see that profile that you want think, oh, we get along together very well. I did very well on online dating, but that's because I knew how to set up all my stuff in a way that presented me in, in, in an angle that more women were going to find attractive. And again, it was an authentic angle, but I knew the kind of pictures to show, which ones to steer clear from. I knew what prompts, I was on Hinge. I, I knew what prompts to use that would in, invoke conversations and make women actually reach out to me first for conversations. Like if you know how to do those things, then your, your efforts on online become a lot better. And then once you actually get them to match, it's knowing the kind of conversations to have, what kind of things to figure out during that conversation, and then knowing how to plan a first date that's going to result in her building more feelings with you. And most guys don't know how to do that, which is why I teach it, because then you'll know it, you know? Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Oh, I love questions for women. Thank you for asking. Okay, so we have a question. Well, we have a... Uh, okay, so we have a two-parter here, so... Uh, this woman in the chat says, uh, I'd want, especially if we meet online, a man who can be patient enough for me to feel comfortable enough and a uh, little feel for what he's like. Then I may be open to meeting. I'm communicative, though. And so here's the thing. What I tell guys is this, is that, yes, on a dating app, I, I'll say this. I've had the experience before of being able to literally send a woman a message that says, hey, how you doing? And then the next message is like, we should go out. And I've had that be successful a few times, right? But more often than not, I found that it does take some time. So I tell women this, I say, on average, it, this is just an average I discovered, uh, it takes between five to 10 messages before a woman is at least open to the idea of meeting up with you. Like, and it's like, I send a message, she sends a message, each, each one of us is sending a message like five to 10 times individually before I'll say, Hey, let's meet up, you know, and there's, and there's a way that I, that I transition into asking for that in a way that's comfortable for women, uh, which again, I teach in my program, you know, cause you gotta, you know what, you don't want to just go from like, talk, 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 let's go out. Like there is a, a smooth transition and a couple of words you got to say to make women feel comfortable with that, that I just learned how to do. So just a little preview for the program, but if I say, yeah, so but here's the thing, I, I tell men, it doesn't take a long time. Like it could be five to 10 messages over the span of like two or three days. But what most men I find do is they just talk and talk and talk. And you can correct me if I'm wrong because you're the woman watching this, right? I have found more often than not, 
Women do not want to be the ones to ask for the date. I found that I got to be the one that, that initiates the conversation about going out someplace. And then when I do, I'm initiating conversation about meeting in public. I never, ever did the, hey, well, no, there was one time where I said, hey, come to my place. And it was like, it was New Year's Eve. It was a New Year's Eve date. I was like, hey, you're single. I'm single. I don't want to be alone for New Year's. Let's go out. I said, you know, come to my place. I'll make some food for us and we'll go out. And she agreed. She came to my place. We ate food and then we left my apartment. I would do that one time, but most of the time I'm asking for in uh, in public dates with women, you know, but it doesn't take four five, six weeks. It literally takes like two or three days at most before most women are like, okay, I've talked to him enough. He seems sane and he's, he's suggesting an in public place. This will be fine. Now that said, if you've talked guys, if you've talked that long and she's like, I don't know. My thoughts always like it's been, it's been two to three days and I'm, I'm suggesting we meet in public at that point. I'm questioning either A, if they're a bot, or B, if they're in this for the attention. Either way, if they say they don't, they don't meet up, I'll say, okay, fine. I'll still continue to talk because I don't get, there's nothing that I don't get hurt for just talking to somebody, right? But I'm also talking to other prospects now because I can assure you, for every one woman, it's like, well, I don't want to go out. Let's keep texting. There are like three or four others that are on my message thing, ready for a date. So again, I'm not going to try to push anything. Like I'm, My goal is just to present the product. Hey, I want to meet you out. They say, no, it is what it is. I got other people to talk to. I'm not going to spend all day. Please, why would you meet up with me? I think people, why am I doing that? Because that's energy. I could be spending on three other chicks that want to say yes to a date, you know? So, but thank you for that comment. So in the second one, this, uh, so this comment from a woman, she says, what do you think about a guy who is wearing his trauma on his sleeves? Like saying, women use me for my money. You're not going to do that, right? In like the first chat or two. It puts me off. Listen to this, guys. It puts me off personally makes me feel like he's putting me on the defensive and will project it onto me or something. Spoiler, he will. But for the guys watching this, listen to what she just said, right? She does not want a guy that is wearing trauma on his sleeve and saying things like, women use me. I talked about this earlier in the show about how like guys are going, will go on dates and then in an attempt to, because I'll tell you, this is why guys are doing that, right? Guys think that in order to get the woman in front of them, to not treat them like the last woman did, that he needs to tell this new woman all the stuff that he went through so that way she will not do that to him. And I have found that is a terrible plan. It's just like, you know, like if I've, I, I don't, think, I don't think I don't think I've ever done this, but like if I were going to date and be like, yeah, so the last girl girl goes to me, like we were having a good time dating, and then she decided she didn't, she just like stopped texting me and stopped calling me, and I just was really hurt by that. And I, I I hope that you know if you if you don't like me, I hope you don't try to ghost me. You know what the girl's gonna say? Oh, I would never, I, I would never ghost you. I, if I didn't like you, I would just straight up tell you that I wouldn't want to see you anymore. And I've had that speech given to me before, and no girl has ever come forth and been like. Hey, so I, I don't want to go through. So I'm just going to let you know that I'm not seeing you. I've had literally one girl say to me, like I asked her on a fourth date. She was like, hey, it's been great getting to know you, but I'm just not feeling that connection. I was like, you know what? That's a that's a, that's a a unicorn right there because that never happens. I usually get ghosted. But for me to go to every single date and be like, the last girl ghosted me. I hope you don't want to ghost me. Like w women aren't going to like suddenly be like, oh, that guy got ghosted. I'm not going to do that. They're going to more be like, why is this guy ruining my buzz? Like women are on these dates to have a good time. They didn't been to work all day, had to deal with the boss, cranky customers. And all they want to do is go home and take off their work uniform and put on a nice dress, some makeup, some perfume, get their hair done, smell all good for you and stuff like that. Put on their best high heels, go on a dress and go out and have a good time. And you want a trauma dump. You want to get on there. Now I got to tell you about my problems. She hadn't heard from complaining customers all day at work. And now she got to hear about a complaining date. This is why you're losing women, guys, because they don't want to hear that. Yes, you got trauma. You know what? Put it in a box. Save it for month three when she's the girlfriend and she's more open to hearing about your trauma. But on dates, she does not care about your trauma. She cares. Hey, early on, she don't know you. She cares about her having a good time. And are you going to provide her with a good time? And if you're not, you're doing her a disservice. But honestly, guys, you're doing yourself a disservice because that means you have not gone through the work to not let that trauma trip you up and bring it to everybody's attention. Nobody cares that you've been through trauma. I'm sorry you have to hear that from me personally. I know you care and you're a therapist will care. People got their own crap going on. And, but especially on a, in a dating scenario, she got her own crap going on. You don't want her coming on a, on a date. Oh, my last few boyfriends, blah, 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 blah. And these guys out here ain't worth crap. Huh. You, you want her to say that and hope that you're, gonna, you're not going to treat her like that? Like that's a dumb plan. So yeah, 
So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, I tell guys, I, I don't think guys should be doing that and that th them doing that is a disservice to them, you know? So thank you for bringing that to guys' attention. Anyway, uh, let's see. Other comments here. Do, 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 do. <laughs> he says, right, I, I also care about is he actually sane and nice to be around. And yeah, guys, let's, let's be real, okay? Trauma dumping does not make you look like a sane guy. It doesn't make you look like a put together guy. And women already have so much to deal with in terms of like worrying about their safety on a date. She, she doesn't met you in public. It's great. But that's like, if I walk back to my car, is he going to stab me? Or is this the guy that's going to like be cool on the date and then be weird outside the date? Like they're going to be worried about all this stuff. You don't help them when you go on a date and trauma dump or talk about how all women, because like, okay. I'm sorry. It's funny. There's so many guys that like go on dates and talk about, you know, there's a lot of manosphere content out there talking about how like, you know, women are gold diggers and women ain't crap and they just want to use a guy for his money and they only want guys with a certain height and Chad and Tyrone, this blah, 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 blah. And then and keep in mind, I watch some of that stuff because I, I don't fall for that narrative, but I understand it's out there. And I think it's important as guys to be able to see some of the things that guys are bitter about so you can get an idea of like, okay, these are things to look out for, not and I'm going to hate on all those women. Like, there are women that are gold diggers. So I just learned, okay, just steer clear from women that do these things. But don't hate on all women. But men will go on dates and then tell women, yeah, because I bet you just want me for my, for, for my money. And, oh, you probably hate on me because of my height and blah, 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 blah. Like, dude, don't bring that to the date. All she's going to see you as is a bitter, angry dude. And you're the fun guy. You know? Fun guy. Um, so let's see. Do, 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 do. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, let's see. We're almost done here. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. I'll be right back. I'm going to fix this light real quick. I'll be right back. I'm going to fix this. Uh, in the meantime, feel free to check this out. Hey guys. Yep. It's still me here. So if you have been trying to figure out the ins and outs of how to date, it can be very, very challenging, especially if you don't have the proper roadmap to be able to get there. You know, going from dating to getting into a relationship has its own set of problems and issues that if you're not aware of them, you can ultimately end up not being successful. And that's why I've created the Introvert Dating Success Academy. This is an academy that is designed to help you figure out the ins and outs of how to meet, greet, attract, date, land, and keep the woman of your dreams. You could have a girlfriend within the span of three months of meeting somebody if you knew the practical steps to take at each stage from when you first meet the woman, how to talk to her, all the way up to how to ask her out on a date, the kind of date to take her on, how to get to that first kiss or something more complex as to how to get in the bedroom, what to do when you're in the bedroom, and even concerning things like when you guys have your first argument, how do you deal with that? What signs can you look for to indicate how she feels about you without you having to ask her? And how can you tell when it's time for you to have the relationship conversation? Well, these are all things that are covered in the Introvert Dating Success Academy. It is a video course. It is 12 videos that are designed to walk you through that entire process process A through Z, step by step, so you can finally, finally land the woman of your dreams. And with that, there are some pretty cool bonuses that come with that as well. Now, if you want to check that out and see what the whole program is about, you can go to introvertdatingsuccess.com and you can click on the programs tab and then click on the section that says Introvert Dating Success Academy and see everything that comes with it. But I promise you guys, this program is based on my personal success and the steps that I've used time and time again to be able to attract women, get with any kind of woman that I want to, and if I decide to, get into relationships. And I believe it can be very helpful for you as well. So go to the website, take a look at it, and I'll be happy to assist you and help you when you join the Introvert Dating Success Academy today. All right, we are back. So got a few more things to answer here, then we'll call it a, a day. So let's see what we got here. Uh, I'm going to scroll back up here a little bit. Okay. So we got a question in the chat. Ah, good water. All right. We got a question in the chat. And the question goes, do you think online dating apps rob a man from learning how to talk to women in person? Because the app allows you to skip the steps that would actually you would actually need to learn in real life to land a date. Uh, no. I think if you're using online dating the right way, then you're treating it as a virtual simulator and not necessarily an overly serious app. Like, this is why I tell you guys, like, you know, things like getting on there 
and talking for three or four weeks at a time, it, it's it's wasted effort. But what you can do is you can actually use online dating apps as a simulator to test out different approaches. Because I found, for example, when I was doing online dating, like some of the approaches or things I would try to use as openers on there, I found would actually translate to working really good in real life as well. To where I could go to a party and be like, oh, what's that opener I used on that one girl on the, on the, on the dating app? I'll try it here. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, shoot, it worked. Oh, my God. So if you use dating apps in the right way, they will actually enhance your in-person game, not hinder it. So hopefully that resolves that confusion. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Jeez, bro, this chat blew up. <laughs> yeah, man, it's been it's been quite a lively chat. You've been you've been just missing out. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. See, man, trying to connect with this opportunity. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, nice chatting. Nice chatting. <laughs> uh, let's see. We got here. Oh my god, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, so I, I guess we have a situation in the chat. So. He says, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but after my ex broke up with me, I said we couldn't just be friends. Correct response. Then I changed my mind. Not so good. Then I changed my mind again and said a lot of corny stuff on how I would never be able to like her platonically. Am I cooked or is there a way to save this? What would you do to recover from this if you were me? Well, to be honest with you, this is one of those times where I think that's actually the correct response. Like, it, realistically, if you're liking a girl, and you know that being friends with her is going to frustrate you because while you're being friends with her, you're thinking, but I want to be able to like take you out and show you a good time and kiss you and stuff like that. And I can't, then you're in your full right to say like, you know what? I, I, I always phrase it like this though. I phrase it like, you know, Hey, like, you know, you're saying you want a friendship. I think I, I know I want more than that. So, Hey, you know what? Best of luck to you. But if you decide to change your mind, let me know. I'd love to take you out. And I'll leave it at that. And as a man, when you say those kind of things, you have to be very congruent in what you're saying. That means that you say the things that you mean to say, and then you don't falter on that. So if you said, hey, I can't be friends with you platonically because I would want to you know, do more things than just platonic stuff, then you got to stick to that. And sometimes women will change their mind and say, hey, I really miss you and I want to see you again and blah, blah, blah. And they'll you know, want to go out and do whatever and you get your way. And sometimes they'd be like, well, he wants me and I'm kind of freaked out by that. So I can't do that. And then they leave you alone. Either way, it all works out because I, I find real talk, like I said, the girls that I had crushes on 10, 15 years ago, I don't even think about them now. And and or they've gotten bigger and changed in various ways that I wouldn't want to deal with. Or especially my age, like you find like I didn't want kids. A lot of women that I had crushes on, turns out they went on to have kids and they wanted kids. That wouldn't have worked out no matter how we felt about each other, you know? So don't think you're missing out. Just it is what it is. You I I do not fundamentally well, I'll, I'll say from experience. I know being friends with a woman that you would want to date is frustrating. And I say, if you're learning the lesson now to not do that, you are well ahead of the curve because it it, it never ends up being the more often than not that the friend actually changes their mind. So don't put yourself in that position to be frustrated. You know, hopefully it helps you out. Uh, let's see. You think it's possible I could get her back? This is one of those things where you could get her back, but it's not going to be based on anything that you do. Like, don't this learn this lesson early. All right. Doing does not mean that you're doing things effectively to win somebody over. And sometimes the best way for that to happen is to do nothing and let their brains be the ones to convince them to want to be with you. So if this is the case where you, she, you know, broke up and or you guys broke up and you want to be with her, and she doesn't want to be with you. It, I'll say this. It's been a year. So I would say it does not hurt you at all to try to ask her for a date. Don't be surprised if she says no to it or does what most women do, which is like, oh, I don't know because I'm busy or oh, because maybe blah, 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 blah. All those things mean no. Just just learn early on that when women say no, it's really going to be a direct no. It's going to be more like a passive version of saying no. That's just how they communicate because they have found in their dating lives that when they, they try to be direct with a guy and say, I'm not interested, they can get beat up, unalive, a bunch of other stuff. So they're going to say something passively to be able to hope that you accept that excuse enough so they can get the freak out of the way, right? So would you ask her, should they say yes or be like, you know, oh, blah, 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 blah. At which point you say, okay, cool. Well, hey, if you change your mind, let me know. And you move on. That's the only way it's going to happen. But it's got to be, ultimately, I find it's better if it's their idea. So if she ain't come to you in the last month or so being like, hey, so what's going on? Or hey, so-and-so, let's meet. Then I would say, try asking her once and then leave it alone. You know, hopefully that helps you out. All right. Uh, I guess this will be the last question. Uh, coach, what's your take on the red pill community? Are they right or overrated? Oh, so I went through a whole red pill phase. Like that, go back to the story when I was 21 
I had all these ideals about how women were and what they should fall for and what they should like and why they don't like these things, even though they should, blah, 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 blah. And so when I first started learning all the things about why it is that all the things that I was doing was actually chasing women away and what they actually wanted, I was livid. And I think they, they actually have a name for it now. It's called red pill rage. When you suddenly like you're, you're, it's like you have all these blinders on the whole time you're trying to date. And then all of a sudden somebody just comes along and says, Hey, this is how things actually are. And it's literally like Neo in the matrix when he wakes up and all of a sudden it's like, Oh shoot. Like I'm not in the human world. I mean, like, what are these robots doing here? Holy crap. And so I went through a phase where I was extremely mad at women because I was like, why do they think this way? They shouldn't be that way. Why do they do this and that? Kind of find out I was more mad that those girls weren't doing that stuff to me because I hadn't figured it out, you know? But I say this, okay? I think, I don't ever think that anything is inherently like completely bad or completely good, you know? I think it all depends on the person that's taking in the information and how they're using it. So for example, I have been through the red pill rage and I've had my eyes open to how dating works, right? All I cared about was like, so now that I know how dating works, so I can get women now, right? Like, so... I know things I got to do, but there are some people that I'll be like, for example, for example, right? One of the things that, that I learned early on uh, when I was following Doc Love stuff, he would say, hey, go on a date with a woman and then wait five to nine days to hit them up for another date. And at the time, I could not fathom how that would work because I'm sure like a lot of you, if you're a logical thinker, you're thinking, but wait, if I don't talk to her for five to nine days, isn't she, isn't she going to think that I don't like her? And then why would she wait that long to hear from me? Wouldn't she find that disrespectful? And so I ended up cutting my version down to like, wait a minimum of four days. But there have been times where I've waited five to nine days to hit a woman up for another date. And they said yes. And I started realizing, the if I started analyzing, there were times where I would go on a date with a woman and then hit her up the next day for another date or try to plan a date on the same date that I'm already on. And those women lost interest in me very quickly. And I couldn't make the correlation because my logical, is here's the thing. My logical brain is now trying to fight what's emotionally happening to them because the logic side says, if you want me to show that I like you, then I should be hitting you up all the time. But the outcome of that was that women were heading for the hills. So then despite what my analytical logical brain was saying, which is keep doing that, I had to look at the evidence and say, let's try something different. So I'm going to try this thing over here where I don't hit them up right away after a date. And it's going to be four days of nerve wrackingness waiting to see what's going to happen. And I did it. And I would wait four to five or six days. And then I hit them up and I, I was able to start getting more dates. So what I realized was there was positives to the red pill philosophy in that if you're using it wisely, you'll take the parts that say, hey, Women actually function this way, and here's why. Here's the emotional reason that they like this thing that you said over here versus this thing. This is how the process works for them, and you can use it to your good. Or you could see the red pill and be like, wait, women want this stuff? Oh, women shouldn't be this way. I'm mad. And that's not any better than what women do to us. When they're like, why do men think this way? Why do they feel this way? Why aren't they as emotional? Oh, the way that they think and do things is just so stupid to us. Do we like hearing that? Do we want to date a woman that lives in that space? I have yet to date. Oh, oh, I'm not. That's not true. I have. There have been a couple women I dated that were that, that identified as feminists, and those women were hard as heck to date because everything that came on the news, they wanted to be like, oh, that's so disgusting. How can say it? any kind of rap a rap song came on? Oh, they're calling these girls b words and blah 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 blah. It's just very annoying. So now look at you being a red pillar and being like, yeah, these gold diggers out here are so blah blah blah, and all oh, you women are just so freaking crazy. It's like no, you just take the red pill and say. They think differently. They react to things differently. Different is not bad. It just means that there's a different process. And it's much like, it's the same thing too if I go over to Mexico and get mad at everybody speaking Spanish. Or I could just learn some Spanish so I could get around a little bit easier. And so I think that the red pill is good in a sense that it does actually teach men, hey, women are different and here's how. You try to be a nice guy doesn't work and here's why. But you ain't gotta be an a-hole either. You just have to learn what parts of the bad guy work to be the good guy that uses them? You know, you could do that route or you could do the route that gets mad. What I don't like is the constant rhetoric online. Cause like, let's be real, like talking down on women and saying that they're all crazy and that they're all bad bees that, that can't get a man of this net. Like those channels are very popular and they blow up and they get a lot of views. 
channels that are trying to be like, no, women are like relatively sane. If you know how to get them, they don't always get the most amount of views. I don't personally care. I just care about am I reaching the right people that want to go to my site and learn more based on the positivity and viewpoint that I have? Because here's the thing. I can't be a negative guy and then be like, but go get women. Like, I don't believe men can live in a space where they think so negatively about women and then have success with women. Like, because those two things don't gel together. You can't have you can't have two opposing thoughts in your head. You can't be like, oh, women suck, and then go on a date and try to be positive. They're going to feel on some level that you have a beef with women, and they're going to instinctively know, I'm this guy's kind of off. I'm out of here. Oh, see, I knew it. Women are blah, blah, blah. If you do that, you're going to be stuck in the land of not getting any women, and you're going to keep proving yourself right versus just saying, again, they think differently. Hey, I've been teaching this for 20 years now. There are still times where like women will like say some passive stuff. And I'm like, they could have just said it directly. But I, I understand that's not how they communicate. I have to know as a guy what they mean when they say this thing. And I've learned the language enough to know that I can do that. All right. So don't think just because I know all this stuff that it's not frustrating at times, but it doesn't make me mad at them. It just makes me understand they still, they're cute. They're still thinking they got to talk passively, but I know what they, exactly what they mean. That's so cute. Like, it's fine, you know? So don't live in the negative space of the red pill. If you're going to be a red pillar, use the red pill to have your eyes open to what's actually going on with women and their attraction levels, and then proceed accordingly with the new knowledge you have. I think the other hard part for guys is that when we learn this stuff, our ego is so invested heavily in how we are and the things that we thought were right to get women that we don't, we're not aware that those habits become who we are. And it's very hard to look at yourself and say, Hey, all those habits that you learned for all these years to get women, they don't work. So learn some new stuff. Cause now you're starting at ground zero. Where do you start? You got lied to for X amount of years. How do you know if this person's here to write what listen to or this person or whatever, you know, it can be, it's a very confusing thing to have to start at ground zero and try to figure out these new habits that you hope are not going to work, even though you already had habits, but they weren't working, but they made you feel good. You know, like that's all very frustrating. So again, I understand because I've been through the red pill rage, but on the other side of that is more understanding and recognizing that, Hey, I can actually get women now that I know how they function, you know? So that's my overall view of that. Uh, so yeah, that's all I got. That's all I got, guys. Been talking for a long time. Uh, so this is the this is the album. This is my album. Uh, called uh, oh, oh here, sorry, <laughs> on camera. This is my album. It's called Kevin Samuels is Right. It is now on uh, iTunes, Spotify, all that good stuff. So you guys can definitely check that out. And so to that end, I will leave you with a video from that album. And uh, be sure to stream it on. Wherever you get your streaming stuff, it's it's you know pretty fun to listen to. Thank you guys for watching the show. Uh, be sure to leave comments uh, in my videos. So I'll have stuff to talk about during the course of next show on Tuesday. I do a show every Tuesday at 5 p.m. And Saturdays, I guess I announce them at some point because I don't know. I keep changing the time on Saturdays. But uh, I will see you guys on Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Check out the video. I'm out. Peace. Where are you going? No, Lulu. Don't pee on the carpet. Lulu. You about to buy a dog.
on my own social media. If I want to shake my can for the gram, then who are you to tell me I can't? There you go, open up a thirst trap. Yep. Them high value men, they don't like that. Yep. You say I can do what I want to do. What? I say you should go to the kennel boo. You say you want a high value man in your life, but you don't have the things that he needs in a wife. All this boss chick, independent chick attitude with this tenant ish ish, and you not staying fit like hey, big Shirley. You so burly, bad at the world, cause they did you dirty. Won't change up, cause you over 30. Act like a man, never been that girly. Yeah, always gotta come back up attack when you get called out for the way you act. Got you about to get some licks from a pit bull. Pitiful, Kevin Samuels gave the manual, but you couldn't believe this is what a man would need. So you called him a sexist girl, you need a therapist. You won't date nice guy Brad, but you give it up to Chad. On bums who leave you in the dust. No wonder you think all men suck, but keep on playing. But that wall's getting close. Pretty soon you'll be a ghost to the dude you want the most, but you won't date down till it's too late. That five six guy is looking pretty fly, but you passed him by, and now he's got a wife who is six foot one. They be having lots of fun. Meanwhile, you go into the pet shop for some little bow wows that'll love you till your heart stops. Call him Lulu and Sunny, but they only live so long. Still be alone. When they die, you gon' still be alone. You about to buy a dog, die alone, die a dog, die alone. You about to buy a dog, die alone, buy a dog, die alone. You about to buy a dog, die alone, buy a dog, die alone. You about to buy a dog, die alone, buy a dog. You about to buy a dog and die. Should've changed the ways, but you won't go. Waited too long and now you're up oh. Kevin, he was right, now you're up oh. You gon' buy a dog and die alone. You are high class man. You are high class man. You are high earning high value high class.